Good morning, everyone. At this time, can everyone please turn electronic devices to vibrate or silent? Please mute your microphone on Zoom. Please ensure that you have named yourself correctly in Zoom, or you may be either renamed by the Zoom host or removed from the hearing. Thank you. We will now begin with the meeting of the Committee on Finance with General Welfare. Okay, good morning and welcome to the City Council's fourth day of hearings. <clears throat> this hearing is on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2021. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on General Welfare, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Steve Levin, and the public advocate, Jamani Williams. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, and let me just pull it up. I'm sorry. Okay, we have Councilmember Holden, Adams, Lander, Matteo, Amphrey Samuel, Grudenchik, Gibson, Lewis, and Maisel. I'd now like to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you. My name is Stephanie Ruiz and I'm counsel to New York City's Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. If council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You'll be added to the queue. I'll now hand it back to Chair Drum. Thank you very much. In our budget response this year, the council made it clear that one of our top priorities is to protect the city's social safety net. And our experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic show just how crucial this is. The fiscal 2021 executive budget is balanced, but it does not reflect the additional resources needed to maintain the social safety net as this pandemic continues to devastate the city into the next fiscal year and beyond. HRA's executive plan totals $9.6 billion, representing a $562 million reduction to the preliminary plan. Similarly, DHS's Executive plan totals approximately $2.7 billion, representing a $52.9 million reduction to the preliminary plan. The council understands that agencies were required to make deep cuts to spending in response to the worsening economic conditions. But HRA and DHS's executive plans are woefully inadequate in that they fail to maintain core services that are essential to New Yorkers, and they do not appropriately address COVID-19 related spending and other budget risks. Neither plan includes new funding for COVID-19 related spending, but instead merely reallocates and recommits existing funding. Additionally, COVID-19 expenditures were inaccurately budgeted and no new funding or baseline changes were made to the city, to the city's social safety program to the city's social safety net programs, such as rental assistance programs, the employee and family assistance program, or programs to support undocumented immigrants, despite there being an increased demand for these programs. With potential state cuts on the horizon, potentially impacting the city's Medicaid programs, we must be prepared for the worst case scenario and appropriately fund vital social safety net programs. The fiscal 2021 executive plan also did not include over 39.7 million in council initiative funding. It's frustrating to see that over and over again, the administration continues to exclude these initiatives from the executive plan. Despite the fact that these initiatives provide key services ranging from food access services to immigrant support services, now is not the time to cut spending on these initiatives. I wanna thank you all for being here today and I'm going to now turn it over to my co-chair, Council Member Steve Levin. Good morning, thank you Chair Drum. I'm Council Member Steve Levin, Chair of the General Welfare Committee. 
here in the council. I want to thank you all for joining me for the fiscal 2021 executive budget hearing for the general welfare committee held jointly with the finance committee. The city's proposed fiscal 21 executive budget totals $89.3 billion of which 11.7 or 13% funds the Department of Social Services encompassing the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Homeless Services. These two agencies serve the most vulnerable populations in the city. Their vital work is now more important than ever given the COVID-19 pandemic and its devastating impact on the city. As the largest social service agency in the country, HRA provides cash assistance, emergency food assistance and SNAP, HIV, HIV AIDS support services, otherwise known as HASA, legal services, anti-eviction services, rental assistance and rental arrears, and many other public assistance programs for low-income New Yorkers. DHS provides transitional shelter for homeless single adults, adults, adult families, and families with children in accordance with New York City's right to shelter mandate. DHS also helps clients to exit shelter and move into permanent and supportive housing. As Chair Drum stated, the council's budget response made it clear that protecting the New York City's social safety net is one of the council's top priorities. While the executive budget is balanced, the budget put forth, the budget put forth for these agencies does not reflect any of the additional resources that will be needed for COVID-19 related expenditures or to support the staggering increase in demand for social safety net programs and homeless services. Since the release of the preliminary budget, HRA's fiscal 21 executive budget has decreased by $562.2 million or approximately 5.5% to 9.6 billion. The majority of this decrease is due to one-time savings of $440 million in the city's Medicaid costs as part, as part of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. The federal relief bill increased the amount of Medicaid expenses that are federally covered. Just one new need is added to the fiscal 21 executive budget across both agencies totaling $68 million annually to replace a cut in state funding as a result of the enacted state executive budget, which now requires the city to contribute an additional 5% of temporary assistance for needy families, otherwise known as TANF funding. This is on top of the 10% local share instituted last fiscal year. This funding shortfall impacts both DHS and HRA and supports, sh and supports shelter costs and cash assistance. Since the release of the preliminary budget, DHS's fiscal 21 executive budget has decreased by $52.9 million, or approximately 2.5%, to $2.07 billion. The majority of this decrease is due to hotel shelter rate savings of $35 million and shelter security savings of $25 million. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the administration reintroduced the program to eliminate the gap, otherwise known as PEG program, in the executive budget. In the executive budget, HRA has a PEG total of $148 million for fiscal 20 and $48 million for fiscal 21. The majority of the PEGs related to but are the majority of the sorry, the majority of the PEGs uh, relate to budget re-estimates underspending due to COVID-19 and rollout delays. In the executive budget, DHS has a peg total of $5.4 million for fiscal 20 and $60 million for fiscal 21. The, peg relate, the pegs relate to indirect rate adjustments and the hotel rate savings and security savings mentioned earlier. While the budget maintains essential, the benefits, the benefit programs administered by HRA and shelter administered by DHS, more can and should be done, and we need to think more deeply about where we can most effectively allocate city resources, especially during this uniquely challenging times. As uh, I am particularly disappointed that the executive plan does not put forth a solid plan for COVID-19 spending at DSS, and no new funding was allocated towards addressing food insecurity or the added challenges homeless individuals are facing during the pandemic. I strongly believe that the city needs more comprehensive planning and a clear path forward on how we will combat poverty, food insecurity, and homelessness, both during the remainder of the pandemic and in the long recovery after it. Before I welcome the commissioner, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues 
uh, who are here today, and I think uh, Chair Drum did that. Um, and I'd also like to thank the General Welfare Committee staff for their work in putting this hearing together today. Julia Harmis, our finance analyst. Frank Sarno, financial analyst. Dohini Sampora, unit head. Aminta Kilowan, senior counsel. Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst. And Natalie Omer, policy analyst. I'd also like to thank my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, and my legislative director, Elizabeth Adams. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to Chair Drum. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Levin. I want to say that we have now also been joined by Council Members Cohen, Salamanca, Moya, Ayala, Jonai, Yeager, Traeger, and Powers. And now I'd like to ask our public advocate, Jamani Williams, to give his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum and uh, Chair Levin uh, for this hearing, this opportunity. My name is Jemani Williams, Public Advocate in the City of New York. Uh, given the massive loss in revenue that our municipal economy has suffered, the city has made and will have to make extensive budget cuts. Yet the area in which the administration has decided to reduce funding affects agency that, when operating effectively, serve our communities the most. The mayor has cut funding to the Department of Social Services by more than $48 million, including $6 million in cuts to job training programs. The executive plan for the Human Resource Administration, the executive budget also includes $60 million in cuts to the Department of Homeless Services with a $35 million reduction in hotel spending. I find this ironic and alarming given the need to isolate homeless individuals to stop the spread of COVID-19. This funding needs to be maintained so that people are experiencing homelessness who need to isolate themselves can have single occupancy rooms rather than double occupancy, which only puts them more at risk of contracting and spreading the coronavirus. DHS is also facing a $25 million cut in funding for security in DHS shelters, despite several reports of safety concerns. The need for the support that our social service agencies provide is only growing and vital services need additional investment. The city has seen a significant rise in unemployment as New Yorkers have suffered massive layoffs over the past two months. As a result, our communities are depending on food pantries to feed their homeless, feed their families, and it's very likely that SNAP enrollment will increase HR manages the City Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, which has a baseline budget $20.2 million and a network of more than 500 food pantries and soup kitchens. HRE also administers uh, the SNAP program budget at $1.5 million. The city needs to ensure that HRA has additional funding to address the expected increase in SNAP enrollment and food insecurity. My office recently learned that individuals can apply for emergency assistance grants as well as ongoing cash assistance through Access HRA. The application process includes questions to assess that an emergency grant is not needed to ensure financial security of the clients. We need clarity from the administration of the criteria used to determine eligibility for these programs, the number of applications HRA has received, and how accessible an HRA representative is should someone need help during the application process. These financial supports need to be accessible to undocumented communities who have been left out of the federal stimulus package despite enduring the same amount of financial hardship as their neighbors. The reports of the unsanitary living conditions at city homeless shelters and safe havens are alarming and only increase the likelihood of virus spreading. Shelter residents should not be assigned to a bed that has not been sterilized after an individual who has tested positive has slept in it. Soap and hand sanitizer should be abundant, not nearly existing, and shelter sites must implement and enforce social distancing. These conditions present an even greater dis disincentive for persons experiencing street homelessness to enter a shelter or safe haven. While I applaud DHS's efforts to relocate shelter residents to hotel rooms, the sanitary and hygiene conditions of shelters can be a matter of life and death. Last month during a council hearing, DHS shared that they had been tracking 629 positive cases across 158 hotel rooms. Today, the city needs an update on the care and well-being of these folks and how many persons who tested positive are still in DHS shelters. I'm eager to hear how the administration is providing care, promoting testing, and preventing more COVID-19 infections in shelters and safe havens. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused widespread unemployment, increased food insecurity, and created additional public health concerns for our homeless population. I urge the administration to prioritize and increase funding for services and improve access to food, helps low-income New Yorkers, protect the health of homeless individuals, and supports human resource, sorry, human services providers. I'm interested in hearing uh, from the HRA, from HRA and Department of Homeless Services today. I look forward to gaining a better understanding as how the budget will help them protect 
wealth of New Yorkers during this pandemic. I might add with homelessness uh, particularly, uh, I believe that and have been saying for a while that the administration had been failing homelessness and housing well before the COVID uh, pandemic. And we were sure that they were not. And I think we can all agree now that actually it was and is now being exacerbated. And I appreciate how difficult of an issue this is, uh, but this is the time that we can't go backwards, particularly uh, as the NYPD is only facing a shave. Uh, that then means uh, that we want the NYPD to come in and forcefully try to fix something that we have failed to fix before. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Look forward to hearing uh, your testimony, Commissioner Banks. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Before we begin with testimony from the administration, I'd like to remind the public that this committee and subcommittee on capital budget will be holding a remote hearing for public testimony on the executive budget on May 21st at 12 p.m. Please note the new scheduled start time. If you would like to testify at that hearing, please register at www.council.nyc.gov slash testify and information about how to access the Zoom meeting will be emailed to you. You may testify at that hearing via web or via telephone. You may also submit written testimony through that registration website or by emailing finance testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now hear testimony from Commissioner Steve Banks. Commissioner Banks is joined by his Chief of Staff, Scott French, and I will now ask uh, Committee Council to please administer the affirmation. Thank you. Do you affirm that your testimony will be true to the best of your knowledge, information, belief, Commissioner Banks? I do. Mr. French? Uh, Mr. French will not be testifying. He's assisting me in, in the uh, presentation this morning. Understood. Commissioner Banks, you may begin when ready. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Strum and uh, Levin, uh, members of Finance and General Welfare Committee. And Commissioner Banks, sorry to interrupt you. If you can summarize, that would be very helpful to us because we're on a very tight schedule. I, I will summarize. Uh, I want to, for the record, I'm providing you with written testimony, uh, and uh, let me let me proceed through the testimony. Uh, I want to thank you, Chair Drum and uh, Chair Levin, uh, members of the Finance and General Welfare Committee, for the opportunity to testify today, uh, as well as thanking you, uh, Public Advocate Jamani Williams. I appreciate our conversations during this crisis and your insights and our and our dialogue. Before we proceed with this testimony, I want to thank the staff of our agency and our partner not-for-profit providers who have been on the front lines helping meet the needs of our clients during this crisis. They're essential workers providing essential services to New Yorkers who need us now more than ever. I also want to ask for a moment of silence uh, for the 31 members of our staff who have passed away, and as yet unknown number of provider staff who have passed away, 76 DHS clients who have lost, large numbers of people across the city who have lost, and an as yet unknown number of HRA clients along with other New Yorkers who have lost. I am inspired by the resilience of our workforce. I'm inspired by the resilience of our partners, but I'm devastated by the loss of our staff, of provider staff, of all New Yorkers and the clients that we serve. Thank you very much. Each year, our annual budget hearings, we provide an update of our progress in reforming several decades of social services and homeless services policies and procedures. Given the current moment in time, we've summarized the status of these efforts in an appendix for the record so that we can spend the limited time at this hearing focusing on budget and COVID-19 members. Uh, at the Human Resources Administration, we took extraordinary steps to quickly transform our agency operations. And over the past 10 weeks, HRA has responded to continue to provide benefits and services in a changed city. On March 15th, following state approval, we announced the elimination of all requirements for HRA in-person appointments so as to reduce our in-center foot traffic and implement social distancing. 
Accordingly, we're not taking any adverse actions against clients who don't keep previously scheduled appointments or assignments. No new appointments or assignments are being scheduled. And in 2015, as we've testified previously, we moved our food stamp uh, services online and by telephone. So that by December 2019, 96% of our application interviews for food stamps were uh, by telephone uh, and uh, about 90% of our food stamp applications, SNAP applications were online. Those reforms stood us in good stead when this crisis hit because our clients can conduct business with us from the safety of their homes. During this time, 99% of all SNAP business is now conducted online outside of our centers. We have been seeking, as I've testified before, approval for these same benefit type access for cash assistance so that cash assistance clients could avoid the need to come into an office to receive help. As the crisis hit, we finally or did receive a state approval to transform the cash assistance program. And in four days on March 20th, we stood up a system to apply for cash assistance online with telephone interviews. As a result, uh, as of April, over 90% of cash assistance applications are now submitted online. Uh, I'm sure we'll get to it, but through our work with OTDA, we've secured waivers uh, in other areas to ensure that clients are able to prioritize uh, getting services without endangering their health and safety, and our staff can be protected without having to leave their homes. A status report of those waivers is included with this testimony in an appendix. By way of example, following a waiver request to the state uh, and the state's request to the federal government, clients who would otherwise be required to recertify for food stamps and cash assistance don't need to do so at this time. And when recertification resumes, we'll notify clients. Similarly, with state approval, we've been able to lift employment sanctions for clients who have contacted us. We've also been able to suspend the state, federal able-bodied adults without dependents work requirements at this time. In order to protect staff and clients, we've consolidated offices uh, and we've got a key office available uh, in each uh, borough. Uh, obviously, given what has occurred in the city, our application volume has dramatically increased uh, and we're now receiving record numbers of applications, three times as many for SNAP and food stamps and twice as many for cash assistance. To meet this demand to protect our staff, We've redeployed and retrained staff from across uh, the agency to process cases, and we've built a new remote access platform and deploy technology so that as many staff as possible can serve clients from their homes. Altogether, we've redeployed or reassigned, I should say, uh, nearly 1,400 staff from other areas to handle the SNAP and cash assistance, including 100, uh, about 100 people from Metro Plus who are assisting us as well. 84% of our workforce is now working from home through the new systems that we built uh, literally uh, overnight to enable our staff to provide services from home. With respect to the Department of Homeless Services, at the very beginning of this crisis on March 3rd, we provided guidance uh, to directors and we've been providing ongoing guidance uh, there uh, uh, on an ongoing basis uh, to uh, shelters. Uh, beginning on the night of March 9th, we rolled out a new street homeless initiative to survey clients with, uh, on the street to determine whether or not they had any symptoms. And with a process with H&H, uh, &H, we worked out a referral to hospitals if there were such a case. We've conducted over 20,000 such engagements to meet the needs of clients on the streets. On the night of March 13th and March 14th, even before there was formal FEMA approval uh, for uh, such isolation sites, we opened our first isolation site uh, for clients. Uh, and as of uh, uh, now, we have more than 700 potential beds available for isolation. And as of May 15th, nearly 800 people who have been in our isolation sites have been discharged with their cases resolved. That includes people who tested positive and people who had symptoms. Uh, as we testified last month, the, the New York Times on April 16th actually credited our transparency uh, in reporting to the public on these matters, saying the City Department of Homeless Services is tracking and releasing information about confirmed virus cases and deaths. Other city and state agencies that run group shelters have not disclosed that information. As we've publicly reported, we have been moving uh, 
single adults out of congregate shelters uh, into uh, uh, commercial hotels. Uh, we began the COVID crisis with 3,500 New Yorkers, uh, single adults in commercial hotels. That's 3,500 out of the 1,700 single adults in our shelter system. Uh, as of today, 9,000 single adults now reside in commercial hotels. We began this initiative first prioritizing clients over 70, uh, and then we are using uh, existing DHS hotels, and then we've been able to bring on with the collaboration with OEM additional uh, hotels to be able to move people out of uh, congregate shelters uh, to promote social distancing. We've opened, I'm just trying to summarize, uh, Chair, uh, we've opened uh, 300 safe haven uh, 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 beds, uh, safe haven and stabilization beds to bring people in from the street, including more than 100 beds in commercial hotel. Uh, in my testimony, about 9,000 single adults uh, being in commercial hotels, I believe I, I, I guess said it was 9,000 out of 1,700. It's obviously 9,000 out of 17,000 single adults in our single adult uh, shelter system. Uh, in your opening comments, uh, Chairs uh, Levin and Drum, as well as the public advocate, you referred to the impact of the state TANF and EAF cut. I know that uh, OMB Director uh, Melanie Harzok referred to the $120 million impact on our budget of that cut. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, you know, we continue to look for ways in which we can work together uh, at the state level, uh, we were uh, continuing to monitor and we're hopeful that legislative proposals like home stability support uh, would provide funding for state rental assistance that did not occur in the budget. And as you indicated, we have taken $120 million. Uh, oh, we've taken a TANF uh, uh, cut as well. Uh, part of our uh, initiatives include the increasing the burial and funeral assistance costs. Uh, due to the tragic and high mortality rate and its disproportionate impact on low-income New Yorkers. Uh, we took action increasing the amount of the burial grant. It had not been, it's a state set level for state reimbursement of $900. It hasn't been increased uh, since 1987. Uh, we are supporting legislation to increase it at the state level, but pending that legislation, we took action and increased uh, the grant to $1,700 uh, with the difference being made up with city tax levy. And we're required to have a cap under state law of maximum costs. And we raised that cap from $1,700 to $3,400. Uh, and that was done by an emergency rule that the mayor and I issued uh, earlier this month. Uh, the mayor's office and Moya and we uh, have been very focused on raising private funds to enable families to get these benefits from us regardless of immigration uh, assistance. Um, lastly, let me just highlight some of the budget changes that you summarized, and then we can get into the questions. Um, our ongoing reforms in the social services and homeless policy areas are updated in appendix, but they have to now be contextualized within the citywide to, uh, FY21 executive budget which has been significantly impacted by COVID-19 budget shortfalls and reductions in the state 2021 20, uh, enacted budget. Uh, between FY20 and FY21, the DSS HRA total budget declines from 10.3 billion, 8 billion city funds to 9.6 billion, 7.4 billion city funds, or by 600 million in total funds, uh, 585 million city funds. Uh, anticipated expenses funding, including FEMA reimbursement for COVID related activities is not yet reflected in our agency's budgets. Funding for DSS HRA was added only for required technical adjustments, collective bargaining and backfilling the state and TANF cut uh, that, that you described in your opening uh, comments. Um, the backfill requires the addition of 49.5 million in city funds to the DSS HRA baseline uh, the continuing loss of state support last year and this year is even more significant as we focus on benefit delivery to clients in the midst of this pandemic. The decrease in DSS uh, uh, budgets primarily due to savings initiatives and anticipated one-time enhanced federal reimbursement for Medicaid from the CARES Act that's expected in FY20 only. The savings initiatives in FY20 and FY21 include one-time reductions in the budget due to anticipated underspending, which do not impact program operations 
as well as program right sizing and vacancy reductions. The savings initiatives that reflect anticipated under, underspending include fair fares, a decrease of 65.5 million in city funds in FY20 only due to underspending resulting from the decrease in ridership during the COVID-19 shelter in place period. Supported housing, a decrease of 20 million in city funds in FY21 only as a result of an updated timeline for the phase in of supportive housing units. Legal services, a decrease of 11.5 million in city funds in FY20 and 8.5 million in city funds in FY21 only due to a hiring lag for legal services providers. Client car fare, a decrease of 3 million in city funds in FY20 and FY21 only due to decreased utilization of employment car fare services during COVID-19 shelter in place period. And of course, we have uh, waived all uh, uh, requirements uh, for participation in employment programs during this period of time. For our job training programs, a decrease in 3.2 million in city funds in FY20 only in our job uh, uh, JTP uh, funding due to COVID-19 related underspending and the Parks Department budget was also decreased. Uh, the Parks Department JTP program is uh, at the highest during uh, the warmer months and these uh, reductions reflect uh, underspending because of uh, COVID-19. Uh, other savings include Silver Stars, a decrease of 15 uh, headcount uh, because of uh, the use of city funds for implementing the Civil Star uh, program, which brings retired city workers back on a part-time basis. Three quarters housing, a decrease of 1.5 million city funds in FY20 and headcount uh, at HRA of 3.3 uh, million in city funds in FY21. And the baseline due to the right sizing of services provided uh, to former uh, three quarter house tenants as referrals to the program have declined. Uh, at one point we had more than 500 uh, people in a uh, temporary housing program who we had brought out of three quarters housing. That number is now less than 50. Adult protective services, there's a savings of $500,000 in total funds and $250,000 in city funds in FY21 and $2.2 million in total funds, 1 million city funds in FY22 in the baseline due to restructuring of adult protective services that will expand services provided through not-for-profit contracts. And finally, in job training programs, the savings of $6 million in city uh, uh, funds in FY21 in the out years, as well as the baseline for restructuring of job training programs. Uh, let me I'll skip to the Department of Homeless Services. Uh, as you summarized at the beginning, the total budget declines from 2.15 billion, 1.3 billion city funds to 2.07 billion, 1.3 billion city funds, or 75 million in total funds and 40 million city funds. Again, anticipated uh, expenses and funding, including FEMA reimbursement for COVID related activities is not re yet reflected. As with DSS HRA, the funding for DHS uh, was added only for required technical adjustments, collective bargaining and backfilling of state TANF uh, costs, which increases the city share of TANF from 15% uh, to 15% from 10%. Uh, and this requires the addition of 32.1 million in city funds in the baseline for DHS. Uh, the savings plan uh, reflects uh, a renegotiation of the nightly hotel rate uh, for commercial hotels uh, resulting from saving, uh, resulting in savings of a projected $35 million in FY21 and the out years. Uh, this isn't a reduction in the use of hotels, it's a reduction in the rate paid for hotels. Additionally, there's an adjustment of $25 million in FY21 and the out years with respect to security services, reflecting uh, a determination to uh, focus on de-escalation as a way of uh, uh, implementing security and we will continue to adjust and recalibrate uh, our models as we move forward. Uh, in conclusion, I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to testify and summarize the critical work that DSS and HRA and DHS staff do every day on behalf of low-income New Yorkers, along with our partners in the not-for-profit community. Looking forward to continuing our important partnership with the council and to keep improving essential programs upon which so many New Yorkers rely particularly at this time of unprecedented need. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and I welcome your questions that you may have this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, let's get right into some questions. In our budget response, the council made it clear that one of our top priorities is to protect the social safety net and our experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic show just how crucial this is. 
As the unemployment rate continues to grow, so too does food insecurity, homelessness, and housing instability. And I have to say, it's, it's so sad for me to walk out into my neighborhood and see in many locations lines like the old soup lines, to be honest with you, um, that are 10, 15, 20 blocks long uh, throughout the district. Uh, people are searching on a daily basis for food. So uh, why doesn't the fiscal 21 executive budget for HRA reflect the growing demands for emergency so food and for support for food pantries and soup kitchens? Uh, and if additional resources will be needed, when can we expect to see it reflected in HRA's budget? Uh, thank you for your question, Chair, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. And I, I actually really appreciate your very poignant description of, of the painful images that, that we are seeing around the city. Uh, I think, as, as we all know, there was a determination made and an announcement uh, uh, relatively recently to add $25 million to uh, the city's food programs, uh, in addition to the baseline money that is in the HRA EFAP program. We're working together with uh, Catherine Garcia and her role as the food czar and her team. Uh, those dollars are being uh, rolled out now. Uh, in addition, through uh, Commissioner Garcia's initiatives, there are a range of other food programs in which food is being provided uh, through uh, the city uh, schools. And also uh, there is a delivery system that's been put in place uh, that, uh, that people can request home delivered meals for particular vulnerable populations. So I agree with you that there, this is a moment of great need in the city. Uh, but I would like to highlight a number of the initiatives that are being taken to address that great need. But like you and like the entire administration, the entire council, we will continue to focus on this very directly. The mayor's made it very clear that making sure people have food is one of the four priorities in this budget uh, process. Uh, people will also be getting the benefit of the federal uh, pandemic EBT program uh, which is state administered. Uh, and as soon as we have additional information about that, we will be providing it, but it will be a, a basis for the state providing dollars uh, with federal approval to uh, households with school children, irrespective of immigration status. Uh, but again, I wanna highlight, in addition to the EFAP dollars, there's the $25 million that was added that obviously will be reflected in the adopted budget. And there are all of the resources being provided for food at the schools and food uh, through the home delivery program that's been stood up. But I can commit to you that we will continue to work with the council as we always have uh, to prioritize that. I know you personally and some of the other members of this committee have been longtime advocates of EFAP. I appreciate that. We work together to have an increase and we also work together to have this additional $25 million allocation. Okay, so uh, Commissioner, uh, when we did have um, Commissioner Garcia in last week, uh, we know that uh, the 25 million has been uh, accounted for, the $50 million additional has been accounted for, but there's about $170 million, I think, total that's been allocated, and we don't know what the other money is going for. So it's about another $95 million. Will we get to know what that is before we go um, for, um, you know, for a budget agreement? I mean, I think as in all, all of these uh, processes, moving to adoption, there's gonna be constant dialogue. Uh, the programs that I listed that I know we work in partnership with Commissioner Garcia on, the programs at the schools, uh, the home delivery process, uh, food uh, uh, system that's been stood up, uh, all of those have a cost and they'll have to be discussed with the council as we reach adoption. Okay, and so then are you looking to um, revamp the EFAP program uh, to be more ag agile or expanding the list of uh, products uh, food banks are going to be able to procure? Uh, I mean, it's certainly something that, that we're constantly looking at. I think we've all, uh, I, I guess I, I would say the same thing about EFAP that I said about uh, moving SNAP online and by phone. Thank God we all work together to have the EFAP system so we could build upon that with the additional dollars that have been put in place and we could build upon that with these additional services, the programs at the schools and the home delivery system. So I think we've learned a lot about uh, how to strengthen the network and new steps that can be taken. And of course, the resources that have been made available uh, in, in partnership with the council are really gonna help here going forward because you're absolutely right, there's great need out there. 
Okay, great. And thank you uh, also. I want to just talk a little bit now about housing insecurity, which has been a huge issue for my district and many others as well. But uh, one of the things that I'm finding is that, and, and, and you probably are very aware of this, is that, um, you know, illegal conversions and overcrowding and single family homes, sometimes you find 20 to 25 people living in the same house, actually renting a bed for, you know, 12 hours, and then the next person comes in and rents the bed for 12 hours. So the, uh, these issues are, are very, very big citywide. So while tenants can't be evicted, uh, while the eviction moratorium is in effect, Many New Yorkers, as I said, are living in overcrowded apartments. People are reporting that they're unable to live in their apartment due to roommate lockouts or health concerns. I've actually heard stories where somebody's gone to Elmhurst Hospital, they get released, they need to convalesce, and then the other folks in the, in the house lock them out. What resources or alternative housing options are available for these individuals and families, and what is DHS uh, doing to publicize them? I mean, I, I've heard disturbing stories like that too. Uh, and so uh, I think you, you're focused on something that's a real issue. Uh, it's important to put it in context before COVID, we had a housing affordability crisis in the city. You know, for a number of years, rents had gone up nearly 19%, income less than 5%. We had lost 150,000 rent stabilized apartments. Uh, the vacancy rate for uh, people who can afford to pay a rent of less than $100 or $100 or less it was about 1.1%. Uh, that is the, the, the set of facts that confronted us. There were significant reforms uh, in the housing area in the state legislature last June, June 2019. Uh, but the, the legacy uh, before those changes is, is the reality of this affordability crisis. And so the city approached the, the kind of fact pattern that you described, someone who's living, renting a room and being uh, ejected because they can't be, the, when they're being char discharged from a hospital. Uh, for people that uh, have had some involvement with DHS, we've been taking direct referrals from the hospitals. For other people, OEM had stood up a system for hospital discharges into OEM beds. Uh, the problem you're describing is one that the city reacted to and saw was a problem. Uh, that's not to say, however, uh, that uh, at the end of the day, the individual really wants to go back to where they were living and not end up in one of our shelters. So we work very hard. Uh, if it's someone that comes to us to try to reconnect them once their case is resolved, as I said, in our isolation sites, uh, nearly 800 people have been able to have their cases resolved, and that's people either who tested positive or had or or who had symptoms because we're not managing. We haven't been managing since the beginning of March uh, to tests. We've been managing to symptoms. So thank you. And, you know, when I, I, I want to acknowledge that when I first brought this issue up to the mayor and, um, and Mitchell Katz as well, Commissioner Katz, uh, they did respond and uh, they've come up with this uh, hotel plan. One of the questions that I have is when they're in the, ho in the, hosp uh, 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 when they're in the hospital, um, who is the person that does the outreach to these folks who fall into that category? That's something I haven't been able to get a, a firm answer on. So there's a, there's a workflow, and I know that sounds bureaucratic, so let me break it down for you. There's a workflow that OEM has, and there's a workflow that DHS has. At the very beginning, uh, we were the first agency to stand up these isolation sites, and we worked through with Dr. Katz consultation with the health department as well, but we worked through with Mitch Katz, a system where if we saw somebody with symptoms or somebody felt like they had symptoms, we would contact H&H &H to determine whether or not the person needed to be hospitalized, depending on the nature of the symptoms, or be taken directly to one of our isolation sites. Conversely, when someone was in the hospital, and was ready to be discharged, maybe their symptoms have not resolved, but they didn't need to remain in the hospital. We worked out a discharge process with the Health and Hospitals uh, Corporation so that individuals could be discharged to one of our isolation sites directly rather than directly to one of our shelters. Given the emergency circumstances, uh, given the breadth of the hospitals in, in New York City, not just the public hospitals, but the privates, there were certainly cases where people were discharged directly to our shelters, and we had to mobilize to get the person out of, out of the shelter and to a, one of our isolation sites. We gave guidance to our shelters if they had such a person that they should be isolated in the shelter, not on an ongoing basis, but at the moment while transportation was being arranged. We created a transportation system in order to move people 
uh, in that set of circumstances. Similarly, there's an interconnection that, uh, that was established between OEM and health and hospitals and the hospital, the private hospitals for a dis discharge process from those hospitals to people not involved with DHS, but someone like the example you gave in a rooming house and had no contact with DHS, became ill, went to a hospital ready for discharge. That system was set up with OEM. So the people making the decisions are both within the hospital and then within the shelter system as well? Uh, for, for clients involved with us, we, we're, we rely upon our health partners to make a determination that someone's ready for discharge, if that's the, the, the nature of the client need that we're dealing with. And then we discharge them either to a shelter if they're ready to go to a shelter or to an isolation site uh, where, again, we've got more than 700 beds. It's half full. I'd rather have the extra capacity in case we need it, uh, but we built it up uh, in order to have that extra capacity. Uh, and then similarly, we have the communication with H&H &H if, uh, if uh, someone is uh, observed to have symptoms in order to make a determination whether they should be hospitalized or go to our isolation site. And that's been in place since the night of March 13th, March 14th, we put that in place. Okay, and Commissioner, also, I thought when the mayor uh, first announced the hotel program, he was saying that he was going to do 11,000 hotel uh, beds. I think that the last number I heard was about 6,700 um, are being utilized. Where do we stand with that? So, so let me uh, break that down for you. I think that there are a lot of discussions about hotels. And if, I, if you indulge me, let me try to lay out all the different hotel options that are occurring. The, those beds that the mayor was discussing was the sort of the OEM health and hospitals uh, health approach to testing, uh, tracing, uh, treating people in isolation. That's part of the, the road to recovery for the city containing the virus. The use of commercial hotels by our agency is an aspect of that, but it's focused on our clients. And as I said, we've been using commercial hotels uh, before uh, COVID-19. In fact, at Human Resources Administration, when I was the commissioner only of HRA in 2015, when we created the program to take people out of three quarters houses in order to uh, uh, reduce overcrowding, we created a hotel program uh, and we housed people in two, uh, two in a room as part of a harm reduction approach. And then when we began to use hotels for DHS as a bridge uh, for opening the uh, Turn the Tide 90 shelters, uh, we placed about 3,500 people in commercial hotels, same model. And so when the coronavirus uh, uh, arose, we had a model we could build upon. And so what we've been doing at DHS is first we stood up, the first priority was to create isolation capacity. because so we didn't want people to remain in our shelters with symptoms or who tested positive uh, who weren't going to be hospitalized. We didn't want them in our system. We wanted them in, in commercial hotels. So we created our first priority was an isolation system. Our next priority was to begin to move out the vulnerable people uh, to protect them uh, uh, in terms of their public health. So we prioritized moving out seniors. We prioritized our larger shelters to de-densify them, to promote social distancing. A large shelter uh, with 200 people or 400 people we wanted to reduce the number of people in that building in order to make social distancing possible uh, and make it possible to have beds appropriately spread out and not, and we staggered meals, we uh, uh, staggered uh, cleanings, we did everything to promote it, but we, we had to reduce the density in order to do so. And that's the initiative that we've been announcing weekly, where in addition, including the first 3,500 people and the isolation beds, We've now got about 9,000 people in commercial hotel rooms, again, using that same harm reduction double occupancy model that we had begun in 2015. And we're going to continue to move people out of uh, our congregate shelters uh, each week to continue to promote social distancing and harm reduction. So I think there, there's, there's sort of two work streams going on here. There's what are we doing in the congregate shelters for single adults and what is OEM and the city writ large doing with respect to using hotels as a containment strategy. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna ask one, a couple more questions and then I'll turn it over to uh, my co-chair, Steve Levin. Um, undocumented immigrants do not, who do not qualify for SNAP are exceptionally at risk of food insecurity and often heavily rely on emergency food providers. So again, how is HRA addressing food insecurity, particularly in immigrant communities? 
And is HRA looking uh, to create a, a local program without immigration status limitations to fill the gaps in the federal SNAP program, something like city food stamps? Is that something that you've thought of? In order to, I, I've certainly thought of that. Uh, but in order to do that, New York State would need to do what uh, Florida, Texas, California have done. Uh, under federal law, there is uh, the uh, states are given the option to create a state only or state local only program for people who would otherwise be eligible for federal benefits, but for immigration status. And so there's a requirement that there be such a state law. I know that there is legislation that has been pending in the state legislature to uh, have New York join California, Texas, and Florida in that, uh, in that approach. Absent that change in federal law, we could not create a city, uh, a city and state only food stamp program. However, uh, we certainly uh, have programs which we can provide emergency assistance for uh, people irrespective of uh, immigration status. Uh, that's, uh, that's how we have operated our shelter system, for example, uh, and we will continue to do that. Okay, and finally, but, any but I, I apologize, uh, Chair, and I, I just want to come back, though. That's why all of the things you, you asked me about at the beginning are so important in terms of evaluating the additional investment that the Council and we have made in food programs, to build out from EFAP that Commissioner uh, Garcia is standing up uh, and also the feeding pro pro the food programs at the schools and the, um, uh, the uh, home delivery uh, programs irrespective of immigration status. Okay. Oh, uh, cutting off. Thank you. And so finally, just um, has any funding been allocated in the city's feeding New York program to support HRA's efforts to reduce food insecurity? I think the, the, the funding for those programs, again, the ones that uh, Commissioner Garcia is spearheading, uh, are reflected in the initiatives that, that her team is, is uh, implementing. We are working very closely. Uh, and obviously, when we get uh, through this immediate crisis, we'll both Commissioner Garcia and her role and our agency and our role will have to evaluate uh, what are the programs that should continue, what are the programs that have been successful, what are gaps that that's may still remain. Okay, thank you. Uh, and before I turn it over, Commissioner, I just want to say we've been joined uh, by uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, Majority Leader Cumbo. Um, bear with me. Um, Councilmember Moy, I see. Yes, he's here. And I said him earlier. And by my friend, the cause, Karen Koslowitz. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to turn it over to Steve Levin. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Drum. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so I will um, begin uh, focusing on HRA um, executive budget. Um, the state's enacted budget includes language that allows uh, the state division of budget to periodically reduce appropriations after April, June, and December if the state revenue is insufficient to balance the budget or if expenditures are higher than anticipated. The recent state financial plan anticipates that a revenue shortfall in April will trigger a at least $8.2 billion cut to localities, primarily impacting Medicaid and school aid. Uh, what is your evaluation of the risks to HRA's budget from this potential state action, especially as it relates to Medicaid? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Chair, and I, and I hope you're doing well. Usually we, we text each other and call each other, so it's good to see your face. Likewise. Um, Thank you. Um, look, I think you've you've been a you've been a leader in this area, frankly, of focusing on this trend of cost shifting uh, at, at hearings over the last couple of years. You, I appreciate you have really shown a, lo a light on this movement of things that had been state obligations to the city. I think that uh, when OMB Director uh, Harzog testified, she highlighted this as a risk to the city, exactly the budgetary structure that you described. Uh, on the other hand, I, I do want to highlight that, you know, Commissioner Hine, the OTD Commissioner, and I are in regular contact. There's been a real partnership uh, in this uh, uh, moment of crisis uh, in terms of waivers that we've been granted. But I do worry, as you worry, uh, that uh, the Medicaid uh, cost shifts and other cost shifts uh, 
will be a, a, a significant problem uh, for us. Uh, the Medicaid dollars in this budget, I just wanted to highlight, is the use of, uh, of federal dollars to help deal with uh, budgetary needs. But you're asking me going forward, are there risks? Yes, there are risks. It's one of the reasons why the governor and the mayor have been so clear about the need for federal uh, assistance for cities and states that have been so hard hit. But at the end of the day, absent that aid, the state budget does give the governor authority uh, to address state budget shortfalls. And there are real risks to the city given the state budget shortfalls that are real. There are real state shortfalls, there are real city shortfalls. And the, these are, uh, I, I know you've asked me what are the risks and I can't, I can't answer your question otherwise, other than to say these are real risks for us in our continued operations and our services. Uh, has, OA, has OMB communicated any um, plan to HRA about how the city will respond quarterly to these, uh, the states, to these updated budget um, uh, uh, as, as the state is doing these quarterly budget updates? I mean, we're, I'm in constant communication with uh, uh, Melanie Harzog and David Greenberg and their whole team there. Uh, to continually assess what our needs are, continually assess what our risks, risks are. Uh, and I'll tell you what our plan is, which is to continue to advocate what we've been advocating for, which is treat the cities and the states like private, private industry has been treated and to make sure that our social safety net can be preserved with federal investment. Uh, uh, Council Member Drum referred to bread lines and people waiting in soup kitchens, conjuring up a picture that we uh, ho hoped we would never see in our city. But the way that our country addressed that problem was with federal leadership that helped states and cities move forward. And that's frankly what's needed here. And I'm very grateful for the House leadership, Speaker Pelosi and uh, Minority Leader Schumer. Uh, and obviously our delegation, including the, the um, Congress member Jeffries and the role he's playing to try to get New York State and New York City what's really needed here to address all the needs that you uh, in the council response highlighted as concerns and the needs that council member Drum highlighted as concerns. These are real issues for real people we serve. Yeah, I, how are we anticipating as an agency the, um, the need for rental assistance for New Yorkers, I mean, with right now we have a, you know, the state a statewide moratorium on evictions. Um, when that is when that is eventually lifted, um, we could potentially see you know a catastrophic influx into um, housing court um, for uh, non payments and holdovers um, that um, that landlord actions that landlords could take against against tenants that are currently being stayed. Um, how, how are we um, gauging that risk right now? And what are we drawing up plans as, as we speak to figure out what the city can do about that? I, I, I hear you about the federal aid. I also heard yesterday that, um, you know, the Senate is unlikely to pass anything by the end of our fiscal year um, uh, in Washington. And so that, you know, obviously we were all hoping to be able to have some answers before uh, we, we, we conclude our budget negotiations, but um, if that doesn't happen, um, we're kind of, we gotta, we gotta, we have to figure out what we're gonna do. I, I, I thank you for the question because I think it, it's a good opportunity to get on the record uh, what the situation is. So again, like the fact that we had our uh, SNAP food stamp program available online and available by uh, telephone, um, uh, I think that there, were, there are some basics that we had in place before COVID uh, that are important uh, to remember will be in place to help us deal with this. Uh, Pre-COVID, while evictions were up all across the country, we had actually driven them down 41% in New York City uh, with the a joint initiative that uh, we had put in place with the council. Now, Council Member Gibson's uh, uh, participating in this hearing, Council Member Gibson and Levine and the entire council with the city, the Right to Council initiative. 
Uh, and that is something that other cities don't have to deal with this. We do have it. And it had been a key part of reducing evictions here when they're up all across the country. Secondly, and I think you know this, that we have been very aggressive in paying rent arrears uh, since 2014, taking a very different approach than the city had previously taken. And our approach was there's an available state grant. There are available uh, grants we should provide, and we have been providing them in a quarter of a million uh, cases, we provided uh, rent arrears grants since 2014. So we have the structures to deal with this. I think you're asking a different question, though, if I may, which is we have the structures to deal with these things. We have a grant that exists to help people avoid being evicted, and we have legal services providers who can balance the playing field, level the playing field in housing court. But what can we do to stop a tidal wave of cases going into the housing court to begin with? And that's where I think a lot of the conversations are focused right now. What can be done to, uh, to reach agreements outside of court, uh, to come up with ways in which we can solve uh, rent arrears payments without the need for filing cases? I know that there's an initiative that various people have become involved with to give additional resources to our home-based providers, to be available on the front lines, to increase access to mediation and other services. I know our legal services providers will be getting additional funding in the coming budget, even with the reduction because of projected underspending, there'll be additional dollars to expand legal services. So the tools that we have before COVID will be there, but I do think you're highlighting the need for a more comprehensive conversation about addressing rent arrears through mechanisms other than simply uh, the way they were addressed before uh, COVID began which is to um, the housing court as a collection agency. And the housing court is not a collection agency. The housing court is there to enforce the housing maintenance code of the city of New York and to make sure that people don't lose their homes wrongfully, which is the reason why both the council uh, and we have, in, have uh, uh, invested in uh, the right to counsel initiative. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the support of housing pegs. Um, you know, we've seen just devastating um, <laughs> devastation around the city in in, in, in since the beginning of this pandemic, uh, with 733,000 people uh, filing for unemployment, 50,000 people remain in shelter, um, uh, and we have uh, in um, FY 20 and 21 um, proposed pegs for reduction in um, supportive housing. Um, instead of instead of Putting, and we, you could talk about the why why there are pegs in support of housing, um, but even and, and that may be that there's uh, you know programmatic reasons or kind of things that are built into the process of getting supportive housing online that might be the reason for that. But in light of the great need that we're seeing, why are we not uh, instead reallocating uh, savings that we might be achieving because uh, the supportive housing programs are, are slow in coming. Um, why not reallocate those to other uh, programs that we know will keep New York City residents um, housed, such as rent arrears or other other aspects of a rental assistance program? So a, 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 a great question. Just uh, to, to pick up on your last point, though, remember rent arrears are an entitlement program. So it's an entitlement funding stream. Uh, in terms of supportive housing and a number of the other pegs that I described, legal services being one of them, these were not cuts to ongoing programs or to the baseline. These are cuts based upon projected spending. It's similar to fair fares, the less, less use of the cards. We've got 175,000 people with the cards right now, but less use of them, therefore less billing from the, from the, uh, from the MTA uh, or New York City Transit to pay, pay mm -hmm. that. So similarly with supportive housing, it was a, an analysis of given the pipeline to actually bring units online and given the pipeline to find scattered site units in the marketplace, given the shutdown order, what actually was going to be achievable. So it's not a cut to the baseline of the program. It's an analysis of given the pause and all of the limitations, even when we begin to open up that are likely to be there, what's the spending gonna be? And so the idea in working collaboratively with OMB was to say, 
given the critical needs of the social safety net in the city, how can we reduce spending to deal with the financial problems that the city's facing without cutting into actual operating programs? And wh where could we find underspending caused by COVID-19 and the aftermath that would allow us to generate savings for the city overall at the same time as not uh, affecting the operation of our program? So you're right that there's a great need, but there's also a challenge of getting that need met given the pause. Um, okay. Um, let me ask a couple more questions and I'll turn it over to my colleagues um, for their questions and I'll come back on a second round. Um, um, I just want to ask a little bit about SNAP and cash assistance numbers uh, uh, since, the, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, you had said that they've they've doubled. Can you just speak a little bit more uh, specifically? What are the application numbers in March and April for SNAP and cash assistance? I mean, cash assistance doubled, SNAP tripled. Uh, just I'll give you an idea. Um, the first week of March, I mean, you've got to look at it weekly, right? The first week of March, uh, we received uh, about 4,800 cash assistance applications and about uh, 5,500 uh, separate SNAP applications. Uh, I'll just go to the sort of the, the peak week or one of the peak weeks, uh, April 13th to April 16th, right? So that would have been, you know, the highlight of, 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 the, of when the cases in the city reached its peak that, that week. We had uh, almost 6,800 cash assistance applications and uh, 19,000 uh, uh, SNAP applications. What did we do about it? Because obviously uh, you couldn't plan that there would be this sort of an economic meltdown that would occur uh, uh, instantaneously over the course of a couple of weeks. We couldn't you know, conduct hiring pools to, to hire people who will qualify for a civil service list. So we looked at our internal resources and we reassigned existing staff to be able to do this work. We had to train them. We had to deliver them technology so they could work from their homes. So the clients uh, could submit applications and workers could handle them from their homes. And that effort has involved almost uh, 1,400, I'm sorry, uh, 1,332 uh, 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 individuals who have been uh, reassigned in order to help us address these applications. Uh, okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, can you speak a little bit, just, just to get some some uh, more of the hard numbers, what are the, uh, can you give us a percentage of the um, for the outcomes percentage granted versus percentage denied of, of SNAP and cash assistance? Uh, here's, why, here's why I can't, because remember that for each period of time, there are different uh, obligations to do different things. Sometimes there are documents that are missing and if we can extend that period of time without denying it, I understand what you're asking about, mm -hmm. and I will work with you and your staff and the committee staff to get you a little bit more granular detail, but it sort of depends on the status in which the case is in. It also depends on what waivers we got from the federal government when we got them, because remember, this was not a static situation. We got different kind of waivers at different points in time, including waivers on, in, in, on conducting interviews for certain clients. So it's not like when we went into pause on, on the week of uh, March 16th, all of the tools that we needed to deal with this increase in applications were there. Mm -hmm. But we will work with, work with your team to get you the information you're asking for. Um, are, can you speak a little bit about uh, um, whether HRA is uh, granting immediate needs grants um, in lieu of uh, uh, the, the you know the, the the processing time it might take to to issue um, public assistance. 
on these. I, I think you're, I think you're, if, if I could, if I may, I think you're probably asking about the 45 day wait period under state law for safe yeah. existence. Uh, we asked for a waiver of that 45 day wait period and that waiver request was denied. There's not an additional immediate need grant that you can do um, in, in lieu of that wait time. I mean, you, you, we're, we're not permitted to provide ongoing assistance. That's what the, that's what the problem is. We asked for the waiver in order to be able to provide ongoing assistance uh, to people. Uh, mm -hmm. And the fact that the waiver was not granted, you know, obviously we provide, you know, normal emergency type assistance for people. But I think what we wanted, and I believe what you're getting at, is we wanted the ability to provide people ongoing assistance and not make them wait 45 days. Right, an immediate, in, a, in an immediate grant to be able to, um, when somebody's making an application, um, they're, um, they have, you know, they obviously are in, um, have immediate needs that, that need to be met. Right, and we, can, and we can and do do that. But the problem for our clients is we could meet an immediate need on the application date, and then they're left to wait for 45 days till they get actual the ongoing assistance, which is what they really need. And that's why mm -hmm. we asked for the waiver, uh, and it was not uh, not granted. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues um, and come back for more questions in a little bit. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll now go to council member questions. If any council members have questions for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the sergeant at arms to tell you when your time begins. The sergeant will let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from council member Holden followed by council member Gudunchik. Council member, your time will start now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, Commissioner, the pandemic exposed the weaknesses of the congregate shelter model. Seeing this, is your agency adjusting the thinking behind it or, or the design of these uh, shelters uh, going forward? So I think that your question really gets to, to the heart of the following conundrum. Uh, after the pandemic, if the perspective is that we should no longer have congregate shelters, we would need to site a lot more shelters throughout the city. It's really that simple. If you take a, a hundred bed shelter and uh, instead of having a hundred bed shelter, you need to have uh, an SRO type setting, you need to site a lot more shelters around the city. And that's a discussion that I'd be happy to have with you anytime. Yeah, uh, just uh, in in um, in touring the one that was recently built in my district, uh, I thought it resembled a jail. It didn't it didn't feel like a, a place to reside in. It didn't feel even a place to sleep. Uh, you're in a dormitory style room. You share. Uh, everyone shares a bathroom on the floor. There are two security uh, stations on each floor. Obviously, uh, that does, that's not very comfortable. So you had a blank slate there. And I just don't know why individual rooms couldn't have been built, even with two men in a room, but at least uh, I think that that model, I mean, if you look at that model, nobody could feel comfortable. And again, it, it actually promotes violence because so many people are shoved into a, a room and if one or two people have arguments, that's when the, um, the violence breaks out. If you had individual rooms, uh, and I think that's a better, much better model. Yes, it costs more. Yes, we need more of them. But I don't think you'd see the violence. You wouldn't see the problems that come up, obviously. And you would see more homeless, not you know, afraid to go into these uh, situations. Before the pandemic, the congregate shelters were a problem. Now, during it, glaring problems. So I think your agency, uh, and if you're not doing it, I don't know why, but there needs to be other models being looked at. So I would say two, two things. I, I look, I respect your question. Uh, I, I, w I think if we were going in that direction, I would need to be assured that I would have your support and the support of others for the cost of that model. And I would also just want to raise that, you know, in your community, 
we had another location that we wanted to use as a shelter, which was the Holiday Inn Express, which would have had two people in a room rather than a congregate shelter. And for reasons that you and I both know, uh, we were unable to proceed with the shelter there. And so we opened a shelter on, on Cooper Avenue. If we were to have made Cooper Avenue in the same model of what we could have gotten at the Holiday Inn Express, we would have ended up with a lot more uh, of a cost investment. And if I could have been assured this committee would have supported that kind of cost investment, that's a model we might want to discuss. Um, but again, you, you haven't addressed in the new world going forward, uh, will your agency come up with a new model? Yes, you can worry about the council members approval you know, after, but propose, we don't see a model. We don't have that model anywhere in the city of New York as I know of. Uh, the uh, congregate shelters are the model. Uh, it, will you commit to the, at least redesigning it going forward? Council member, We've been reforming a haphazard system that has been in existence for 40 years. We're constantly looking at things. After this pandemic, we're all going to be taking a look at what worked and what didn't work. And we will continue to look at how best to provide shelter to single adults. But I don't want to minimize something you said. Supportive council members for the opening of shelters in their communities is one of the key elements of reforming the shelter system. And when shelter openings are opposed, it delays opening better facilities, whether they're congregate well, or not congregate. Well, again, you remember my proposal was for more, uh, smaller shelters, uh, faith-based, which you initially shot down. Smaller shelters in the pandemic would be work much better than the large congregate shelters of 200 individuals within one location. Actually, your model, your model would have been faith-based where the clients were out during the day and only in at night. Nope. And, I, and I think that's bad for clients to be ejected from their shelter during the day. No, and that's not, that's not, you said that over and over again. I didn't say that. The, the model would be 24-7. Uh, I couldn't I, find anyone. I couldn't find anyone who wanted to do 24-7. Well, Folks, I have to call time. So I know this is an ongoing discussion. But uh, we, I need to move on to the next council member. Thank you both. We will now hear from council member Grudenchik followed by council member Lander. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, chairs. Uh, good morning, commissioner. Good to see you. Always good to see you. Uh, prefer to be at city hall, but the commute is much better today. Um, my question, I have two questions. I wanna pick up on what um, chair Levin uh, talked about. Um, I am, I think you used the words tidal wave. I was going to use the word tsunami or avalanche, but um, we are currently in an eviction moratorium and that is going to last at least through sometime in August. Um, but I am very, very concerned and I'm sure it tops your thinking that uh, we don't have um, tens of thousands or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of families um, evicted from their rental units. and. I'm wondering, you know, we keep hearing all kinds of different numbers. Has has HRA under your uh, administration uh, made any kind of estimate of what we might be facing? I won't hold you to it. I know you're under oath, but I won't hold you to it. <laughs> uh, look, I think that there are obviously tens of thousands of people that could pay their rent uh, in February and maybe even in March but couldn't pay their rent in April and May. Understood. And the real question is, when will they be able to pay future rent? And what do you do with the rent that's accrued? And that I think is where, the, where sort of the, the, the uh, sort of delta is. Okay. And I think when the courts reopen and the eviction moratorium is lifted, a real question is what is the economic status going to be? I don't know that we will be in the same place that we were uh, in February in terms of the kinds of jobs and kind of work there is. There's a lot of challenges that I know at the governor's level and the mayor's level, everybody is evaluating in terms of a, when can New York uh, be able to uh, move out of the current state. And so I think one of the deltas is 
the people that are unable to pay April and May rent, how many and June rent, how many of them will be able to pay some future rent? And then what role can we play at HRA as a bridge for that rent arrears and keep them whole? Commissioner, then I think there'll be another group of people who couldn't pay April, May, June and don't have prospects of employment. And that's the group of people we're going to have to figure out how to give a helping hand to. And, and uh, you, you mentioned that we've done about a quarter million, uh, what we colloquially have called one shots since 2014. Can you just give me a, an idea what the average one shot is? I, I can. If, if I don't have all of my papers laid out if, as if I was at City Hall, but I want to just get them out. So um, in, in this fiscal year to date, uh, the average uh, payment was $4,128. Okay, that is helpful. Last question. I just want to build on what uh, Chair Drum um, If I said. could answer a question that you didn't ask me. In 2013, yeah. the average payment was $2,949. Okay. That's a, a considerable amount. Um, I got a minute and a half left. Uh, I just want to pick up on what Chair Drum said. Um, we're not seeing the soup lines or whatever you want to call them in Eastern Queens, because uh, we're so far spread out that we, we can't do that. And most of my seniors, to be honest, seem to be somewhere between frightened and terrified uh, to come outside. And so um, we have established two food pantries that didn't exist pre COVID um, both at the Samfield center and at snap senior services. And um, just want to make sure that we have, and the mayor has been right on this. Um, and I know you have as well. Uh, I know we added $25 million for emergency food, um, but I want um, your assurance that this will remain a top priority because um, there's a lot of other issues as we have, and you know, and, uh, you and I and the Chair Levin have had this discussion, and uh, we, we've uh, made significant progress um, in emergency food, but I just want to make sure that this administration is prepared to do whatever it is, whatever it takes to make sure that nobody goes hungry in the city of New York. Well, uh, you, you're absolutely right to, to reference our ongoing discussions about it and the significant progress that we made. And I think that the council administration partnership of adding that additional $25 million was really important. But I, I, I want to just repeat what I said in response to uh, Chair Drum. You know, the mayor highlighted food was one of yes. the priorities here. Yes. And you can see it in appointing a food czar. Uh, to tie together all the different food programs that different agencies have, the ability to use the schools as a distribution point, uh, the home delivery system uh, in a more centralized way fun. now, and the work that we're doing as well. I think it's, it's really building on the work that we've all done together on EFAP. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you very much. Next council member, please. We now hear from Council Member Landard, followed by Council Member Salamanca. Council Member, your time will start now. Thank you to both chairs and Steve, as always, really uh, very good to see you. And I'm so grateful for the work that you uh, have done in the past to get us here, like building the systems you've talked about today, but of course also litigating to win the right to shelter in the in the very beginning, your, your role in helping us do our very level best to rise to the needs facing low income New Yorkers is is tremendous and and I remain grateful for your for your doing it. Thank you very much and I appreciate your partnership and all that you do. Uh, on the on the 25 million in emergency food I've been out most Sundays at Masbia and the lines are just truly heartbreaking and you've got people who can get those meals those one off meals but you know, you can't live on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and hummus and carrots forever and getting people like groceries and staples and produce is so essential. So I'm grateful for that partnership, though I know we have a lot more to do. Um, I want to ask you, you started to do this in, in response to both Councilmember Krudenchik and Chair Levin's questions, but there's no one that I would trust more than you to stand up a system that addresses the housing challenges that we're going to be facing. So I wonder if you'd just spend a minute or two more um, imagining what you think we should do in this impossible problem. You see the calls out there to cancel rent for everyone. Obviously, some people are fortunate enough to still have jobs and are able to pay their rent, and that means their landlords can pay their mortgages. Um, but so many people don't have that, and we're not going to be able to solve it all with one-shot deals. We're going to need something, I guess, like a new version of like pandemic advantage, you know, uh, what if, if you were giving advice to the mayor, to the governor, to our congressional delegation to stand up a system that can meet the housing emergency in this pandemic, what would it look like? 
Wow, that was quite a one a runway you gave me. Well, I, I wish I knew some other people that could better help us solve this problem, but uh, but I, I you're the one that I, I rely an awful lot on. You know, I, I think what's so important at this moment is that we should grasp for what's needed, even though we sometimes have to suffer, uh, settle for what's possible. And I think that it was important in one of the last stimuluses that there was an investment in Section 8, because this is one of the great challenges of housing and poverty. Our agency, the largest in the country, is charged with addressing poverty. We run entitlement programs, none of which is set up to, get, to, to bridge the gap between rent and income, which has been such a driver of homelessness nationally statewide and obviously in our city, talked about the rents increasing 19%, uh, income up less, uh, less than 5%. The Section 8 program is set up as a first come, you know, sort of it's a cap program, it's not an entitlement. So in terms of trying to fight poverty, we're trying to address it with entitlement programs, which are largely not, not funded nationally at the level that's needed because they're not taking into account the cost of rent. But there's a rental assistance program which does take into a cost, account the cost of rent, but it is not available for everyone who needs it. And so whereas I could give everyone a one shot who meets an entitlement criteria, the housing part of our world can't give everyone a section eight. And this is really highlighting that need for a more comprehensive strategy on this. But Look, the city has done a lot, and I, I you know, I, I'm, I've been a critic of the city when I wasn't working for the government. Some might say within the government, I've not kept my mouth shut, uh, and I try to be honest with this this committee. Yeah. But the level of need is a level of need that no single city can meet, and that's why we have to we have to avoid what we sometimes fall into, which is the determination to consume ourselves yeah. instead of addressing what the underlying structural problems are. Look, I think fighting together for some version of pandemic section eight that obviously also needs to provide for undocumented and immigrant families so that they don't wind up homeless seems so obvious right now that we should not let people become homeless in this crisis at the end of it, you know, as rent as uh, rent burden is building up is so clear. So I appreciate that and I'll take it as marching orders. I wanna ask you one last question in my remaining uh, few seconds. Um, uh, last week, I heard from some security guards in the private D in, in DHS shelters operated by private nonprofits, who then are subcontracted to security guard companies that pay them the minimum wage, don't even provide them health insurance, and some of them have to fight for their sick leave. I think there's something like 3,000 workers like that. I know they had get you know the workers who are in the shelters that are operated by DHS are better expired. treated. And I value the nonprofit providers, but it was appalling to hear that these essential workers are out there at minimum wage with no health insurance. And I'd just like to ask for your commitment, either not to privatize any more shelters right now, or at least to step up and figure out how we make sure that those essential workers, those shelter guards are not experiencing just a real cruel version of exploitation in the midst of this pandemic. So thanks for the question. I mean, I can say once we address the supply chain problems, the uh, PPE that we pushed out has gone to uh, uh, security guards, whether or not they're city employees or uh, uh, private security guards. Obviously, the supply chain problems uh, affected our ability to do that at the beginning. Uh, that has now been addressed and we're getting regular supply in our workings with, uh, with the city uh, agencies overall. Deputy Mayor Englund and, and uh, Diane Criswell have been real partners in helping us meet that need. But we've also eliminated uh, several of the companies that might be involved with what you're describing to me in terms of some of these sick leave issues, but I'll follow up with you offline or our teams can follow up offline about exactly which, which providers there were because we might have already addressed this. That, that sounds good, although I think, again, I talked to several who don't have health insurance. Uh, I'm sorry, but we need to move on. I'm sorry. Okay, we'll follow up offline. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Next council member, please. We will now hear from Councilmember Salamanca, followed by Councilmember Ayala. Councilmember, your time will start now. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good to um, see you, Councilmember. Good to see you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner, in the beginning of 2019, um, the, at the end of 2019, 
uh, the council passed the 15% homeless set aside, uh, which will require every developer that's getting city dollars uh, to set aside 15% of their units uh, for buildings that are 40 units or more. Um, and I know that during this process, DHS and HPD uh, stated that this is something that's currently happening now with homeless set aside. Uh, can you tell me is during this pandemic, is um, DHS and HPD still coordinating and uh, getting uh, individuals that are ready for independent living into their permanent apartments? Uh, yes, the answer is yes, and let me let me fill in some details if I could. All right, um, please briefly, because I, I have limited time. I have other questions. Uh, okay, I'm going to answer yes, and I will say we we have developed a, a range of processes to do virtual apartment inspections. Uh, we've developed uh, ways in which we could uh, ex extend uh, the time that someone's voucher was useful was was live, even if they had just lost their employment. Uh, and we've created ways in which we can cut checks and help people move out. So people have been moving out even during this pandemic. So, and the reason I ask this commissioner is because I've been, I've been talking to some clients in certain um, DHS facilities that are run by some nonprofits. And it's my understanding that part of this plan, they call it an independent living plan appointment, where the client meets with the counselors or the social workers. And I believe a representative from DHS uh, so that they can start planning uh, to get, you know, getting them into yes. this permanent apartment. But I'm hearing from clients that these these uh, appointments are being canceled because DHS is focusing on the transition of getting individuals out of the dorm style settings and putting them into temporary housing um, or, or hotels because of COVID-19. So I just want to make sure that, um, that you are aware of this and that, you know, is this something that's happening where DHS has stopped these appointments because your focus is on something else? It, 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 is, the, it, it is true that for each week, we are pushing our providers very hard to move out at least a thousand people. Uh, and that I'm certain is resulting in during that week, cancellation of appointments because of the focus on the move outs. But look, I don't wanna try to solve one problem, namely protecting public health and have an unintended consequence of another problem of someone who could move out not moving out. So we will take a look as we go forward uh, in terms of uh, making sure that someone who might be ready to move out into permanent housing doesn't lose an opportunity uh, because we're really driving to move people out of the shelter. Of course, once they're in the commercial hotel, uh, that planning process will continue in terms of the independent living plan to connect people to permanent housing and make sure people are ready for permanent housing. But thank you for calling that to my attention. All right. Um, during uh, the process of trying to get this 15% homeless set aside bill passed, um, I got one of the arguments in terms of resisting this bill was that when you take an, a family is ready for independent living and you put them into the apartments, who's gonna follow them? Where's the aftercare going to, how's the aftercare yeah. going to happen? Uh, can you explain to me briefly, uh, is, is that happening, that aftercare, and who's responsible for that aftercare? Right. Is that not-for-profit that was taking care of that family, or you're, you're, you're breaking it up into zones throughout the city? Uh, uh, it's, it's the latter. Our home-based providers are given information about people who are relocating out of shelter to that neighborhood. And uh, so, for example, in your set-aside uh, 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 legislation, uh, if somebody was in a shelter in, I don't know, downtown Brooklyn, and they're moving to a different place in Brooklyn, there'd be a home-based provider whose obligation is to reach out to that particular family uh, to follow up. I think one of the things when we get through all of this, I'd be happy to engage with you and any uh, housing providers that might need us to walk through exactly how that works so that they could be assured that, they, that, they would, that there are actually those aftercare services available. All right. Uh and then my, my final question, Commissioner, in this budget, uh, did you request funding so that we can get PPEs to families in the shelter system? And most importantly, something that I observed as I'm out there uh, handing out face masks to my constituents and me having a five-year-old, our face masks are predominantly for adults. And so um, I, I had to buy a special face mask for my son whenever he goes outside, but the face masks that we give, they would have to tie them up so that they fit the, the, the young toddlers as they're walking with their parents. Is there a plan for the city to purchase face masks for younger I'm children? Inspired. Uh, we have been distributing uh, face coverings to our clients. And so by way of example, in our HRA centers, 
uh, everybody over the age of two has to have a face covering unless there's a particular medical condition. And so we do have those kinds of face coverings available. Uh, we have been uh, mostly focused on our congregate shelters, but we'll take another look uh, at, our, uh, at our families with children's shelters. We do have face coverings for children that are made available, but your question, as always your questions do, uh, makes me wanna make sure that we're, we're fully implementing what our policy is to make sure that face coverings are available for children uh, in families with children's shelters. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. Okay, we'll go to our next council member, please. We will now hear from Council Member Ayala, followed by Council Member Adams. Council Member, your time will start now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairs Drummond Levin. Um, my apologies, but I'm having some technical difficulties this morning. Um, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. My question is uh, related to the burial funds program, and I uh, first want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson and Council Member Moya for fighting to make sure that. Uh, the increase to uh, to to that that resource was prioritized. Um, can you tell us if funding increases have gone into effect and how HRA is promoting this resource so the New Yorkers know that it exists? Uh, again, thank you for for focusing on this program, which I think is an an important one. It addresses an issue that we have been concerned about for a long time, which is that the grant level uh, was not adequate. Uh, and secondly, that uh, we wanted to make sure that it was available to people ir irrespective of immigration status. Uh, the, it's, it's promoted on our website. I conduct a weekly call. I know you've been on it and I appreciate that you've followed up with me on it. I conduct a weekly call with elected officials of their staff, with community-based uh, organizations, with advocacy organizations, with our contractors, and we are actively pushing out this information that it is available. Uh, and we will continue to do so. And I'll certainly take any suggestions offline about uh, anywhere that we might uh, go. I was did a roundtable with ethnic media, community media, with uh, uh, Bita Mustafi, Commissioner Mustafi, and Commissioner Carrion, uh, uh, Marco Carrion, to make sure that all the uh, media, local media were aware of this. And they asked for a frequent uh, 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 FAQ about the program. We were providing that so that can be rolled out too. Uh, so that people who are reading trusted local media uh, can get the information that way. So a person that's watching um, today um, should know that the funds were increased uh, from 900, right? Was it? Uh, yeah. To, I, 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 to I 1700? 900 to 1700. Uh, and uh, the cap has been increased from 1700 to 3400. It's clearly makes it really clear that it's available for cremation uh, as well as other services. Uh, and in addition, uh, that we have private funds to provide benefits irrespective of immigration status. Uh, and uh, we will, people can look at our website uh, where the information is available and we'll get information out to the council members uh, in our next uh, mailing so that you can push this information out as well. That'll be really helpful. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank you, council member. Okay, we'll go to our next council member. We will now hear from Councilmember Adams, followed by Councilmember Jonai. Councilmember, your time will start now. Thank you. Thank you to our chairs for this hearing, and good morning, Commissioner Banks. Good morning. I hope you're doing well. I, I am. I am hanging in there, sir. Thank you, um, Commissioner. There's been concern um, around domestic violence, and we spoke with. Uh, NYPD on this uh, DV issue as well last week. So just wanting to get your perspective that, um, you know, because folks are in close quarters, um, we know that DV uh, instances are not being reported, even though we know also know that um, instances are going up um, uh, of domestic violence. Um, people are stuck at home, they're in close quarters. So how much is HRA actually investing to ensure that there is widespread messaging so that victims still know that there are services available to them um, to support them and uh, to create uh, more of a safe space for them? Thank you for that question. This has been something that I know Councilmember Rosenthal has talked to me uh, quite a bit about. Uh, in terms of messaging, I know that uh, the mayor's office to end gender-based violence is, is now very much uh, focused on uh, messaging approaches. We at HRA have been focused on making sure that there are enough resources uh, in the event that once the pause lifts,
people will be be looking to flee situations that they have been in. So let me talk to you a bit about some concrete things that we have done in that regard. I don't want to. I'm not. I'm not discounting the importance of messaging, but I want to be ready as an agency in the event that there's a greater need after after the pause is lifted for all the reasons that you you you're concerned about. So first, we requested a waiver to open up a DV shelter in a uh, in a commercial hotel. Uh, I know you and I both have concerns about commercial hotels, but yes, we do. But in this environment, I wanted to make sure I had resources available for the reason I'm about to tell you. We have a series of tier two or or uh, permanent DV shelter beds coming online uh, through the end of the year. Uh, we have about 300 more units that can accommodate 300 more families uh, that will be online by the end of the year. But I wanted to make sure we had a bridge uh, in the event that we, when the pause is lifted, that we need uh, to be able to provide domestic violence services. So we asked the state for a waiver to be able to run a shelter in a commercial hotel. Conditionally, it's been approved. There, there's now some technical things that we need to do to get it finally approved. Why are we doing that? I wanna make sure I've got the resources online when the pause is lifted, but I wanna assure you for the reasons that you and I have discussed going back to when you were the, the community board, uh, that this is not a permanent thing. This is a bridge until we get these rest of these units up until the end of the year. I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate you laying our history out there also. <laughs> it's been a good, <laughs> it's been a good one though. It's been a good it one. has been a good one. We've come a long way. It has been a good one. So I appreciate that, um, that very much. Uh, and I think I'm gonna end my questions there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now go to our next question. We'll now hear from Councilmember Joe Nye, followed by Councilmember Carnegie. Councilmember, your time will start now. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, good to see you, Commissioner. Good to see you, um, too. So I'm, I have a slew of questions. I'm going to put them uh, all together as a package, and I hope you can then respond to them uniquely. Sure. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about the success with the MTA, the closure, and the, the unprecedented success of getting our homeless out of the trains and buses and into shelters. Uh, give us updated numbers. How many are actually taking advantage of the facilities and the programs and remaining there? Um, as well as the importance of our homeless uh, wearing proper PPE. My question would be when the governor declared a state of emergency due to COVID-19, isn't it in the best interest that we get the homeless off the street and into a safe environment so that they're not exposed to the COVID-19 virus, as well as um, not giving it to others that they come into contact with. And we see a increase in homeless populations now in our parks, especially with the warmer weather coming up. Now they're leaving the train stations and working their way into our parks, and we don't see the same enforcement um, assuring the homeless that they have options and it's not healthy and it's not in their best interest to live in parks for themselves and for other park goals. And you keep bringing up shelters that are needed and we need cooperation by the, by the council members in locating shelters. I've offered this proposal several times. This should actually be proposed to community boards. Community boards know the district. They know where a shelter would work. You should work with community boards in determining the site locations and if they don't come up with one, then you can obviously pursue uh, the options that you have uh, available to you. I know that there's a lot of loaded questions and my, my last one to you is you mentioned the shortage of PPE initially within the shelters and how the administrators and security guards were not, um, did not have an adequate supply. But I know of situations where the administrators, employees at shelters, were bringing their own PPE equipment and they were not authorized to use it. They were coming in with letters explaining their health, underlying health conditions, their concerns uh, to the exposure, and they were still not permitted to wear masks inside of a shelter. So if you can remember all of those, uh, I'll leave it to you to answer in two and a half minutes. Let, let, let me do my best, I, but I think there's four questions and I'm gonna try to answer the four questions. So uh, the question about shelter sightings, let me just address it this way. Every March or April, I send a letter out to every community board, every elected official, and I say, here's the progress we're making, 41% drop in evictions, for example, 
145,000 people moved into permanent housing. I, I give an update and I say, and we still need sites. Please propose some sites to me. Some community boards, some elected officials have joined uh, that effort and some have not. And then we've done exactly what you told me I'm, I, I would have to do, which is if I don't get a site, go find your own. So, so, so therefore, I, I think what your suggestion was is a very good one. And I want to tell you, I took it to heart and I've been doing it for each of the last three years, sending out an annual letter. Commissioner, but they also, it, it, when they do offer sites, you're taking those sites and still installing other sites. It so there's a big difference here. If you say to a community board, hey, you've been, you need two sites and they propose two sites and you bring four sites in because you found two others. Well, I would be, I'd be very interested in, in, in following up offline about the facts there because typically what happens is we need two sites, we don't get offered any, or we need two sites and we get offered one. But I would say more typically overall, what actually happens, there's a dispute about the opening of a shelter when it opens, it becomes part of the community and we don't have the kind of disputes pr previously because why New Yorkers are fundamentally compassionate people. You asked me about a couple of different things. One as to PPE. At the beginning of March, the early part of this, the guidance was not to, to wear PPE. And so therefore people weren't wearing PPE. And there was a concern about people wearing it and other people not wearing it. As soon as the guidance was everybody should wear it, we made it clear everybody could wear whatever they had and we would do everything we could to get it for everybody. So if we go back to the very beginning of March when the first case happened, the guidance has evolved as we've gone along. And so the example that you give sounds to me like it actually occurred at that beginning period of time and we addressed it. But I, 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 I totally understand what you're asking me about. Lastly, the- Time's expired. Uh, if I may answer the question, even though time's expired? Yes, please do. Okay. Yes, you may. Uh, so there's questions around the MTA uh, initiative, uh, the shutdown of the subways. Uh, look, I think the mayor and I have said it, the Daily News editorial uh, you know, yesterday said it. Uh, what we're seeing is a dramatic increase in people willing to engage with outreach teams and willing to consider coming inside. And we found in that first week, 200 people did come inside. Actually for the first five days, as the Daily News pointed out, it wasn't even the first week, 200 people came inside to a shelter program and another 100 people went to the hospital. Uh, and we found that that kind of success rate of half the people agreeing to consider services and then people coming inside has continued, we will do weekly reporting. So we have each, each time we have a full week of reporting, there'll be another report coming out this week. We're being very transparent, whatever the numbers are, there'll be the numbers. But I think you can see, and again, the Daily News pointed this out in the editorial yesterday, that you can see that people are accepting services at rates that they previously had. They may not be remaining in services on an ongoing basis uh, in, uh, 100%, but there's a core group of people who are now staying inside and that is really important. In terms Mr. of can I, can Mr. Mr. Expand that to the parks? It, yeah, I was going to answer that too. In terms of focusing on the parks, we have 24 7 outreach throughout the city. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on the end of the subway lines, and we will, uh, as the um, warmer months are coming, certainly continue to focus on uh, uh, engaging people and trying to bring people off the streets in addition to the subways. Uh, Commissioner, uh, this is Councilor uh, 11. I just, I just wanted, Danny, I just want to just have a quick follow up on that. that just want to be clear, though, um, the the percentage of, um, of of those people that have come off the subway that have remained in shelter for a week or longer is what? So I'm, I'm going to give you that first five day period because we're going to put out numbers uh, weekly. And the most important mm -hmm. thing is to uh, focus on chunks of time. So that first period of time, half the period, half the people on the subway platform agreed to be engaged. Yeah. Uh, that resulted in about 200 plus people actually going to shelter. Okay. And 100 people of that 200 actually staying in shelter at the end of that period of time. And how long was that? Uh, that by that point, it would have been, I think they were in actually seven days at that period of time. Uh, and in addition, 100 people left the streets to go to the hospital. Uh, so that's, that's the universe that we're dealing with. Uh, and we will know more when we put out another week's worth of data. 
Uh, and it's sort of like, I think what the Times was speaking about in April, whatever the data shows, we're gonna put it out. That's why every day we've been putting out data about cases in our shelter system, where they're coming from, what's the nature of, of, the, of the person. We've been putting that out since the beginning. So we're gonna put this information out on a weekly basis too. And it'll show what it shows, but we think it's important to show our work and we're gonna keep doing it. Okay, thank you. Let's go to our next council member. We will now hear from Councilmember Cornicky, followed by Councilmember Gibson. Councilmember, your time will start now. Hey, good afternoon, Commissioner. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good to see your face. Always good to see you, too. It's good uh, to see everybody's face, but I hadn't seen you in a long time. Yeah, so actually, under the circumstances, it's good to actually be seen, so I'll take that. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the um, fiscal impact of continuing to use transient services over a more sustainable model which is to get people placed. So as a chair of housing and buildings, I'm acutely aware that there are thousands of apartments that sit ready and are available to, uh, to um, former shelter residents, uh, with housing with support services. Um, I know that that's more cost effective. I think the last time I checked, it was three times as expensive to temporarily house uh, an individual as it was to uh, find long-term sustainable housing. I bring that up is because now is the time that we should be pivoting away from the model. Like we have this crisis to, to allow us in an emergency to pivot away from the continued use of a non-sustainable method, which is the transit method, the transient method, which has not provided for us any means of getting folks into real life situations. Uh, I'm wondering why the thinking continues to be that we should have transient above long-term sustainable housing when it's cost effective and as as an you know in my my modest attempt to be a good fiscal steward uh with the city's dollars especially under the financial crisis that we find crisis that we find ourselves under the eight billion dollars in revenue uh, uh that we'll be losing wouldn't it be more prudent to begin to look at these vacant apartments which are more sustainable ways to house uh, formerly um for former residents of, of shelters. I, I don't know what the administration's thinking is from a fiscal standpoint uh, uh, and a social standpoint at this point, uh, providing uh, long-term sustainable housing as opposed to this transient model, which clearly uh, hasn't worked out in terms of increasing people's quality of life. So thank you for your question. And I, I take it in the spirit of, of, of Council Member Lander's question, which is, all right, going forward, what's the fresh look we should take at everything? Which I appreciate the spirit of that question. So from the social services agency perspective, because remember that's what we are, we're a social services agency. We've been able to connect before the pandemic, uh, we were able to connect 145,000 people to permanent housing. And we're gonna keep doing that. And I wanna find all those vacant apartments and move people into them because we have the ability to pay rental assistance to move people into vacant apartments. Uh, it's possible that one impact of this crisis is going to be more vacancies. And if we can move more people into those vacancies with the tools that we have, we want to do that. Right before the pandemic happened, HPD had made available to us apartments that were not rented uh, in some of the uh, housing programs. And we worked out a, a mechanism to pay uh, our, a little bit more than the voucher amount to get into those units. And so we're working with HPD to move our clients into any vacancies that can be found. If there are private market vacancies that, that can be garnered for us, we have a whole apparatus to move people into them and that will begin to reduce the numbers of people in shelter. Uh, I also wanna uh, point out that the numbers of families with children and the numbers of people in families with children in our census now is at, is at the level that it was in December, 2012. So the permanent housing and prevention strategies are really significantly driving down family homelessness. If you look at the dynamics of our census, where we are in terms of numbers of children, numbers of adults in families, numbers of families with children, we are at a place that this city has not been at since December, 2012. The census is reflecting, however, increases in homelessness among single adults. And that is a group of people for whom the rental market is particularly challenging. So I think we should focus on the tools that we have used that have worked and keep driving them 
and make use of those vacant apartments when we can identify them, but also look at some of the needs of our single adults who are coming to us. And right now, uh, actually, the number of adults is going up while the number of families of children is going down. Uh, thank you. I got 25 seconds to give you a heads up that you'll be hearing from my colleagues who are in the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus uh, in, in an effort to make sure that there is parity in these placements as well. So it's not a NIMBY conversation. It's a NIMBY. Of, it's a conversation of equity and of parity. And I only got eight seconds left, so I can't address it. But I assure you uh, to get ready for some of my uh, BLAC colleagues who will be addressing that with you. Looking, looking forward to talking to them. I'm assuming just so for my context that we're talking about the relocations of people from the congregate shelters into hotels. And the issue is where are those hotels located? Uh, Absolutely. I, I, and I, I will just foreshadow that conversation by saying uh, we have tried to focus on keeping people as close as possible to the shelter they're in for the continuity of their services. I understand why there are challenges here, but we've also been proceeding with the public health imperative. But I look forward to that conversation because every conversation I've had with the uh, Black and Latino and Asian Caucus has been informative and actually has helped us reform policy. So I look forward to that conversation. Thanks, Commissioner. Good to see you. Thank you very much. And apologies. Danny, 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 I'm sorry. I just have, I'm sorry. Just one other, just following up on my last uh, question, Commissioner, there was. Just want to getting back to um, uh, uh, Councilmember Jonai's question. So the Post uh, had had uh, reported that it was a hundred. After a week, it was a hundred um, uh, people had had stayed in shelter out of three thousand three hundred thirty-three that were approached on the subway. Is that just? And I just want to get some clarity on that number. They that, got it wrong. They got it wrong. They got it wrong. What the Daily News focused on was unique individuals which is we reported on unique individuals. They, the, the post just added up every encounter. So the number of people that were encountered. There were 800, there are 824 unique individuals who accepted services, uh, 200 uh, plus individuals who actually uh, remained in shelter and 100 individuals who continued to remain in shelter after seven days. And so 100 out of 850. If I could, if I could just finish and 100 people that went to hospitals. So 300 people actually left the platform and went to something that they had agreed to accept. Others did not. And I think the lesson of the-, of the What were they going to the hospital for? They needed medical care. Okay, and they stayed in the hospital or what's the- they, they went to get care at the hospital. If you could have seen some of the individuals that I saw, you would have agreed with me that they needed to go to the hospital. I'm not- disputing whether they needed or didn't need to go to the hospital. I'm wondering what happens when they go to the hospital. Where do they go when they leave the hospital? But How long do they stay in the hospital? Again, individuals who are being taken to the hospital uh, after being evaluated by a nurse that they need to go to a hospital are getting whatever care they need. Perhaps we see them, if I could just finish before you interrupt me, perhaps we see them again on the subways, perhaps not. But the issue that I am focused on, and I believe we all should be focused on, is any night we can get someone out of the subway is a victory for that individual. Okay. After the hospital, we have to track these people. After they go to the hospital, we're referring them to the hospital. DHS outreach staff is referring them to the hospital. Actually, the NYPD is referring them to the hospital. So, but then who's tracking them? Uh, some of these individuals are very difficult to get any information about them. And so therefore they're ending up at the hospital. And once they're in the hospital, who's tracking their whereabouts? Uh, where we'll, we'll keep focusing on those individuals who we're bringing into shelter and we'll work with the NYPD to focus on the individuals that are being brought to the hospitals. Where are they going after they leave the hospital? Council member. I'm not trying to avoid your question. I'm describing to you the facts as I know them, which is on a subway platform, a hundred people in the first five days needed to be taken to a hospital and they went to the hospital and got whatever care they needed. And if we saw them again, we would place them in shelter if they wanted to accept shelter. You're talking about a five, day, five days of data in a program yeah. that was stood up literally overnight when the subways were shut down. We're gonna keep evaluating the data week by week, but 
our priority is getting people inside every night. And any night we can get someone inside is a victory for that person. Okay, and from a programmatic perspective, or is budget hearing, programmatic perspective, somebody's got to show you somebody's tracking what happens to people when they go to the hospital and then they leave the hospital either 12 hours later or 72 hours later or 96 hours or whatever, somebody should be tracking then their whereabouts. And if it's not DSS, it's not going to be NYPD and it's probably not going to be health and hospital. So, so somebody's got to do that. And I'm just asking whose job it is to do that. And what I'm answering you is all the agencies that are trying to help the individuals here are looking at how best to do it. But nobody's doing that. Nobody's just, let, nobody's doing it. Nobody's, nobody's tracking them after they leave the hospital. But let, let's, let's try to- say use, it. We could say it. Let's nobody's just, tracking them. I'll let, say it. Nobody's tracking them. Nobody's tracking them. But let's just try to use the process to understand what I'm saying, which is you have multiple agencies that have stood up a process in five days that never had existed before. At the end of the day, all of the relevant agencies are going to work together to make sure that we're getting the best outcome for people. And referring people to health and hospitals from the subway platform is not a new thing. That's been people. That's that's been that's I, been in place for since uh, you know for for a long time, and right. at least since we've been taught, we've been having these discussions about I, I beg about to, uh, police on the subways. I, I beg to differ, though. We've never seen these kinds of numbers of people leaving the system and going either to shelter or the hospital. On any that's just a matter of numbers. It's not a matter of process and a matter of process. I just, so I'll leave it there. Okay. Sorry. Go on, Danny. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, obviously we were joined by council member Cornegie, uh, and we were joined, we are joined by council member Torres. Council Member Reynoso and Council Member Lansman. So let's go to our next Council Member for questions. We will now hear from Council Member Gibson followed by Council Member Traeger. Council Member, your you. time will start now. Okay, thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Banks. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Levin and to all my colleagues uh, who have joined. Uh, Commissioner Banks, we have a long history during my tenure in the council. And certainly when it comes to citing new shelters, looking at commercial hotels and trying to get out of them for the purpose of housing. Homeless individuals, I tried my best to work with you and your team. Um, I think I come from a community in the Bronx that has done much more than its fair share. I've taken on my homeless residents and families as well as others. Um, and so when we talk about fairness and equity, I know you appreciate that members speak up when we feel like inequity has been happening. Um, and so during this COVID, I know that there are lots of conversations about addressing street homeless, those on the subway, those that are in congregate setting. And so I really appreciate and urge you and your team to, to continue to work with members of the BLAC, the Women's Caucus, particularly since many of the clients that we're talking about come from our communities or, and are in communities of color and immigrant communities. So I appreciate your partnership and everything you've done, certainly working with the Bronx delegation. So I have a couple of questions. I wanted to ask for an update on the cluster phasing out because a number of cluster housing remains in the Bronx and Brooklyn. And last year in the budget, we uh, purchased a number of buildings over 17 different locations at $173 million. And OMB talked about a potential opportunity for a phase two. So I wanted to get an update on that. Number two, I wanted to find out since we are dealing with a high number of clients that are applying for uh, whether it's a one shot food stamp, SNAP benefits, public assistance, do we see a need and are we having conversations on raising the threshold and the eligibility for one shots? You said the average payout is about 4,300, uh, but we know obviously that may grow with the demand. Um, I, I'm glad you raised the uh, right to counsel because it's gonna be more important now than ever when the moratorium is lifted. Many families that have not been able to pay rent because of loss of income, we are going to see more evictions. So I wanna be very mindful of that. Um, I also wanted to understand the client service centers. As you know, in the Bronx, I'm right next to the one on Jerome Avenue. Uh, and I talk to the staff a lot. So I wanted to know what guidelines we are looking at as we reopen and still practice social distancing um, to make sure that everyone is safe as we continue to serve. And then finally, uh, domestic violence shelters, someone asked about it, but some of the providers have been seeing, of course, an increase of cases as they're serving residents virtually. 
Uh, are we able to help build more capacity for these providers? Because I think we all understand during this COVID, residents and New Yorkers are traumatized. So when you talk about access to um, holistic and just wraparound services, trauma-informed care, uh, therapeutic services, that's going to be very, very important. So I wanted to understand, are we going to help providers that are asking for more resources? And sorry, I do have one more question on the cluster housing. Uh, last year, we talked a little bit about some of the providers getting light touch social services. So I wanted to understand, are we still doing that? Is it still light touch? Or have we put more into that because of COVID, because we know that the need is greater? Thank you, Commissioner. I hope you got all of that. <laughs> That's a, as, as always, that was a great use of five minutes. I'm going to have to sort <laughs> them out and make sure I answer all, all the questions. But just, again, a shout out on Right to Council. Like a lot of things I talked about in my testimony, there are so many things that we did together with the council, and this is a great example with you and council member Levine. There's so many things we did in the count with the council that set, that set us in good stead for dealing with something that none of us could have predicted. And that right to council initiative is clearly one of them. In terms of one shots, I mean, the average amount that we pay is not set as we can't pay more than that. That just happens to be the average amount that we pay. It's a it's a uh, an entitlement program where there's a city share, a state share, sometimes a federal share. Some of it is all city tax levy, but it is a program that operates as an entitlement program, and we will continue to operate it. With respect to the clusters, so let me give you overall. We, you referenced the first transaction that we did. Uh, mm -hmm. We financed the purchase of 17 buildings. Uh, there were 729 units in those buildings. 468 of them were occupied by homeless families and right. 300 were permanent tenants. Uh, and the, there are contracts with the not-for-profits uh, to provide supportive services in the form of light touch, not like supportive Undefined. housing because it's permanent housing. So therefore it's a lighter right. supportive housing, uh, uh, right. a lighter touch social services, not like supportive housing. We then completed a second transaction, which is in the HPD budget. I don't know, you know, at the HPD budget hearing if that is an issue that's going to come up, but it was in the HPD uh, budget uh, that we financed a second transaction of 14 buildings, 224 units. Those were all homeless families units. There were no permanent tenants in those buildings. Uh, and that, uh, that financing was $74 million for the purchase of those units. Okay. Uh, so overall, this means that there are now fewer than, there are actually exactly 1,175 uh, cluster units left. This is from a high point of 3,600. So we have 1,175 to go, and we're continuing to look at how best to uh, reclaim those units as, as permanent housing. You asked me about DV, uh, and I wanna just reiterate again that we have a number of DV units coming online, uh, another 300 or so units, just shy of 300 by the end of the year. Uh, and that will, I think, help any need that might occur when the pause uh, uh, ends. And then as I had said to Council Member Rosen, uh, Council Member, uh, uh, I can't remember who asked me this question, I apologize. Uh, that in the meantime, we have, uh, uh, Council Member Adams asked me this. In the meantime, we have, uh, uh, some uh, DV space coming online, we hope, in a commercial hotel. But just to go back to your point about siting that I think is important. <clears throat> so we made a commitment to get out of clusters and we've reduced that from 3,600 down now to 1,175. We're gonna keep driving it down. We also made a commitment to get out of commercial hotels. At the high point, we were in 92 commercial hotels. And pre-COVID, we had driven that down to 76 non-COVID uh, hotels, but I'm going to just be transparent. We've added 30 more hotels, more than 30 hotels, in order to address the move outs of people from congregate shelters and to address the isolation space. So whereas we were making the progress that I promised we would make in getting out of commercial hotel locations, we've now returned to them. I understand that's a conversation that we will have about the impact of now returning to greater hotel use as a way of dealing with this, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We'll talk more offline. Thank you so much, Chairs. Okay, thank you, thank, you. thank you very much. And let's go to our next council member. We now hear from Council Member Traeger followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Council Member, your time will start now. Thank you, 
be unmuted. Oh, can folks? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Hopewell as well. Hopewell as well with you too. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, uh, there was recently a photograph in the news media, and I got reports in my district of a number of homeless families, uh, folks that were uh, removed from the subway, ending up on a bus in Coney Island at the Surf Avenue, Stillo Avenue train station. Uh, the governor and some other folks uh, want to describe these uh, conditions as making safe connections, as taking them off the trains. Um, would you consider uh, homeless individuals uh, getting onto an MTA bus, sleeping on the bus overnight as a safe connection? The individuals involved are human beings. Our program is to take people from uh, the subway and get them into our shelter system. I'm not sure I'm just gonna describe the same thing that you're describing, but I do know on one of the very cold nights, that unusual weekend, that the MTA made available some buses to be used for warming. Our program is to make sure that people get out of the subways and into our shelters. Uh, we're not looking to have people move just to uh, another MTA vehicle. I appreciate that the MTA did make a vehicle available as a as an opportunity to give people a warm, uh, uh, you know, setting. But if what you're getting at is the aim of bringing people out of the subways to have them end up on buses, the answer is no. It's not the governor's aim, and it's not our aim. We yeah, want commissioner to the state to not have that be the result. Commissioner, uh, no one can convince me putting human beings, as you correctly stated. Uh, onto a bus on top of each other is a safe connection. Uh, we are better than that, Commissioner. I, I, I agree with you. And that's why, as I say, we're focused on getting people out of the subways and into our shelters. I will say we've had some challenges too with that. And there was another photograph of challenges that we had with, with, with making that work. And I found that unacceptable. And that was on our watch. So I agree with you that there have been problems. Uh, all around here and we can do better than that doesn't represent what our workers intended to be and what we want to do for human beings and i appreciate that you are raising this issue in this public forum because i think it's a real issue and and we need to make sure that it doesn't happen thank you for acknowledging that commissioner i i want to also speak about an often forgotten uh, population as well <laughs> uh, the folks that don't follow twitter the folks that don't follow websites uh, the folks that uh, do not speak English as a primary language, uh, people who are elderly, people from our immigrant communities, who my office and many of my colleagues' offices have had to step up to provide translation assistance because they had to fill out these multi-page websites and have email accounts to get food assistance. What is the plan to engage effectively with multi-ethnic media and to multi-ethnic communities to reach all corners of our city that were forgotten during Superstorm Sandy and are being forgotten again because not everyone has Facebook, not everyone has Twitter, and not everyone follows a website. What is the plan to engage all corners of the city? So th thank you for that question. Uh, one of the reasons why we asked for a waiver of the federal signature requirement on an application is we believe that there are people, and you're describing some of them, that have challenges in using uh, our Access HRA system. Our Access HRA system is translated, but that doesn't mean that there are people that can easily, uh, that there aren't people that might have challenges easily nego negotiating a online application as you so aptly described, I think some challenges that perhaps some of your constituents might be having. So we asked for a federal waiver uh, and a state waiver of the application signature requirement so that we could have a worker take the application over the telephone and the worker fill it out without having the client do it. We just got that waiver and we're gonna be rolling out information about how you and your clients or constituents can take advantage of a new avenue that we've just opened up to try to address, I think what you're really describing as the gap between those that are using all this new technology and those that are not. And we will ask for help to make that information available so that no, no one is left to fall between the cracks. I think that the waivers we originally had really made a big difference for a lot of people. We knew that there would be some people like the ones you described that would not 
be covered by the waivers, and that's why we pushed hard to get a waiver so we could do it by phone. Not but, Commissioner, before I go, a last question. Fine. Is there a budget for multi-ethnic media to reach all corners of our city? And that's the final question I have. Uh, last week, I did a multi-ethnic media event on burial allowance. What you're telling me, I, and I think this is the right thing for you to tell me, is I should do one on actually this topic on multi-ethnic media. And I will talk to uh, Commissioner Mustafi who organizes these along with Commissioner Carrion, Marco Carrion, to say I got a great suggestion from a terrific council member who always points out gaps in services and we better listen to you because you're usually right. So I will uh, commit to you to, I will do a, a multi-ethnic media session on just this topic that you described. Thank you. Let's go to our next council member, please. We will now hear from council member Rosenthal. Council member, your time will start now. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you chairs for holding this hearing. Uh, Commissioner, always great to see you. Thank you for the omens work that you are doing. Um, I wanna start with a concern that I'm hearing from a lot of people that um, the people who are having troubles accessing the online platform that HRA has, um, who have troubles, they then call the helpline and uh, or the info line and um, and they're they're waiting online for hours. Um, so I'm wondering two things. One, is there a way for you to track? Have you tracked? How many people are having challenges um, going through the online system? And secondly, uh, do you need additional staff uh, who, to answer the phones? Uh, th thank you for that question. And it's great to talk to you as always. We seem to talk a lot in this period of time. <clears throat> Look, we have a, a, a service called InfoLine. Yes, uh, and, and that's what people are concerned about. Right, and I and I will certainly acknowledge at the beginning of this, we had challenges that were really related to the fact that we have employees in that area for whom we granted reasonable accommodations. We have a lot of people who are subject to Matilda's law. For example, we granted reasonable accommodations, sent them home, and then we had to build a process for them to be able to, a technology platform and a process for them to be able to provide services at home, take the calls at home, be able to uh, connect to our computer systems at home. We created a, a, a laptop Commissioner, factory. I'm gonna cut you off in about you know, 15 seconds. So okay. where I'm, are we today? I'm gonna end it by saying, we've now rolled out the technology to that group and they're able to be much more responsive than they were at the beginning of this uh, by addressing exactly the problem you're describing. So, and the problems that I'm hearing about are recently. Okay, we will follow up with you and see if we can figure out what day it was. Did we screw up someday? Can we do things better? Can you know what your average wait time is on the info line? Uh, I don't, I will, I will get back to you on that. Is that something that is regularly tracked? It, it is something that is regularly tracked. Okay, so if you could sort of give me the information by sure. day, however it is you collect it. I'm happy to do that. Great, for the whole committee. Thanks, I appreciate that. And then I wanna to move to the DV shelters. Um, two questions. One is a follow-up to council member Traeger's question. Would you consider doing a multi-ethnic editorial conversation perhaps with commissioner Noel regarding uh, domestic violence and all the services that are available to people now to make sure that we get that word out? Yes. Thank you. Secondly, I'm wondering about the vacancy rate at the DV shelters today. And I appreciate that you're planning for the future, but let's set that question aside for just one second. Given that the um, governor signed an executive order saying that people could stay at their um, shelters longer than six months, and given that you usually have a 90% um, vacancy rate in order, a uh, 10% vacancy rate in order to have plenty of room for other people who uh, need to come in. What are you seeing now in terms of vacancy rates? Is there a demand now or 
are people staying longer, able to stay longer because in fact, the demand isn't really there. Right. I, I think what we had seen uh, when we looked at this last time was essentially the same vacancy rate. Yeah. That Mark was about a month in. Yeah, and, we, and we, we need a little bit more time to see if, if the next month looks the same. Anecdotally, it does, but I would rather see the data than rely upon anecdote, and I'll share that with you. Okay, and do you, you know what I'm getting at I here? Do. I do. That fewer people are calling to get in, and the only reason we're at a 10% vacancy rate is because people are, are taking advantage of staying longer. Right. I, and that's what I'm trying to tease out, again, getting back to the uh, very uh, important messaging point. Uh, no, understood. And just to maybe to sum this up, we, we, we will do the same analysis we did from for, uh, for the beginning period, apples to apples, but we're not waiting for the outcome of that. That's why we, we requested the waiver to stand up a DV, a shelter in a hotel, because I agree with you. I'd rather be Time's ready than uh, be, be, have the data show a problem and then have to scramble to do something else. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll go to our next council member. Chair, no other council members have raised their hands to ask questions. Okay, so let me go to my little second round here, and then I think council member Levin has one as well. So um, uh, in terms of the pandemic EBT, New York State's pandemic EBT program was authorized by the federal government on May 8th and benefits will be dis uh, dispersed to all DOE students by the state. And I see that Erin Drinkwater um, released a statement this morning, but I didn't get to read it yet. So um, what role would the city and the HRA have, if any, in the distribution of the benefits? And will families receive, when will families receive their benefits, Commissioner? Uh HRA actually has no role in the distribution of the benefits, but I do take our role seriously in providing information about a program, even if we don't run it. Uh, may I take a moment to explain the program? Or yes, absolutely. Okay. So uh, the program uh, is a, a the state a, a state like New York State can make a request to the federal government to provide what's called pandemic EBT. This is a benefit that is provided in the amount of $420 for each eligible child uh, ages five to 18 who is enrolled in school or participating, enrolled in public school or participating in private school. Uh, this represents the value of school meals from the time period when there was the shutdown in March uh, until the end of the school year in January. Uh, the payments are uh, going to be issued directly on uh, the family's electronic benefit transfer uh, card. Uh, $193 will be issued on May 19th. $227 will be issued on June 16th. Uh, and then for families that don't have EBT cards, uh, uh, the, the, these funds will be issued irrespective of immigration status based upon information about children in school that the local Department of Education provides to the state. The state has committed to us that they will provide a, a website and a telephone number for information. And as soon as we get that, we will push it out in the communication that Aaron Drinkwater and I send out every week after our weekly call and taking a page from Council Member Traeger and Council Member Rosenthal, we will get it out to the ethnic media, uh, and multi-ethnic media as well. Okay, thank you. And let's go to uh, my uh, co-chair, uh, Steve Levin. Thank you. Sorry. Hold on one second. Um, so, uh, thanks, Commissioner. I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, uh, touch on a number of different subjects. So, okay. you know, if I bounce around, uh, please bear with me. Or, uh, it's a lightning round. Yeah, well, long the chain of lightning, you know, it's, it'll be a while. Um, I know we got to be out of here by one, so I got 20, 24 minutes here. Um, uh, so first off, just want to get some of these questions around um, congregate shelters and hotels uh, out of the way here. Um, so uh, how many, how many, um, DHS clients have tested positive for COVID at this point? 
we're tracking 961 cases. That includes, however, uh, a number of cases that have been referred to us by others. That would mean uh, referred because they were in health and hospital settings because they were uh, on the street? No, they're just other, other programs. The client might have been known by DHS, but they weren't in one of our shelters. And then when they went where to, were they uh they were doubled up somewhere uh but they are known to us they can't reach it's sort of the example that council member drum gave uh, at the beginning uh there are 108 of those 961 cases are people who were referred to us uh by okay. other agencies that weren't in our system when they tested positive right, right. okay but, 108 but, out of 961 okay just for the sake of the record though i just want to make it clear that our isolation sites are not simply for people that test positive, they're also for yeah. people that have the symptoms. Okay. Uh, how many uh, How many of those 981? 61. 961 um, were, in, were in congregate shelter? Six hundred and fifty-eight of those individuals were living in our single adult shelter system. Okay, ha and you don't have that broken down between whether they were in the hotel rooms or whether they were in a congregate setting prior to COVID? Not at this 17, point. 17,000 is the system, 3,500 were already in hotel rooms. 13,500 13, were in congregate. You don't have that broken down any further? I do not. Okay. Um, of the fatalities that have people that have died, um, 76 DHS clients have died from COVID. Um, how many were in the single adult system? Uh, why don't I break down the whole 76 so the record is clear? Great. So 52 in the single adult system, 10 in the adult family system, eight in the families with children system, six in various of our street programs. I'm sorry, uh, six of various what? Various of our street solution programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that adds up to uh, 76 uh, uh, people whose lives were lost and it's just, mm -hmm. just a tragedy. Okay, so 52 in single adult, is that right? 52 in single adults. I don't, um, want, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we've lost staff as well in the midst of all this horrible, horrible right. thing. Um, some of whom I know are listening, some of whom families I know are listening to this. And my heart goes out to them as well. Um, do we have a list then of the hotels right now um, <laughs> that have been um, used so far uh, in de-densification efforts? And, yeah, and, and, the, um, and the isolation hotels? Yeah. There are 31 hotels that have been involved in the de densification effort, and mm -hmm. uh, then there are five hotels that have been used in isolation. Actually, I think I'm conflating the numbers. A total of 31 hotels mm -hmm. have been used uh, in, in this effort. Okay. Do you have a list of them? Yes, I can provide them to you. Okay. Do you have a, do you have a breakdown by borough right now? If I, if I could finish. I know yep. we provided to the council the locations of the isolation uh, mm -hmm. sites. Uh, but uh, I don't have a breakdown by borough by now, but we can provide it to the committee. I believe in rough terms, half mm -hmm. of them are in Manhattan and mm -hmm. the other half are in uh, uh, other boroughs. And by half, I think it's about 16 are in Manhattan, 15, 16, I believe it's 16 are in Manhattan and the rest are in, uh, are in other boroughs. Our goal, uh, our goal uh, is- uh, uh, Distributed equally among the other boroughs or- um uh, equally, I or think most, just, they're mostly in uh, Queens and Brooklyn at this okay. this point. I mean, we can get you exact information, but again, top can you get five, that to us. Can you get that to us uh, quickly? I, I can, but I, I want to just also level set. We're trying to move people when we can near to where they've been. Right. So yeah. the fact that at this moment in time, that's what the breakdown is. Because because you're you're asking providers to find the hotels. No, we're not asking providers to find the hotels. 
OEM is providing the hotels to us. And then we are trying to match providers to hotels that we have. We have a contract based on based on the proximity. Proximity is the highest is the the hotels have already been in, in contacted by OEM. So in the universe of, of OEM contacted hotels, which we've been doing since since March, if this I, is our kind of stock of hotels that we have set aside for COVID response. And then um, and then DHS is saying we need some of those. We're going to find one that's closest to the 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 shelter that we're de-densifying. Is that right? I'm I'm only looking to the side because I'm looking for a piece of information that's over there. So don't think I'm I'm not listening. Yeah. It doesn't quite work that way. So if, if I may just explain how it works. So mm -hmm. you know, OEM is the overall city um, for getting a, a contact for hotels. But in mm -hmm. order to make this process move forward, we entered into a contract with the Ho Hotel Association of New York City. Okay. And then that Who did? OEM or DHS? Or DSF? Our agency. DSF. Our agency okay. And that is the vehicle through which we get uh, hotels. We then uh, try to match the hotel to the provider based upon proximity and size of the hotel. So for example, mm -hmm. if the size of the hotel is a is, uh, hundred rooms, I'm just using rough numbers. If the size yeah. is hundred rooms, we could move 200 people into that hotel. Mm -hmm. if the size of the hotel is hundred rooms and we were giving everybody an individual room, we would need two hotels or find a hotel of 200 beds. So mm -hmm. size of shelter, size of hotel, proximity are all the, the sort of key variables that we're working on here. Okay, and these hotels are contracted for like the entire hotel on a, you know, the, the, we're paying a lump sum for like a week or a month, we're paying by night, we're paying by room by night. How are the, we doing that? The average amount we're paying uh, is $129 per night. That contrasts with $174, which was the average we were paying through our pre-COVID hotel program. Does uh, that include what? Because I know that. Um, does that include then um, uh, the security and cleaning? Uh, security is a separate expense. It includes retrofitting the rooms, uh, removing mm -hmm. the latches rear, uh, on the doors so they can't be locked uh, from the inside. It mm -hmm. involves furniture rearranging, it involves laundry services, it involves- Laundry services. Yeah, it involves increased housekeeping. Uh, by way of reference, we thought given the fact that there are all these empty Y beds that we would simply uh, contract with the Y. Yeah. This, it turns out to be, to be less money per night than if we had rented all the empty Y beds. So okay. we, we, we tried so to- So 100, 129 a night. Correct. Okay. So I'm gonna to get to the, the FEMA question now, just because I, 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 so um, <clears throat> um, we just wanna be clear here. We, we know, and it is clear that, uh, that FEMA reimburses 75% of the cost of a hotel room uh, security services, food, transportation, and cleaning services. 75% um, of that cost for everybody who is either COVID positive or has been exposed to COVID and is either symptomatic or asymptomatic. Is that correct? I'm only trying to parse out each element of that sentence. I believe the answer is correct, but um, there are a lot of moving parts in it. So let's sort of break it out. Rent, security. I'm just looking at the April 3rd letter on my phone. The April 3rd letter from FEMA to Commissioner Criswell um, identifying what is covered? Yeah, I, I'm, and this I'm, was the and this I'm was not, basically the final word on the conversation. I'm not until, disagreeing with you. I'm not until, disagreeing until with you. OMB decided to ask on Friday a clarifying question. But for the for the intervening six weeks, OMB did not see it fit to ask a clarifying question. So I'm assuming that this was enough information for them to act in the intervening six weeks. If I could answer your question, yeah, okay. The reason why I hesitated to answer your question is it had a lot of compound pieces into it. So in my mind, I was going through each element of your question 
to sure. see if I could answer yes. I got to yes as you were going for your uh, your electronic okay. device. So I'm not trying to give you a hard time. It's just I'm under oath. I want to make sure I'm answering carefully. Yep. I'll tell you why uh, OMB asked the question on Friday about services. Mm -hmm. Because I've testified for this committee. This is now my seventh budget. Mm -hmm. Most years, and actually this year I was asked a similar question. Most years I'm asked a question about, do you have enough to provide the level of services that you think you need to provide? Usually I'm asked that question every year. Are you asking for money, more money? Do you get enough money in your budget? I was mm -hmm. asked. I was this asked, is not a normal year, but okay. But I was asked that question. So when I was asked, if you were to change your model of providing services from a harm reduction model and with two people per room with exceptions for one, depending on circumstances, mm -hmm. if you were to change your model have everybody in one room, irrespective mm -hmm. of what their needs were, how much would you need to provide services? So yep. that's why OMB asked FEMA yeah. whether or not certain services would be provided. And so FEMA essentially said, and you're right, what is in that April 3rd letter, that substantial medical care, social and behavioral health services are not eligible for reimbursement. Right. So, I will say this, Commissioner, that everyone knew that already. Everybody knew that. That was not in question. Nobody had ever asserted that those costs were covered. I'm, I'm just going to. Nobody, nobody in the world had asserted because, and in, in fact, we have a FEMA model that's being implemented in other states right. that there's actually a, I, there's, have you seen, there's the national, the national um, uh, uh, housing. Would you like, um, would you like me to explain why, why? Sure there was a difference here because when we were providing services in uh, a model of the presumption was a double occupancy, the same as we've been doing since 2015 mm -hmm. or started a hotel program to bring people out of three quarters houses from a harm reduction approach. As soon as, mm -hmm. we, so now if we were going to change the model, I was asked, what would it take to provide services there? And so the question was, will that be reimbursable? And then there was a second question that was important to know whether or not it would be reimbursable to take people out of single room occupancy yeah. uh, housing operated by HRA for both HASA clients and DV clients. Yep. And so that question was asked and the answer from FEMA was that is not covered. Right, so okay, therefore, because, because, they weren't, because they weren't exposed. Right, but the reason why which is also in that i'm but, just saying because i don't want to get into a rabbit hole about this so let's just well, but, I, I get I, but i just like the record to be clear the implication of your question is that OMB. just let me finish you're ready to yeah. come the implication was that omb did something nefarious the reason no. why omb made this request is because they had my request for what it would cost to provide services to people in single rooms and let me finish before you cut me off and what it would cost to provide services to people who were in HASA SRO units or DV units. And so therefore there was a desire on the part of the city to know would the expenses that I'm saying I need to appropriately serve these clients be covered? You're right that one part of the question was seemingly answered in the April 3rd letter, but it was worth another try to see if maybe we would get a different answer, don't you think? No, the April 3rd letter was very clear, the definition of asymptomatic and who'd be covered. It was people that are asymptomatic who have been exposed. No, it's, been exp about, it's about the kind of services that I was asking, will I be able to provide them with FEMA reimbursement? And we thought we would engage in advocacy to try to convince them to give us more reimbursement. Is that what it was? Was that an advocacy letter to ask for, for more reimbursement? Is that what it was? I wanted to know whether or not FEMA was going to cover the level of services that Even I needed. Every, every, okay. I just leave it at that. Have, are you, okay. Um, are you familiar with, there's a document that was put out on, on May 6th by the National Low Income Housing Coalition called Getting to Yes, Working with FEMA to Fund Non-Congregate Shelter During COVID-19? I am not familiar with that document. I'd be happy to look at it. Talks about other cities, states, jurisdictions. I mean, have has DSS talked directly with FEMA? The city speaks with one voice to FEMA. 
There okay. are multiple, please let me finish. There mm -hmm. are multiple agencies that are interacting, uh, that are using FEMA dollars. OEM is a primary one. There are other agencies. Mm -hmm. It's therefore important to have one agency, OMB, be the primary discusser, interfacer, liaison with FEMA. And that's the way. So the, I when FEMA was clear, were, and then FEMA made say, clear in an April 3rd letter identifying who was, who was covered, they were asymptomatic people that were exposed, and OMB got that letter because it was in response to an OMB email. Did OMB share that information with DSS at, in a timely fashion? Because we had a hearing on a bill on April 23rd, and we were being and we were told that it was that OMB was still working it out with FEMA, and that implied a certain level of ongoing communication between FEMA and OMB. And as far as we can tell by the documentation that we got from FEMA, there was no communication between OMB or any city agency and FEMA after that April 3rd letter, because that April 3rd letter was in fact the final word. It needed no clarification. I, I can't speak to any of the things you're asking me about, but I can give you an overall response. And I'd like to be like to give an overall response. Okay, I just would, yeah, I, I get now, it. OMB is the lead agency. I'm in constant communications with OMB, trying to get the help that we need to, to adjust to changes that we're seeing. Uh, I will say that other states are different. In California, they have 100,000 homeless people and they're allocating 15,000 hotel rooms to do 18,000. 18,000, 15,000 for 100,000 homeless people. I think what we're doing in New York City is on a different level if you look at what they do and what we do. Percentage so, wise, perhaps, I mean- If I could, council members- it's, But it's, but it's, it's why, I, 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 I know- Why, we, why we, not we give me an opportunity to finish my testimony? Is there something I'm gonna say you don't want me to say? No, I'm saying that the, we, I've, I've heard this and it's not answering the question, but let's, so I just want, I have other questions that I wanna ask. Okay. And I know that we're- uh, If I could finish, FEMA reimbursement, the reason why OMB manages it instead of me is that the process of FEMA reimbursement requires OMB to submit information to the state, and then the state submits it to OMB. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. state submits to FEMA. And then ultimately, at the end of all that, it comes back to us. So OMB is intimately involved with this because it affects our cash flow. And okay. how long it takes to get all those things approved through that chain up and that chain back down. And so that's the reason why individual agencies don't handle these communications. Now, FEMA's re FEMA, I spoke to FEMA. FEMA told me in a phone call that, um, that they require um, an individual um, certification for each, you know, some at attestation of that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that each client that's placed in a hotel meets the criteria laid out in that April 3rd letter of being asymptomatic and exposed because OMB never shared that letter with DSS and therefore not with the providers who are tasked with moving people out is as is anyone collecting the information that FEMA needs to be able to certify that the person is in fact qualifying for reimbursement and if so, how did OMB communicate that then with DSS? So with respect, and we know each other a long time, I think you're actually asking me the wrong question. So let me try to answer the right question here. If we had waited for that April 3rd letter, we would not have stood up an isolation site on March 13th and March 14th. Our agency moved to stand up these beds before the April 3rd letter because we knew it was in our client's interest. We also are an agency that does billions of dollars of claiming with the federal government. I think one thing we know how to do effectively is once rules are laid out, we know how to make claims, even if they're retroactive claims. I have a whole, we have a whole team here under a very experienced leadership that claims for federal reimbursement all the time. And they do that based upon rules that are provided to us by OMB and we are very successful. If you look at our budget, there's a- I'm not faulting you, Commissioner. I'm faulting OMB for not sharing vital information with you. I think- I, I do have to move on. I just have to move on here. I, no, I can't let the record be like that. You're unfairly attacking OMB. I don't think that's right. <laughs> I don't think it's unfair, but okay. I just, I do have to ask, and that's, okay, that's on the record. Um, uh, ESG funds. So 
I've heard repeatedly that uh, that's first stimulus funds in as part of um, uh, this latest round of stimulus in or the first round of stimulus in 2020 in response to, to the uh, to the pandemic. ESG funds can, in fact, be used for those wraparound services that um, that that DSS asked about or OMB asked about in that in that May 15th letter. Um, have are you aware of the ESG funds and have 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 they been identified as a um, as a source to fund those types of services? So this would be the medical, mental health services, um, case management services that might be associated with moving people into into hotel rooms. So, council member, I've been present for this hearing of for almost three hours now, and I heard many I heard many members ask me questions about what is the city planning to do to address the impact for DHS and HRA clients of the pandemic. ESG money can be used for lots of things to address okay. lots of different needs. Yeah. For the city of New York facing these kinds of hard budget times is going to spend the ESG money we got is a much larger conversation than whether it can be used for these services or whether it would be better spent on other services. Many council members have been asking me questions all morning about how best to spend the, spend city dollars or federal dollars. So the determination about how to use ESG money is very much a look that OMB is taking in terms of all the common needs that people ask me about for the last three hours. So who decides? Me, could who decides? They, no, but if you're asking me, could they be used for this? That's actually a very com incomplete question. The question is, given what's happening in the city, how should we best use the limited dollars that we got in ESG for all the needs that have been discussed during this last three hours? Chair Levin and uh, Commissioner Banks, uh, we need to shut this down. I have a hearing at one o'clock, so I need to move on to the next hearing. Uh, Chair Levin, if you want to ask one last question, we have a minute. Okay, Just, I did want to go back to this, the... Um... The immediate needs grants, both for SNAP and for cash assistance, I'm not. It's, I, I understand what you're saying about the long-term needs. I'm actually asking more specifically about those those very immediate needs. When somebody's applying for SNAP or cash assistance, who has been employed for um, years and years and years, lost their job, is now doesn't have savings, is now entirely cash strapped, is trying to put food on the table and needs emergency money and comes to the city for, for uh, 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 assistance, we have the ability to give them as, because we don't, I, we're, it may take 45 days to get, to get their benefits. There's an emergency immediate need grant that can be provided by the city. Are we providing that and to what level? Y yes, as I said, we are providing those grants. My only point is that we would be able to provide a, a broader range of services to people who really need our help if we could do more than providing those grants. But you, your, I, your question- Yeah, no, I know, I get it. We, wanted, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We, there are people that desperately need emergency yeah, money. But I'm telling you, we're giving those grants. I'm okay, how many? The fact that we, are we giving them to everybody? I'll have to get you that information, but we give those grants I out need, before, could I just finish? Yeah, before, I just need to know how many. I'm, what I'm telling you is before the pandemic, we gave those grants out. Since the pandemic, we gave the, we were giving those grants out. We'll get you the information you're asking for. Percentage wise, by uh, VA and by SNAP, I need, we need to know how, what percentage are getting the emer of applications are getting council emergency council immediate member, need grants. Council member, I'm in the middle of a pandemic. I have- all, We all are. Could I just finish? I have okay. hundreds of staff trying to help us deliver the benefits. I'm not sure that I can get you the perfect statistics that I could I if I wasn't in the middle of this. I have. I need, to use, we have I, to be able to. We have to be able to make I, policy based on information that's accurate. Can I just finish? It, it's, I, a, I, it's a fundamental. It's a fundamental function. You're, you're, you're of right. Government. You're right, but you're actually not understanding what we've done. We've taken 1,300 people that used to do other jobs to yeah. help give out these benefits. Some of those people who are doing this are the people who in an instant could have given me the report you're asking me for. I'm only telling you, I'm gonna do the best I can to get it to you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Levin. Uh, we're going to end here and then we will resume in about 10 minutes.
We'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back with OCJ. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir.
Mic test. Coming in five by five. This is Cobra One, Cobra Ten. You hear me? Yep, hear you loud and clear. Thank you, sir. This is Cobra Two, the Cobra One and Ten. How is my audio? You are five by five. Thank you.
Uh, chairs, we are ready to begin when you are. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we are ready to begin. <clears throat> Good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's fourth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2021. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on General Welfare, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Steve Levin, and by the Committee on the Justice System, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Rory Lansman. And we will now hear from the Office of Civil, uh, the Office of Civil Justice. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us. And just let me pull them up. They are Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Cohen, Reynoso, Grudenchik, Ayala, Lewis, Jaeger, Koslowitz, Powers, Jonai, Traeger, Salamanca, Torres, Cornegy, Holden, Mateo, Mario, Gibson, Minchaka, and I think one more. I'm sorry. Uh, yep, I think that's it. Um, okay, good. Um, in the interest of time, Council Member Levin and I will forego opening statements, but I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items before we hear from Council Member Lansman. Committee Council? Uh, yes, Chair. I think we're ready to hear from Chair Lanceman now. Before uh, I have procedural items, no? Uh, no, none at this moment. Okay, thank you very much, Chair Lanceman. Thank you, Danny. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Rory Lanceman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and I am pleased to join the Committees on Finance and General Welfare and my colleagues, Chairs Drom and Levin, to hear from the Office of Civil Justice in relation to the executive budget for the coming fiscal year. We've all seen enough cop shows and episodes of Law and Order to know that if you're arrested and can't afford a lawyer, one will be provided on your behalf free of charge. The consequences of a criminal conviction are that serious. But so too are the consequences of many civil legal proceedings. You can be evicted from your home or lose ownership of your house, be deported to a foreign country, lose custody of your children, be denied government benefits to which you are entitled and need to survive in many, many more circumstances. Yet there is no constitutional right to an attorney in these cases. And middle and low income New Yorkers are left to navigate the legal system on their own. They almost lose, almost always lose trying to do so. In FY 2020, city taxpayers invested over $200 million to provide these New Yorkers with legal representation, particularly in two areas where they are needed the most and where the consequences are greatest, preventing unlawful evictions and preventing unlawful deportation. The success of these initiatives is nothing short of astounding and a stark reminder of the critically important need for legal representation. For example, in FY 2019, 32,000 households facing eviction got free legal representation and 84% of them were able to remain in their homes. The numbers, the percentages of the success from people who try to uh, uh, defend against eviction without legal representation is a fraction of that. And we see the same disparity in outcomes in every area of representation that the city offers. What will be the impact of COVID-19 on the need for legal representation in housing and immigration matters, but also in workplace, healthcare, consumer debt, domestic violence, and other matters critical to the physical and economic security of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers? Does the city have a plan? And does this budget fund that plan? These are some of the questions we need answers to today. And I look forward to the testimony of the Office of Civil Justice uh, to hear those answers. Thank you. Jordan Dressler, Civil Justice Coordinator, and Rosine Ferdinand, HRA's Executive Deputy Commissioner. Will the Committee Council please administer the affirmation? Thank you. I will now administer the affirmation one time, and you will be called on individually to fill firm at the end. 
You affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, Mr. Dressler? Yes, I do. And Ms. Ferdinand? Yes, I do. Thank you. Mr. Dressler, you may proceed when ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Drum, Lansman, and Levin, uh, and thank you very much for the inviting me to appear before your committees today to discuss the work of the Office of Civil Justice, the Human Resources Administration. My name is Jordan Dressler. I'm the Civil Justice Coordinator, and in that capacity, I am proud to oversee the Office of Civil Justice. I'm joined today by DSS Executive Deputy Commissioner Rosing Ferdinand. As you know, OCJ is part of New York City's Human Resources Administration, the nation's largest social services agency, assisting more than 3 million New Yorkers annually through the administration of a range of public assistance programs. With the enactment of Local Law 61 in 2015, OCJ was established as a permanent office tasked with establishing, managing, overseeing, and monitoring the city's civil legal services programs. This year, we are working with over 70 nonprofit legal services organizations and partners across the five boroughs to provide access to legal assistance to thousands of New Yorkers in need, critical services that provide low income and other vulnerable residents, sorry, the ability to access and preserve basic necessities of life, such as stable and affordable housing, legal immigration status, a fair and safe workplace, and access to government benefits. Are, are you still seeing me? Is everything okay? The screen went a little strange on me. Um, no. Are you have? am I having a problem technologically? I can hear you from my side. I don't see you. Listen, Georgia, we can hear you. So why don't you keep going? Okay, I'll just continue then. Thank okay, you. Thank you. We just issued... Pardon me. We just issued our latest annual, oh, now we're back. We just issued our latest annual report in which we described the city's work through OCJ to make legal services more widely accessible for New Yorkers in need. In the report, we detail how a combination of administration and council discretionary funding investments in civil legal services uh, reached $200 million in fiscal year 2020, an historic investment in access to justice for New York City residents that represents exponential increases in both mayoral and council support for civil legal services programs. The report describes the enormous success of our signature universal access legal services program for tenants, implementing the historic tenants right to counsel law passed by the city council and signed into law by Mayor de Blasio in 2017. Specifically, the report includes the latest analysis of the rate of legal representation for tenants in housing court facing eviction. In the first half of fiscal year 2020, 38% of tenants citywide, nearly one in four, were represented by counsel in eviction proceedings in court, up from 32% at the end of fiscal 19 and up exponentially compared to the rate of 1% in 2013. And in the high need neighborhoods targeted through universal access or in court access for all low income tenants to receive access to legal representation, 67% of tenants were represented by counsel in the first half of fiscal 20, up from 62% in the last quarter of 19. These gains in closing the justice gap for tenants have been mirrored in the unprecedented reduction in residential evictions by city marshals since 2013, down over 40% from approximately 29,000 in 2013 to 17,000 in 2019. Our immigration legal services programs provided legal assistance to immigrant and new New Yorkers in approximately 33,000 cases in fiscal 19, reflecting a substantial increase in the breadth and reach of programs. For example, the number of removal cases handled by immigration defense attorneys through the administration's IOI program grew tenfold with the impact of recent investments from 200 in fiscal 17 to over 2,000 in fiscal 19. Part of a landscape of deportation legal defense services that includes the Action NYC Rapid Response Legal Collaborative managed by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and Research Foundation of CUNY and the council funded NIFA and eye care programs that make New York City a leader in the fight against the Trump administration's deportation machine. And in fiscal 19, nearly 2,000 low-wage workers across the city received legal representation and advice through the city's workplace rights legal services programs at OCJ, providing assistance to working New Yorkers facing violations of their rights by employers to fair wages, reasonable hours, and a safe workplace free from discrimination and retaliation. We're very proud of these milestones and achievements from the last year, but we recognize that these are from a different time, a time before COVID-19. All of our clients 
neighbors, and colleagues have been touched in some way by this crisis. And the aftershocks to the justice system will continue to be felt in the weeks and months to come. Today, I'm proud to discuss how OCJ and its legal services provider partners have stepped up and stepped in to address these challenges. Our commitment to leveling the playing field for New Yorkers in the civil justice system, especially now, is demonstrated in our financial investment in these critical services. I'm pleased to report that fiscal year 21 includes the largest annual investment ever by a mayoral administration in civil legal services. OCJ's budget for fiscal 21 includes funding totaling 166.5 million, which breaks down as follows. 135.6 million for legal services programs for tenants, which includes 92.6 million for eviction defense legal services for low-income tenants in housing court and NYCHA administrative proceedings, including further implementation of the city's tenants right to counsel law through the Universal Access Initiative, as well as 42.9 million for legal services to protect tenants in combat harassment. This budget reflects a savings of 8.5 million based on projected overall program underspending in fiscal 21 due to annual lags in the hiring of staff by legal services providers to support program expansion. The program budget in fiscal 21 reflects increases compared to fiscal 20 and previous years. And this increased funding will support anticipated additional implementation of the initiative and growth in the availability of legal services. It also includes 30.9 million for legal assistance programs for immigrant New Yorkers, which includes 20.1 in administration funding for the IOI initiative, and 2.1 million in immigration legal services programs supported by CSBG grants and city tax levy funding, as well as 8.7 million for legal and navigation services and outreach through the Action NYC program operated by Moya in partnership with DSS. In addition, OCJ is working with its provider partners to develop and implement a plan to analyze and address recruitment and retention challenges by legal, based by legal services providers for low-income New Yorkers, and to compare attorney pay at provider organizations to appropriate and comparable positions within the New York City Law Department. The administration is providing initial funding for providers in fiscal 20, and will be working together with legal providers to build a full implementation plan to reach an equitable attorney pay structure that will also take into consideration the changing dynamics as a result of legal reforms and programs and services that seek to increase fairness for low-income New Yorkers. In addition to the administration's commitment to supporting civil legal services, I want to acknowledge the ongoing commitment of the City Council to expanding access to justice by funding legal services. In fiscal 20, HRA is overseeing nearly 35.4 million in contracts for discretionary funding added by the City Council for legal and educational services for low-wage workers, immigration legal defense services for detained individuals, unaccompanied minors, and families with children facing deportation, assistance for survivors of domestic violence and veterans, and general support for civil legal services providers. In response to the COVID-19 emergency, OCJ has been well positioned to help address legal issues immediately faced by New Yorkers in need. Because of our central role in contracting and administration of city-funded civil legal services programs, OCJ has been able to coordinate among and between legal services providers, the courts, <coughs> excuse me, and other city offices efficiently and effectively, ensuring that legal providers and their clients have had access to reliable information about court and agency operations. All of OCJ's legal services programs have been impacted by the COVID-19 emergency due to the changes in the operations of the courts, the pivoting of law office operations to remote and telework approaches to intake and casework consistent with health and safety guidelines to meet the continuing needs of New Yorkers for legal assistance in civil matters. OCJ's providers have successfully pivoted to provide legal intake, advice, research, and advocacy and representation services remotely by phone, video conference, and electronic filing during, during the emergency. To support our providers, their clients, and the community during this time, OCJ has worked with providers to make changes to program scopes of work in the wake of the COVID-19 emergency. These changes have ensured continued representation of existing clients, but have also broadened the kinds of legal services that can be provided to meet emergent needs, as well as the ways that legal services are permitted to be delivered, including by including telephonic consult consultation and advice, as well as remote and virtual court appearances. Our revised scopes of work have simplified data reporting protocols, and have included accommodations for the collection of electronic signatures and other alternative forms of documentation consistent with health and safety requirements during the emergency. And New York City's legal services providers are open for business and available to assist New Yorkers in need. 
through phone hotlines and remote conferencing during the emergency. The City's Action NYC program managed by Moya and CUNY remains open and accessible for New Yorkers to receive free immigration legal screenings and assistance through trusted community partners. And OCJ's legal and CBO partners continue to provide an array of immigration related and employment related legal services through our IOI and CSBG funded programs. Employment legal providers offer assistance for workers facing challenges related to wage theft, leave issues and discrimination in the workplace among others, as well as advice and assistance in cases where unemployment insurance or other employment related benefits are challenged by an employer or denied by labor authorities. And legal organizations across the city continue to offer free legal advice and assistance for homeowners facing foreclosure, seniors, people facing consumer debt challenges, survivors of domestic violence and others. In my testimony today, I also wanna focus on and emphasize how we have adapted our housing legal services for tenants during this emergency. New York City is a national leader in providing access to legal help for tenants. And in the wake of the pandemic, we have worked closely with housing justice system stakeholders to step up and make access to legal services widely, efficiently, and safely available. With the limitation of housing court operations effective in March, to filing of emergency cases like illegal lockouts and emergency cases for repairs, OCJ was able to quickly stand up a case referral protocol with OCA and our providers to connect all tenants who file emergency cases in court with access to free legal representation. And we recently expanded that referral process to include cases in which unrepresented tenants face and respond to new motions in court using the court's new electronic filing protocols. Building off the existing infrastructure of the Universal Access Initiative in court, OCJ has established access to live phone-based legal advice and counsel provided by our tenant legal services partners. Access to these services is currently available via 311 through the city's tenant helpline, operated by the mayor's office to protect tenants and the public engagement unit. And the access is indeed universal. Services are free and confidential, and they are available to all New York City residential renters with housing questions or issues, regardless of income, geography or zip code, or immigration status. OCJ maintains ongoing dialogue with OCA, the legal provider community and other system stakeholders about both the eviction moratorium and changes to court operations. And we are confident that our programs are well resourced to work in partnership with the courts and other system stakeholders to ensure access to legal assistance for tenants now and in the future as the courts begin to reopen. As we move forward, OCJ will continue to monitor and assess the legal needs of tenants in the wake of the COVID-19 emergency and is prepared to make adjustments to the universal access program model and implementation plan as appropriate. As we move forward and face unprecedented and likely unexpected challenges, the Office of Civil Justice stands committed to continuing to work hand in hand with the council and all justice system stakeholders to make civil legal assistance available and effective for clients. Now more than ever, New Yorkers need a justice system that is fair and accessible. And we are grateful to the city council for your support in helping us achieve that goal. Thank you. I hope that all are safe and well, and I would be happy to take your questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about uh, the need for some legal services. As more New Yorkers experience acute economic hardship as a result of COVID-19, OCJ will play an even larger role connecting people with important resources. However, OCJ's fiscal 2021 executive budget of $165 million is 5% lower than its preliminary budget of $170 million and does not include funding for services that will be required as a result of COVID-19. How can OCJ support the city's growing need for services with a budget that has not grown with it? Thank you, Chair, for the question. Uh, the, the budget, sorry, uh, the executive budget uh, reflects uh, a savings that was found in the uh, legal services for tenants programs, universal access. Uh, this is reflective of something we've seen over the last few years, um, which is a traditional lag in the hiring and onboarding of legal staff uh, by legal services providers in the tenant legal services programs. Uh, the funding has been available and yet there's always been uh, this lag. So we have structured our contracts to take into account that lag. That lag is probably exacerbated now, given the uh, delays in the bar exam, given the impacts on the process for hiring and onboarding 
interviewing and training. And so we're confident that the budget as it currently exists is enough to support the services and the expansion of services that are already built into the increasing budgets over the last several years for tenant legal services. And uh, we uh, are, are comfortable with the budget as it is. And uh, let's uh, just talk a little bit about legal services for immigrants and their families. Uh, fiscal 2020 funding for deportation defense programs totaled about $44 million and about 20,000 people were served. As we move into fiscal 21, how will OCJ ensure that providers have the capacity to continue to support these clients while some immigration proceedings are suspended, but yet others are continuing? Can you address that? Uh, sure. I, I think it's important to recognize that between uh, the administration's funding and the council's funding, uh, New York City has truly become a national leader, if not the national leader, in providing support for uh, immigrant residents uh, facing legal issues. Uh, we provide a range of legal services, everything from legal advice and screening through uh, the city's uh, really landmark Action NYC program, all the way to formal legal representation for uh, non-citizens facing, excuse me, deportation proceedings, uh, whether it's detained individuals through the NIFA program, uh, unaccompanied minors and families uh, through eye care, or immigrant adults facing deportation through uh, the administration's IOI program, where we saw an investment of $16.4 million back in fiscal 18 that continues to be implemented today and remains part of the baseline budget. Uh, with the challenges faced by legal providers now, with the closure of courts for non-detained cases in terms of deportation proceedings, uh, the halting of those proceedings for now, uh, the continuation of cases on deportation proceedings and all the challenges that go along with facing those cases, uh, the uh, ongoing uh, requirement of, de of, guide of deadlines for filings, uh, the first job for us is to stay in close touch with our providers to understand what those issues are, how it's changing those practices, uh, not to mention other dynamics that uh, happen to coincide. And I'm speaking about public charge, first and foremost. With the changes to the public charge rules, legal advice changes, the approach to legal representation and assistance changes, and I can give you one example that I think uh, is an emblem of, of how we have been able to remain flexible with flexible and nimble IOI contracts and ongoing dialogue with our, with our providers. Uh, the, with the introduction of the public charge rule in February, uh, family-based petitions uh, for uh, lawful permanent status became much more challenging for legal providers to prepare. And those are matters that we traditionally had considered straightforward cases within our contracts uh, in terms of caseload targets and the like. Uh, providers came to us and said, these are no longer straightforward. Each and every one of these contains legal challenges and requires a tremendous amount of upfront work to overcome this presumption that someone is going to be public charged to make sure that the government has the right uh, facts uh, in order to grant the applications. Uh, we have a contract that allows for that kind of flexibility we work with providers and issued a memorandum saying these are going to be considered complex legal matters under our uh, contracts. This is one example of the way that we can remain flexible and, and in dialogue with our providers. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask counsel to call for other questions. And if there's anything else, I'll, I'll come back at the end. Thank you. Um, I believe Chair Lanceman has questions, Chair Drum? Yes, I, I was asking that. I just didn't get an answer in time. Chair Lanceman, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so my understanding is the total budget for all of the legal services contracts that OCJ administers is about $166 million. Is that, is that right? Yeah, right. So how many actual legal services contracts does OCJ administer with that $166 million. That's, well, that's inclusive of Action NYC. Uh, Action NYC uh, is in the process of an RFP, so can't speak to how many contracts will result there. I can speak to the fact that we have 45 baseline contracts uh, with a variety of providers covering immigration legal services and tenant legal services. So it's about 45 contracts plus whatever number of contracts come from the Action NYC RFP? 
I believe that's right. We'll get that. I'll, I'll have to confirm that number, but that's, I think, a good working estimate. Okay, so we need a list of those contracts. We need a list of those contracts, the, the program that the RFP was administered uh, under. We've, we've, we've been in touch with council staff. I believe we provided all of that. You, you, you haven't, and I don't, I don't mean we, to like go back and forth with you on, on this. My understanding is, is that you have not, if you have, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to be corrected, but I need a commitment from you that if you haven't provided it, that you will provide it to us, a list of all of the contracts that OCJ administers, the amount and a description of the services that are provided. So if we don't have it, will you get that to us? If you don't have it, I'm happy to make that commitment, sure. And, and I wanna say that we have. We have provided it and then we will provide it once more. Okay, that's not my understanding, but it wouldn't be the first time that I was mistaken. The important thing and is that we, we, get, might be we, we get the we'll, information. We'll double check, we'll make sure that the council has what it needs. Good, so now let me ask you about the legal services that New Yorkers need other than the two main ones, which both the council and the administration have in my view, appropriately and correctly prioritized, which is um, eviction defense, uh, housing matters broadly, and immigration matters broadly. The, the charter that established the, um, OCJ required OCJ to do an annual report assessing the legal services needs of low-income New Yorkers and the availability of legal services in a range of matters, including health insurance, medical expenses, and debts relating thereto, personal finances, employment, public benefits, and domestic and family matters. Now, I don't see any such analysis in the uh, 2019 report, which was just released in the last few days. So can you tell me, has OCJ conducted an assessment of the legal services needs of low-income New Yorkers as it relates to those different kinds of matters, health insurance, medical expenses, debts, personal finances, public benefits, and domestic and family matters? Uh, we are in the process of uh, speaking with all of our providers about what the provision of civil legal services looks like today and what they anticipate in the future. We have surveyed all of our providers. And when I say our 70 plus providers, this really runs the gamut for the legal services community here in New York City, which I believe is the strongest legal services community in the country. It's well, the reason- I agree, I agree with you and I'm, and I'm grateful for our partnership with the mayor in, in making that, that happen. When will you have completed the charter mandated analysis of the legal services needs of New Yorkers in those areas, just those areas, that are particularly um, itemized in, in the charter? Uh, Chair, I, I can't give you a deadline now. And the reason why is because we're in the middle of the emergency and I think so much is responsive to what the approach of the court system will be, state and federal. Right now, so many of the needs that you're describing, it's not even clear what the remedy would be for, for a, uh, a New Yorker facing one of those issues. Even something as simple as a loss, a small claims loss. Small claims court is closed right now. Now we are on the precipice of a massive reopening, an incremental, but a massive reopening of one of the most complex court systems in the country. And I think our responsibility is to stay in close touch with our partners at the courts, to stay in close touch with our partners among the providers to understand what is going on and what will be going on and what should be going on. And is that- I agree, with, I, I agree with you in all of that. And, and right. all of that should be incorporated into the analysis that's required by the charter so that the council and the administration can make a judgment in this budget as to how to allocate resources. But so, so Han, I have to press you. Um, when will we get that analysis done to the best of your ability given the fluid and emergency situation that we are, are, are living in right now because because no analysis whatsoever cannot be acceptable. We will uh, be sure to stay in touch with the council on all of these issues as things develop as a part of the budget negotiation process. Well, let me just say clearly if it wasn't clear already, the fact that that wasn't done at all 
and I'm not saying it's inadequate. I'm not saying that I disagree with its conclusions or its methodologies, but that it wasn't done at all in the annual report that was just released, even though it's required under the charter provision that created the OCJ is, is, is just not acceptable. And it really hobbles the council in our ability to make judgments about how to spend resources for legal services. Um, let, me, um, let me go to the, the PEG and, and in particular its impact on something near and dear to all of our hearts, uh, universal access. And, and committee council, please don't be shy about telling me, uh, Mr. Chairman, you're, we need to move on to other people. Um, am I correct that the FY20, FY21, $20 million PREG is coming entirely from the anti-eviction budget, which includes the Homeless Prevention Law Project and universal access to counsel? Yes, yes. So if so, what will the impact be on universal access's planned expansion to meet the statutory mandate to be in effect citywide by FY22? Well, we were well on track. We remain on track uh, for increased implementation and to reach implementation by fiscal year 22. That was before the emergency. That was before the crisis. Right now, as I know you know, the housing court is closed to all but emergency matters. There's an eviction moratorium at the statewide level in effect. There is an administrative order from the chief administrative judge, the office of court administration, in effect barring all new filings, barring uh, the movement of nearly all non-essential cases, which is to say such uh, eviction. Mr. Gessler, we, we, we know these things. These okay. are, you're selling us things that we know, we know them. So my question is what will the impact be um, on the planned rollout of universal access uh, of the, the, the $20 million peg? That's, the, that's what I don't know. Okay, the, the $20 million peg, which was 11.5 uh, uh, and 20 and 8.5 and 21, was reflective of delayed hiring practices by the, uh, by the legal services providers. There's an inability to hire against that funding and take on that funding for uh, contract obligations. So, uh, so, then, so then in terms of the budget, you don't believe that, that, that this peg, this $20 million peg across FY20 and FY21, that is not going to impact the rollout of universal access. Not in those years, no. No, okay. Well, I, hope, I, I, I certainly hope that you're right. Will the, will the PEG affect um, the non-universal access zip code work? Because that's been doing good work, work also. Of course, yes. And in fact, at the beginning of this current fiscal year, uh, we changed our approach for providers to ensure that uh, in addition to uh, meeting obligations with respect to uh, the targeted zip codes in housing court, uh, that uh, there was no ambiguity that cases that they handled in housing court for low-income tenants facing eviction, uh, quote unquote, counted against the contracts. Uh, we were able to sim uh, simplify those contracts, uh, make them much easier for uh, administrator, the, the program administrators to administer, and let no doubt that if there was capacity on the part of a legal provider to take a case, and they thought that it was a case worth taking, separate and apart from the zip code work, they can and should take that case. That's the approach we're taking now as we move uh, forward. So this uh, case should not, should not impact that? It shouldn't affect tenant legal services operations. Good. Um, last question regarding tenant legal services. The expansion of universal access to more NYCHA tenants, do you yes. expect that to be impacted in any way by the PEG? We expect to continue. We launched in July of 2019, starting with seniors. Uh, that process had been ongoing. I do want to point one thing out on both of those matters in terms of further implementation. Further implementation is inextricably tied to the operations of the courts. Housing court on the one hand, NYCHA administrative proceedings on the other. At the moment, both are for all intents and purposes closed, with important exceptions. The NYCHA administrative proceedings are completely closed and completely at a halt. We will have to structure programming that is in keeping with the reopening of those courts and tribunals. So for example, so much of our success in housing court, as I believe you know, has been tied to our operations physically in the housing court, in the universal access parts where we've been able to work with, part with our providers and the courts 
to divert the code cases to that particular location and deploy resources right there in the particular location. We do not know what that's going to look like when court reopens. Housing court is a location where hundreds of thousands of people pass through its doors every year. In an age of social distancing, we do not know yet what that will look like. What we do know is that we have the dialogue in place with the Office of Court Administration. We have the dialogue in place with our legal providers to structure and implement our programming in keeping with what the court actually looks like as we move ahead. My last question, and it's, uh, regarding those, those legal providers who are doing such a tremendous uh, job. I know you mentioned the issue of pay parity in your uh, testimony. Could you give us some more specifics? What is the process for getting us to a point where our civil legal services could be paid um, uh, on par with We've been using the, the Corporation Council attorneys as, as a benchmark. Uh, where are we on that, and when are we going to start to see uh, that reflected in some of the, the contracts? It's, it, as I said in the testimony, we continue to work with the legal and with the Office of Budget to uh, make those assessments on what an equitable pay structure looks like. We've already made an initial investment in fiscal year 20. That funding remains in place in fiscal year 21 for uh, the, the beginning phases of uh, uh, achieving pay parity vis-a-vis -vis the law department. Uh, and those uh, analyses continue, those dialogues continue, and we'll continue to move forward uh, to reach, reach that equitable pay structure. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of council member questions. Let's go to those questions now. Thank you. If any council member have questions for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to two minutes, including answers. Please wait for the sergeant in arms to tell you when your time begins. The sergeant will let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from council member Rosenthal followed by council member Cohen. Council member, your time starts now. Okay, I, sorry, I didn't realize I was first year. Hang on one second. Okay. Um, Mr. Dressler, always great to see you. Thank you for your hard work and chairs. Thank you for this hearing. I really just uh, had one quick question about domestic violence and sort of wondering the feedback you're getting from your lawyers, the providers about what they're seeing on the ground. In, as regards to any area of domestic violence? Um, we, we have been in touch and uh, I think as, as many heard, of, we understood that in the immediate days after I think the enormity of this situation was being felt by every New Yorker, uh, there was a dip and a troubling dip in outreach to the various house uh, hotlines maintained by um, our, uh, our legal providers for DV survivors. Um, and I believe that was felt at the Family Justice Centers too. Um, uh, for better or for worse, those numbers seem to be increasing. Um, and, but I think that there are specific challenges associated with the delivery of services in a remote way, meaning by phone or by video conference uh, for DV survivors starting with the ability of that DV survivor to even find a confidential and safe place to have the conversation. Uh, the courts are open, the family courts are open with respect to uh, getting emergency orders of protection. Um, and of course the criminal courts remain open for that purpose also for uh, criminal court orders. Um, but other functions are uh, either uh, severely limited or not happening at all. Um, thinking specifically of work in the matrimonial parts. Um, uh, and so much of the work is sort of at a standstill. So uh, there's a lot of safety planning going on on the part of legal providers, because I believe, as you know, every, every lawyer is an advocate uh, when you're talking about these uh, organizations. That, time. Uh, All right, let's talk offline. Thank you very much yep. for your time. I'd love to see some sort of, some data on it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, council member. And now we'll go to our next council member. We will now hear from council member Cohen. Council member, your time starts now. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs Drum and Chairs Lansman. Uh, I just want to follow up uh, on a couple of things that uh, uh, Chair Lansman asked about. 
uh, I think that it sounds like they were all in agreement that the, the right to counsel in housing court has, is, is one of the best things I think that we've done in our time in government. Um, uh, I am concerned about uh, the citywide expansion. Uh, are you saying it's really the access to uh, the, the attorneys that may slow or stop the, or slow down the, the schedule and roll out, not budget? You're not saying that we, we still are on the same timeline, are you? And B, can you just talk a little bit about post-COVID and, and how you see housing court working? Uh, will it be able, you know, there's a lot of concern about housing court's capacity to handle the post-executive uh, uh, order uh, onslaught, I guess, that people are expecting. Um, you know, in answer to the first question, I think uh, we, we had been, uh, have been on track uh, for implementation of universal access. It has been challenging. I think this is a, uh, a larger job than maybe anybody had anticipated when it was um, uh, sort of a, a thought uh, amongst uh, many of you and many of us. Um, and, uh, but I think we've had more successes than misses. And I think that's borne out by uh, the substantial representation rate uh, as we sort of ended calendar year 2020. Um, now, again, I think it'll be a real challenge even just to see what housing court is going to look like. And so it really is hard to say what further implementation is gonna look like, what a further implementation timeline is gonna look like uh, because there's so many variables, which I believe leads to your second question, which is sort of what is housing court gonna look like? I think that the issues and maybe the dangers are sort of on everybody's radar, uh, volume of people, volume of human beings in a place that really has relied on uh, congregation, people getting I'm sorry. I think they'll let you just finish the, the, the Oh, all right. Hi, Thank you, right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So that's a variable. Uh, the number of sort of needs in terms of controversies when you've got uh, the possibility of, of federal, right, uh, federal uh, help uh, going to landlords which may eliminate uh, the need to uh, either seek rent or, or reach out to the court uh, for uh, a remedy there. Um, so many variables, and what I do know is that the court system, uh, city and state bar associations, our providers, and ourselves uh, are working to see what is that going to look like as we move forward. Fortunately, we're in the midst of an eviction moratorium uh, that we all uh, advocated for, uh, which gives us that time, uh, and of course the administrative order of the court, which gives us that time to plan and to move uh, very incrementally uh, towards a reopening. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Okay, council, do we have any further questions? Uh, no other council member had raised their hands and no, no further questions. Okay, uh, Chair Lanson, any further questions? Yeah, if it doesn't uh, ruin your schedule, Danny, I just would like to ask a little, couple more, couple more questions. Okay, and we do need to, you know, just keep it a little short because we have to move on. Yeah, actually, I just want to particularly reference a, a, a project. Um, it's the assigned council project for, for seniors which provides free legal help and social services to New Yorkers age 60 and older without the same income and zip code uh, limitations as universal access. Um, is there any plan in the works to strengthen um, uh, the assigned council project by allowing it to include remote and home-based services? Yes, in fact, uh, we have been in touch with one of the providers in that organization who's been exploring ways to be able to provide APP-based services. Uh, in ways keeping with new normal of uh, shelter in place, staying at home. Uh, I do want to flag, though. I do want to point out that the assigned council project is just a part of tenant legal services uh, for seniors. Uh, assigned council project, I believe, covered roughly 500 cases in the last year. Uh, that was uh, part of a group of 11,000 households uh, where the head of household was uh, uh, age 55 or older. Uh, that were served by our programs last year. So Sign Council is a terrific program. We're happy to support it. Um, it is part of a, but you know, Universal Access is a senior legal services program. Uh, Anti-harassment tenant protection is a senior legal services program. It's part of the larger fabric of our tenant legal services uh, continuum of services. And, and will ACP have its own RFP or, or just rolled into the UA grants? You know, the contracts continue through uh, the end of the next fiscal year, and I don't believe we've made any decisions on this yet. All right. That's all I have. Thank you. 
Okay, very good. Uh, this will conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you, OCJ, for being here. We'll now take a break until 3 p.m. when we'll hear from the Department of Parks and Recreation. I ask that my colleagues who will be joining us for Parks portion of this hearing to remain in this Zoom with your microphone muted until we are ready to begin. And with that, this is adjourned at this time. Thank you.
It's cool with two to cool with one. Mic check. You are five by five. Thank you, sir.
Good afternoon. Uh, chairs, we are ready to begin when you are. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> now, gaveling into uh, order, our, our um, hearing on parks and recreation. We will now hear testimony from Commissioner Mitchell Silver, who is joined by First Deputy Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh and Deputy Commissioner Margaret Nelson, Deputy Commissioner Therese Braddock, Assistant Commissioner Sam Biderman, and Director Matt Drury. Will the Committee Council please administer the affirmation? Thank you. I will now administer the affirmation one time, and you will be called on individually to confirm at the end. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner I, Silver? I do. Um, Mr. Kavanaugh? Uh, Mr. Kavanaugh, can you so affirm, please? Uh, excuse me, I made a mistake. We need to introduce uh, Councilmember Peter Koo, who has an opening statement. I will forego my opening statement, but Councilmember Koo has a statement. Thank you. Can you hear, hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Peter Koo, Chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee. I want to begin by thanking my co-chair, Council Member Daniel Drum, and the members of the Committee on Finance and the Committee on Parks and Recreation for holding this virtual hearing today. Also, I'd like to welcome to all our Parks supporters watching the live stream. The Department of Parks and Recreation's fiscal 2021 executive budget totals $509 million, which represents a $78.4 million decrease when compared to the fiscal 2020 adopted budget amount of $587 million. As part of the citywide savings program and programs to eliminate the gap, also known as the PACs, parks identify savings total $19.5 million in fiscal 2020 and $38.4 million in fiscal 2021, a total of $57.9 million in PET alone. Fiscal 2021's parks PET is 10% of the city's total tax levy portion of city PET, the second highest of any agency. Parks Fiscal 2021 Executive, Executive Capital Commitment Plan totals $4.2 billion in Fiscal 2020 to 2024, with $688 million in Fiscal 2020. This represents approximately 5.1% of the city's total $83.2 billion capital budget for 2020 to 2024, and reflects a decrease of $138 million, or 3.2%, from the $4.3 billion scheduled in the preliminary commitment plan. We understand that Park's fiscal position has entirely changed since the release of the fiscal 2021 preliminary budget and since our hearing just two months ago, COVID-19 has upended the lives of millions of New Yorkers and forced our budget priorities to shift to combat the spread of the virus and disrupted the funding for critical parks initiatives. The fiscal 2021 executive plan does not include the $40.6 million that the council and the pay fair campaign thought so hard for last year. The historic levels of funding were not baseline in the fiscal 2020 adopted budget and therefore a lot reflected in fiscal 2021 and beyond. In other words, the fiscal 2021 executive plan does not include 
funding for the 280 jobs the council secured last year, including maintenance workers, pet offices, and park rangers, funding for our green thumb community gardens, funding for the past equity initiative and other council initiatives, and funding for forestry, horticulture, natural resources, and the beach and pool season extension. It is imperative that the council and the administration work together to alleviate some of these cuts. Despite this pandemic's devastating impact on our city, public parks remain open and continue to offer physical and mental health relief. For many residents, they have become the only green space they can go out to get some fresh air which has been so important. At this moment, we are experiencing an increased use of public space and, decrease, and decreasing staff capacity may drastically harm conditions of the parks and put visitors at risk. Moreover, the proposed cost of $57.9 million in fiscal 2020 and fiscal 2021 combined, will not just leave the agency with historically low staffing levels, but it will have a profound impact on our kids, youth, and our entire families. We need to keep in mind that in the midst of this pandemic, our parks and open spaces are essential for millions of residents of the city, and they should be treated as essential in this budget. Again, it's my hope that we can work together to ensure that parks are treated in this budget as the critical infrastructure that they are. Thank you to my committee team, Monica Bujad, Chima, OB Chair, Chris Satori, Patrick, Maury Hill, Walter Chi, and Fran Perez, and to my own chief of staff, Elaine Chong, for their efforts in preparing for today's hearing. I will now turn it over to Chair Drum. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I was jumping the gun there a bit, um, but uh, let me say that we have been joined by Council Members Grzenchik, Holden, Cohen, Menchaka, Lewis, Yeager, Koslowitz, Cumbo, Joni, Cornegie, Matteo, Levine, Borelli, Brannon, Van Bremer, Gibson, and Ayala. And with that, I'm going to ask, excuse me, Ann Rivera. And with that, I'm going to ask the council to swear you in. Uh, before I swear you in, I'll go over some procedural details. Uh, my name is Noah Brick, and I am counsel to the New York City Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be, you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself um, after you've been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be added to the queue. Um, Chair Drum has uh, called on members of the Department of Parks and Recreation to testify. I will swear you in now. I will administer the affirmation one time and you will be called upon individually to so affirm at the end. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner Silver? Yes. Uh, Mr. Kavanaugh? Mr. Kavanaugh? Yes, uh, uh, Ms. Nelson? Yes. Uh, yes. Ms. Braddock? Yes. Mr. Biedron? Yes. And Mr. Drury? I don't know if Mr. Drury is with us. Um, thank you, Commissioner Silver. You may begin when ready. Well, thank you very much. And good afternoon, Chair Drum, Chair Ku, members of the Finance and Parks Committee, and other members of the City Council. I am Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, and I'm joined here virtually today with a number of my senior staff. To begin, I'd like to start off with a message of thanks. Thank you to our parkies on the front lines for this tremendous work 
and for their field work each and every day during this horrific crisis. This includes dedicated and hardworking staff at our urban park service, maintenance and operations, public programs, and forestry divisions, making our green spaces safe and clean for park goers. I would also like to thank our executive staff who worked long hours coordinating with the mayor's office and other agencies to carry out immensely complex operational and logistical projects at a scale that would have been unimaginable just months ago. I would also like to thank our staff teleworking diligently from home, helping to flatten the curve and maintaining productivity while balancing the needs of their children, parents, partners, and every New Yorker as we all are contending with tragic impacts of the pandemic and our agency is no exception. Even with dealing with personal loss and physical and emotional stress, every single member of our agency has stepped up when the city needed them the most. And so to them, I wish to extend my appreciation and thanks. We're learning countless lessons through this crisis, but one thing has become increasingly clear and there, if there ever was any doubt, our parks and open spaces are critical infrastructure that is absolutely vital to all New Yorkers. With the primary remaining indoors is, sorry, while primarily remaining indoors, it is important to help stop the spread of the coronavirus and to get the city through this crisis. Many have come further appreciate the physical and mental benefits that come from being able to get some fresh air or exercise. Parks have become sanctuaries of sanity during this time. We continue to stress to our park owners to please wear face coverings when they cannot maintain a proper social or physical distance from those who are not part of their household. Our staff has worked extraordinarily hard to make our property safe and to preserve the exceptional benefits people have come to expect from our park system. Our agency has been remarkably resilient during this crisis as we have reassigned staff and repurposed some of our properties in order to optimize the agency's ability to assist in beating back this virus. Our parks and force patrol officers and our urban park rangers have been working as part of a multi-agency effort to enforce proper social distancing protocols. Additionally, we have reassigned staff to help further ensure that park goers can relax and enjoy our open spaces in a safe manner. The creation of our Parks Social Distance Ambassadors Program, made possible largely through the redeployment of public program staff, has been key in keeping park goers safe. Their field staff, in addition to educating visitors on social distancing protocol, have been distributing face coverings to New Yorkers in need. We have distributed close to 200,000 face coverings through roving engagement and over 545,000 face coverings through 143 tabling events carried out over nine days in 77 parks across the five boroughs. We've also repurposed many of our properties and facilities as well. Seven of our recreation centers are now food distribution sites with our staff serving as site managers and running the day-to-day -day operations with the help of the National Guard and other city agencies. To date, the city's food distribution sites using TLC certified for hire drivers has delivered over 13 million meals to our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Central Park and Flushy Meadows Corona Park have been sites for emergency field hospitals, providing more capacity for a healthcare system that was heavily taxed in the early weeks of the pandemic. This past Thursday, the mayor announced an expansion of COVID testing sites, including two that will take place on parks recreation centers. Beyond the strict confines of our parks, we're working with our fellow agencies to identify streets that be, could be closed to vehicular traffic and made fully available to pedestrians. And as of today, the city has opened over 30 miles of streets and protected bike lanes creating more room for New Yorkers to spread out safely. To help mitigate the impact of the necessary closures of playgrounds and other active recreational amenities, city streets, both inside and adjacent to our parks, 
were some of the initial streets designated for New Yorkers to enjoy this opportunity. And we look forward to working with our fellow agencies as that effort continues. And those who are unable to get out to our parks event for a brief visit, we created Parks at Home, which features virtual content on our website and social platforms serving the young and the young at heart, including live park tours, meditation, fitness, art classes, and other fun activities. And even though I can tell you about the several ways that the agency has been able to remain strong throughout this crisis, there was no way that to avoid some very difficult decisions. Indeed, many more tough choices will need to be made going forward. And while this public health crisis continues, it would be unsafe to permit large public programs and gatherings in our parks that people have grown to love and to expect, especially in warm weather. We've had to cancel hundreds of events over the past few months, and unfortunately, we are prepared to cancel more as necessary to keep New Yorkers safe. The harsh reality of the ongoing and impending economic crisis has also presented the city with sovereign choices regarding our funding choices. As the mayor asserted when he released the budget, the lack of clear fiscal support from state and federal sources will make it difficult to maintain normal levels of spending, leading to the need for more citywide cuts and savings across agencies. In many cases, the proposed, the proposed budgetary savings in the mayor's fiscal year 21 executive budget will impact programs that would have been difficult, if not impossible, to carry out during a pandemic. We must all recognize this challenging economic environment will require significant sacrifices. Despite the tough outlook for the city's immediate economic future, we do not underestimate the City of New York Department of Parks and Recreation. Under this administration, we have been consistently creative and innovative and will continue to do so. And as long as New Yorkers want to enjoy their parks and open spaces, our agency will find a way to make sure that they can have fun, healthy, and happy experiences because that's what we do best. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today for your dedication to providing great parks and open spaces to all New Yorkers. We look forward to continuing to work alongside you in helping make our park system the best it can be. We would not we uh, would now be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, let me start off with a question of particular concern to my district, and that is last year, a year ago, you sat here in the executive hearing uh, on parks, uh, and you told me at that time that the Travers Park issue was at the highest echelons of the administration. What have you done since then? Because it's taken a year and nothing has changed. Nothing has been done. Nobody has contacted me and the question still remains. It's a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. Council member, as you know, the park is now open. It's stunning, it's beautiful. Uh, I I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about the extension that a year ago, you sat in the chambers and under oath told me that this was at the highest levels of government and that you would deal with it. I have not heard from you since then, not once. What is happening with that strip of land, with that street? What have you done? I just want to know what you have done. We are continuing to work with our partners at DOT. Uh, let me express my apologies. When this hearing is over, I will get you a status update about what I don't believe it. Is. I don't believe it anymore. I haven't heard from you in a year. I will find out what happened because at that hearing, uh, it was clear that staff had to get back to you. We knew this one was very important to you. As you know, the park is open. It is stunningly beautiful. But I understand your concern. It's the same about thing you staff. told me last year. It's almost the exact words verbatim. Uh, and obviously, if you don't have an answer to me today, then you're not prepared. Because you had to know I was going to ask this question. 
And you have six commissioners here with you, and not one of them has reached out to me on this issue. I mean, this is an embarrassment. Okay, I just don't know what to Council tell member, Council member, we'll get back to you. Uh, we have completed well over 700 projects. We're committed to getting projects. Commissioner, done. I'm not and asking you about your 700 projects. I'm asking you about your testimony here last year at the executive hearing when you assured me that you were working with the upper echelons of, those were the words you used, of the administration to settle this issue, and I have not heard from you in a year. I don't know what you're I will find out what happened. I will find out what happened. That's all I can say. Well, then what have you done? My staff was working with DOT. Okay, Margaret Nelson. Were aware this was done? a high priority. Commissioner Nelson? Is she here, Margaret Nelson? She is. May I, may I ask her what she's done? Um, so I think this is a very complicated issue, as you know, that involves several agencies and involves the law department. So I'm, I know that conversations were ongoing at the time of last year, and I believe they are still ongoing. The different parts what of our agency done? are having conversations, but the decision has not been reached yet about how to move forward. Do you believe it or do you know it? I, I do know that. The okay, conversations so what have been negotiations are going on? I don't think they've been negotiations, but I know there have been conversations. Conversations about what? As you know, there's a, a curb cut that has that legal has implications that has to be discussed about how to move That, that was a year ago. That was a year and a half ago. We had those discussions a year and a half ago. And what has happened since then? As I stated, there were conversations. The street that Mr. Kavanaugh, I could done. I believe there's something wrong with Commissioner Kavanaugh's audio. Okay, I'll come back to the commissioner. The other commissioners who are here with us, what have you done? So, Commissioner, nobody in your administration has done anything on this issue. I wouldn't say anything. What I'm saying is I do not have an answer for you at this moment. That's what you told me. I can me find out about what happened on a particular item. Complete incompetence, okay? Complete incompetence. Let me go to some of the other questions that I have. This, I mean, it just, it's, it's even hard for me to go beyond this, okay? Because you, you, you did not, you, you under oath, told me that this was going to be dealt with. And not one single one of the people here today has dealt with it. Okay? It's a disgrace. In fiscal 2020, the city council partnered with the administration to provide an historic investment of approximately $51 million to DPR's annual operating budget. However, over $40 million of that funding is not baseline and is therefore not included in the fiscal 2021 executive budget. The failure to restore this funding will result in the loss of 280 parks employees, including 100 city park workers, 50 gardeners, 80 PEP officers, and 50 urban park rangers. This decrease of staff capacity combined with the increased use of our parks and public space may negatively impact parks conditions. Can you please explain what will become of the newly hired staff covered by these allocations come July 1st? In terms of the staff that you mentioned, you're correct. These were council one shots uh, from last year. Uh, based upon the current budget situation, we would not be able to retain those titles in the next budget year. Uh, as you all know, this is still uh, the earliest part before the budget is adopted. And I do expect there to be a conversation with council and the administration about these one shot positions. But as of today, it is not in the executive budget. And I do expect the conversation to have for those individuals. All of us do not want those positions to expire. They're important to our park system. They're important to the council. And they're important to New Yorkers. Maybe losing their jobs. Uh, those positions were one shot. Uh, if they were for one year only, unless they were baseline. Uh, so we're all going to have... Uh, conversation about what's going to happen with those positions. But if the one shot 
is not baseline or not reauthorized, those positions would expire on June 30. Okay, so we have about, you know, six or seven weeks left. I hope that if uh, in, in our negotiations, as we approach the end of the budget negotiation process, that you'll minimally no notify those workers that they may be in fact losing their positions. What time will the impact on our parks be from these cuts? Uh, what will the impact on our parks be from these cuts? As you know, during the pandemic, parks have become even more vital for New Yorkers' physical and mental health. So what type of impact will it have? With all changes to our employees, uh, it does adjust some of the service levels. We're able to redeploy a lot of the employees throughout our park system. So there will be a, a minor reduction in some service throughout the system. Uh, we always make sure that when we do lose positions, we figure out how to make adjustments and redeploy staff to make sure the public does not see any change in park maintenance, appearance, or general condition. Okay, of the 342 positions funded by last year's council edition, how many workers have been responding uh, directly to the COVID-19 crisis, for example, by assisting with this social distancing enforcement? Uh, in terms of the Parks and Forest Patrol, uh, they have been both doing their regular park patrol, but also supporting social distancing. In certain terms of the city park workers, uh, they have been supporting our park system uh, and keeping the maintenance and operations. Uh, and for the most part, uh, the rangers as well have been, along with the PEP titles, have also been doing social distancing and their normal park operations. Uh, so I would say a majority of the, uh, the lines that you had mentioned are out there in some form or fashion working in parks uh, as essential service, doing very important work. And how many of the staff that are currently considered essential workers are set to lose their positions on June 30th? Uh, I would, just give me one second. It would be the CPWs, HAP, Rangers, and I believe that would be those titles. Forestry. So we have CPW, Cap Rangers, Forestry. Do you know the number? Uh, roughly about 300. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the PEG. As part of the citywide savings program, DPR identified savings totaling $19.5 million in fiscal 2020 and $38.4 million in fiscal 2021. Did OMD set any specific PEG target for DPR and did this amount meet the target and how will these reductions impact parks operations? Uh, OMB, it was a conversation between both parks and OMB. They didn't give a target per se, but they asked for both savings uh, that we can offer them, and that's what we had proposed. So there wasn't a target number per se, but the numbers you are mentioning basically are accurate. Uh, for the total across the fiscal years, uh, it's 59.1, it's 22.9 in savings, and 38.4 in FY21 reductions. And so our share was basically 2.8 for our agency current financial situation in the city, is the agency expecting more cuts to come before the budget adoption? Uh, and is there room for parks to identify more savings without having a negative impact on operations? Well, first, as you know, the economic status is getting worse by the day. While I cannot make any commitments, we are taking guidance from both OMB and the mayor's office as we look to the future to see the severity of this pandemic and the financial impact that's going to have for the city. We're also looking at those programs. For the most part, our cuts have been related primarily to contracts. Uh, and so, uh, but for the closure of pools uh, for the season, uh, we're looking very carefully to make sure that we can minimize the impact to the public, but there will be some contract and service cuts as, as a result of both the savings and the cuts. Okay. <clears throat> On street uh, tree plantings, by the way, Last year, I also asked you about the issue with Con Edison and uh, problems with plantings and the tree roots. And I don't think we've come to a solution on that. 
I would still like to work with you on that, on getting a solution so that we don't have bare streets with no trees or plants or something in them. So, and I have one more year left, uh, Commissioner. <laughs> I'll be here next year. How much funding does parks have for street tree planting contracts? Uh, I don't know if Commissioner Kavanaugh could respond, but I can just say what is being reduced out of these cuts, but that's a number I'll have to get back to you because I know Commissioner Kavanaugh would have that number, but I believe he's having an issue with his audio. Commissioner Kavanaugh, I don't know if you can release this audio to see if it's working now. Could the host uh, see if they could unmute Capel there? Uh, Commissioner, I don't know if you can hear me. If you we can can't hear, hear you now. Right. Uh, so we, we do have uh, in excess of $30 million in tree planting funds. However, uh, they are on pause as the city reassesses its entire capital portfolio. Does the department track the number of street trees planted by fiscal year? And if so, how many street trees were planted in 2019, 2020, and how many will be planted in, in fiscal 2021? We do uh, track them. I do. I have the numbers, uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh. So in 2018, it was 9,800, 19, 5,924, and for 20, it's 5,423 for all five boroughs. Okay, so the number continues to go down. What happened with the contracts there and the cost of each individual tree? I'll defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh. The uh, cost of planting a tree has continued to increase year after year. Uh, the most recent series of bids we received uh, pushed a number past the $3,000 mark per tree. It's a significant increase uh, from what we experienced uh, just a few years ago. Uh, we are looking for ways to reduce the cost. Uh, we would prefer to work with our experienced contractors. Uh, we have identified some elements in the contracting process that we think may yield some savings, uh, but probably not enough to significantly reduce that cost per tree. However, we are looking at some other alternatives uh, that we, we are hopeful will help us in the long run. We want to plant as many trees as we possibly can, uh, but the cost has become uh, an issue in terms of reaching the numbers that we had planned. Does the uh, planting of trees include the um uh, the, tr the tree guards, or is that a separate cost? It's a separate cost, and we do install them when they are separately funded. Is the uh, department taking any steps to lower the cost? Has there been a, a different uh, RFP, or um, I thought at one time you were um, uh, working with uh, different vendors for the trees, which would have reduced the cost as well. Uh, we are always trying to find new potential contractors. Uh, for example, it worked very successfully with our trees and sidewalk program. We will be applying the same thing to our tree tree planting. And as I mentioned, we have identified some elements in our contracting process, uh, which we think have uh, contributed to the cost increase. We're amending those in our uh, upcoming contracts. Uh, we're hoping it will have an impact. Uh, but again, uh, I don't know that we will be seeing a, a significant reduction in cost per tree. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to stop with the questions here, but I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal and Ulrich uh, before going to Councilmember Koo. But finally, let me just say also, not only um, did we not hear anything from your office on Travis Park, we wrote letters to the highest echelons of government about Travis Park and not have not heard anything. So this remains a, a very important issue that I think should be settled before the close of budget. Uh, so uh, commissioner, I'm gonna be back in touch with you and I need an answer. I hear you council member and you will have an answer. Thank you. Okay, let's go to council member Koo, please. Hello, yeah. Hi, Commissioner, how are you? Fine, thank you. All right. So uh, in fiscal 2020, the city council in partnership with the administration 
provided a historic investment of approximately $51 million to DPR's annual operating budget. However, the majority of the $44 million for various part initiatives, uh, $34.4 million, is not baseline and is therefore not included in the fiscal 2021 executive budget. So has there been any discussion with OMB of adding any portion of the $34.4 million not baseline into parks budget in fiscal 2021? Uh, yes, as this budget was prepared, uh, both the department and OMB was well aware about these one shots. As you recall, this was a negotiation both between city council and administration. We expect that conversation to occur again. Because of the financial situation, both the impact of the FY20 budget as well as the FY20 executive budget, as was noted by Councilmember Drum and you and your testimony, uh, these were very hot for positions uh, that are very vital to the agency. So I'm confident that conversation will continue before this budget is. Hmm. Okay. So uh, with all of us currently sheltering in place due to COVID-19, uh, our parks have become essential. One nonprofit parks uh, partner told us that they are seeing a massive increase in the, in the amount of garbage left in their park by visitors um, because of the increase of park uh, uh, maintenance. In your uh, assessment, yes. does the department have successful, oh, no, I'm sorry. Does the department have sufficient number of workers to ensure a safe and clean environment for all part users? Uh, uh, yes, we do. Uh, I have not heard of areas of large trash unless staff did not come at that specific point to pick it up, but we have not had any complaints about any littering conditions in our parks. The park workers or essential workers, they'll still come into work. Uh, we're still staffed with maintenance and operations. We closed down uh, all of our playgrounds. Those city park workers were redeployed throughout our city. Uh, so I'm surprised to hear that people are concerned that park is not being clean. We would encourage them to contact us and we'll make sure that it's addressed. But all of our parks have service levels to be cleaned and we've been able to meet those targets. Now, as it gets warmer, uh, we'll see what happens uh, because we could not hire all of our seasonals, but for now, uh, we are not hearing any complaints about any uh, a littering condition uh, or lack of cleanliness in our parks. So, uh, will the department have sufficient maintenance workers come July 1st? Uh, if the administration does not restore the additional funding for maintenance workers? Uh, we will have a diminished staff because we typically hire seasonals. Uh, we were not able to hire seasonals this year, so we will have to adjust our service levels throughout our park system to ensure that our parks are serviced. So there will be a reduction, uh, and that's something that we're working with our chief operating officer and first deputy commissioner to make sure we make the adjustments so that our parks still remain clean, but there will be some change in service levels because we're unable to hire some of our seasonals. Um, according to the recent report on parks and open spaces, uh, non-profit park groups are anticipating uh, a decrease in revenue of about $37 million uh, invested in our public spaces. Many of the non-profits have small staff and they cannot meet the current demand some parks only have volunteers. So if nonprofits are unable to maintain their parks at the same level as before due to a loss of revenue and volunteers are unable to care for parks safely, what pressure does that put on the professional park staff at parks? 
Well, for now, thank you for the question, Council Member. We're on weekly calls uh, as a group with all of our partners, and then we reach out to them on a regular basis. Uh, we understand the pressure they're under, and we're here to support them in any way that we can. Because we're on that call, we want to make sure that the minute this pause is over, they can start trying to activate some of the services so they can recoup some of that revenue. But I'm also very grateful for the nonprofit and the philanthropic partners that created uh, the New York City Green Relief and Recovery Fund to help support some of these partners. In addition, a lot of them have been successful, not all, in getting some of the personal uh, loans uh, to help sustain their operations. So we're on a call with them weekly. We're hearing from them. We're trying to help them in any way that we can. And so we understand by their loss and the ability to take care. And remember, some of these parks is a shared responsibility. Uh, not all of the parks have the conservancy groups servicing the park. In most parks, there's a combination of conservancy staff and park staff. And so we're working very closely with them to make sure we continue to coordinate. And if there's a reduction, we'll try to fill that gap in those parks until they can build back their operations. So we're on close contact with them to make sure we can support them because of our partners and to make sure our parks in New York City thrive. Uh, the next question I have is about summer camp suspension. The fiscal 2021 executive plan includes savings of $634,000 resulting for the suspensions of parks summer camp program this year. Approximately 100 positions will not be filled due to this reduction impacting a thousand young children. With the public pools closed and summer recreation camps suspended, can you please explain what alternative program your department will offer to our youth and young adults this summer? Well, thank you for the question, Council Member. First and foremost, the public safety is first of all. And so our ability to hold camps where children would not be able to social distance was a huge concern. Not only that, but many of the park features we've closed thus far, basketball courts, soccer fields, playgrounds, that we are working to find out how we can still offer a plan that allow people to have fun in the summer, even though a lot of those elements have been closed. We don't know about the pandemic, about how long before we stop the spread. We're working very closely with the mayor's office, public health officials, and the governor, and we'll listen to that guidance. We wanna stop this spread and not see a spike return. And so we're doing whatever we can. The mayor just announced beaches would be open for uh, people to enjoy if they live nearby, to go on the sand, to walk, to run, to sit for a few minutes. Uh, and we're looking at other things we can open up at a socially responsible distance. So we're working with the mayor's office to see what else we can activate. Uh, as part of the extreme heat exercise, we're looking at spray and misters and other things we can do to make sure New Yorkers can stay cool, but also can have fun at the same time. Our parks will remain open so long as people social distance. We just want to see where we can open up some of these other features for the public to enjoy. But we realize no summer camps, having a lot of our features closed is going to be a challenging summer, but we're putting our heads together to offer a nice fun experience despite the pandemic that our public can enjoy the summer. So there will be no programs for the youth? Yeah, at this point, at this point, because we uh, do not want to encourage any more than six people or more to gather, uh, at least for this time, uh, we do not foresee programming. That may change over the summer based upon the mayor, governor's guidance and public health. But at this point in time, the message is six or more, you can't come together. It's hard to do programming with less than six. And that's a challenge that we're facing. Uh, on Friday, uh, May 15, the governor announced that beaches will be open statewide. But the mayor said that uh, New York City beaches will be, will be, I think it's changed now, will, will open, right? But is there currently a plan to open the beaches for 2020 summer season? And if not, does the agency have a plan to keep people away from beaches once the temperature in the city hits 100 degrees. How do you pre prevent people from going swimming? Well, uh, Councilmember, this is what the mayor announced, so I'll just clarify all those points. 
Uh, the mayor said that the beaches will not be open for swimming for more a weekend, and we do not know if and when it'll be available for swimming this summer. We're starting to train lifeguards this week, but the mayor still wants to know will it be safe for the lifeguards as well as the public to be there as the summer continues, so that is to be determined. In the interim, the mayor's encouraging people uh, that live nearby to go there, not to get on public transportation, not to get on the bus. If you live nearby, you treat the beach as an open space, but not for swimming, walking, strolling, running, sitting for a few minutes. In terms of securing it, uh, we're now going to put some temporary fencing at the entrances. And if people are unable to comply with social distancing rules, uh, we will have to close off access to those beaches. We hope it doesn't come to that. We want to keep them open, but that is our plan. We work both PD and parks to work on that plan, and we will have to monitor all the entrances to public beaches to ensure people do not go on uh, if, in fact, they cannot social distance. But if the beaches are open and people uh, jump in the water, what would, how would you keep people doing that? I mean, would you, would you well, arrest them? Like, uh, uh, after they come back or, or you chase months, them in the yeah, water? 10 months out of the year, the beaches are open uh, for people to walk and stroll. Yes, in the summertime, it gets hotter and people are tempted to go into the water. We'll both have the police, we'll have parks enforcement, we'll have our own parks security and social ambassadors to make sure we send that message that people are not to be in the water. And so our parks enforcement patrol are used to this. The police are used to this. Uh, during the summer from 10 to 6, you can swim, but after that on a normal season, and they do routinely will tell people before 10 and after 6 that they should not be underwater when lifeguards are not on duty. So this is something we're familiar that we do it almost every year, uh, and so we're prepared to execute that plan this year. So you have to have an increase of staff to yes. monitor the people. That's uh, correct. We're hiring. Uh -huh. Yes. We have a police department, we have our parks and force patrol, and now we're training our parks security force. We call them CSAs. They're being trained and hired as we speak to, re to be deployed at our beaches. So are these people already in swimming gears uh, to prevent people from, from uh, going into the water or they just uh, wait for them to come back after swimming and then most people are compliant. They understand the risk of going into the water when the lifeguard's on duty. Uh, most people know our red flag system. There's signage when you enter the beach. Most people are compliant, and we expect people will be a heightened level of caution because of COVID and the mayor's strong recommendation that if people cannot comply, then the beaches will be closed. So I'm confident New Yorkers will follow the rules, uh, and so we'll follow the same procedures we've had in past years when beaches, uh, when the lifeguard's not on duty, we instruct people to get out of the water and they usually comply. But if you are losing roughly 300 workers and not hiring seasonal workers, who will enforce these rules? We are hiring, we got the approval to hire seasonals, about 400 and a majority of them, will be, a good portion of them will be what we call our CSAs. We have our PEP, force patrol and then we have our parks security they're the individuals that are on our beaches every single summer they're now being hired and prepared to be deployed out to the beaches this summer so that work is already underway for those seasons oh okay so you are hiring a few hundred seasonal workers we give authorization correct we were given authorization to hire about 400 seasons okay it's way lower than what we usually have but that is what we believe we need to make sure that uh, the, the beaches are secure. So we were very right. grateful for the administration for authorizing those seasonals so that now we can put them out there in our beaches and throughout our park system. Uh, so at least it's going to help a lot. Okay, the next question I have is on summer camps, suspension. This fiscal 2021 executive plan includes savings of $634,000 resulting from the suspension of Parks Summer Camp Program this year. Correct. Approximately 100 positions will not be filled due to the reduction, impacting 1,000 young children. Yes. Uh, so will the public pools close in summer 
vacation camp suspended. Can you please explain what alternative program DPL will offer to uh, uh, I would ask this question over. Right? You already answered this question. But I was going to politely answer it again, but yeah. thank you. Yeah. Work. Sorry, yeah, I read the one page, yeah. So I have one more question, that's it, yeah. Uh, I will turn it over to other members. Uh, this is about tree pruning. The fiscal 2021 executive plan includes a reduction of $5.7 million in fiscal 2021 for tree pruning contracts in fiscal 2021 due to COVID-19 pandemic. That reduces the budget amount for tree pruning in fiscal 21 to $3 million, leaving an estimated 57,000 trees unpruned this coming year. What impact will this reduction have will this reduction have on the department's current tree pruning cycle of seven years? And how will these 57,000 trees be accounted for in the future? Well, one, uh, it's a one year reduction, but I'll now uh, ask Commissioner Kavanaugh, which heads up our forestry division to go into more detail about the impacts. So you don't know yet, huh? No, I, I, I have my general notes, but Commissioner Kavanaugh is heads up our forestry division. It is a one year reduction, uh, but I want Commissioner Kavanaugh to go into more detail about the, the impacts um, so he can share with you what it means. So going back to those uh, 400, I don't know if you want to hear it from Commissioner Kavanaugh. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. So, yes, the uh, re reduction in tree pruning will uh, eliminate, as Councilmember Ku said, approximately 57,000 trees that were scheduled to be pruned. Not a good situation. We would like to continue that program. It's been really one of the strong points of our urban forest management approach. The good news, however, is we have pruned over 200,000 trees in the, per the three prior fiscal years. Uh, this reduction will extend the uh, pruning cycle only for by a half year. So we're at a, about a seven year cycle right now. If this reduction is for one year, it'll extend it out to seven and a half years, not ideal, uh, but it is something that we can accommodate I will point out that during the recession, uh, we uh, we had to absorb similar reductions in our tree planting, tree pruning program, pardon me, in FY 10, 11, and 12 uh, to similar levels than what we're looking at for this coming fiscal year. Uh, and we were, were able to get back on track thanks to the funding of both the administration and the council. And we'd be looking uh, to do that once, you know, the economy approves and the city's budget picture is uh, a little bit more clear. Thank you. Okay, before we go on, I want to just um, say that we have been joined by another uh, other council members and um, they are council members Moya, Jonai, and I believe that's it. And now I'm gonna go to council member questions. Cab, committee council, would you please announce the first council member? If any council members have questions for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant Arms to tell you when your time begins. The Sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from council member Gradenchek, followed by council members Holden and Levine. Thank you. Council member, your time starts now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner, and, and uh, all the other people that are with you. Uh, it's good to see you. Commissioner, um, just to build a little about uh, Chair Ku talked about our beaches, but I also want to add to that um, in Nassau County, they're playing golf. In Westchester County, they're playing golf. Tennis courts are opening in Nassau County, and the state beaches are opening on Long Island. And I realize with the beaches, uh, most New Yorkers can't walk to the beach. They have to take a train or drive on Long Island, you can pretty much only drive except to take the, the bus from Freeport um, to Jones Beach. 
we need to get our parks open to the greatest extent possible. And I'd like to know, and I understand, um, you know, playgrounds, it breaks my heart every time I'm in Cunningham Park or Alley Pond or wherever I am and I see a playground closed. But we really need to get whatever we can open, um, socially distancing on a golf course, on a tennis court, if you have to limit it to singles, we've got to get these things open. I'd like to know um, what your plan is, if you have one. I assume you, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking about this. Thank you for the question, council members. Good to see you. Nice background to Queens Farm. Uh, so uh, the answer is we're having those conversations right now with the mayor's office uh, to try to interpret the governor's guidance. Uh, we do have a series, we have a plan about phase one, phase two, and phase three in terms of what could open. And the golf course and tennis course, tennis courts and golf courses is in that phase one tranche. We want to make sure that we interpret what the governor is saying correctly. So those conversations are ongoing specifically for tennis courts and for golf. So we hear you uh, loud and clear. We just want to make sure as we work with the mayor's office and the mayor's council interpreting the governor's executive order uh, that we hope that we'll have an answer for you on both of those very soon. Well, the golf courses and the tennis courts are open in other parts of, of um, certainly in Westchester and Nassau. Um, and we have the oldest municipal golf course in the country at, at Court, Van Cortlandt Park. So um, I would like to see those open. The last question I have, and it may not be easy, and I'll take it if uh, we can get it. You know, I know that certain things like the pools aren't currently planned to be open this summer, and I hope they are because I, I want to imagine New York City without pools being open. But do you know what percentage of the cuts that you have taken to parks, which, you know, are just unbelievable in my mind, but I, I understand the situation we're in. What part of those cuts are for services that are no longer being provided or won't be provided in the next fiscal year? Like if the pools are open, you're saving X. If the beaches aren't open, you're saving money. But I'm um, just wondering how much of that you wouldn't have spent otherwise. That is hard to say. Clearly the pools is a big one. And because we are already start hiring seasonals for the pools, that happens back in March. Uh, and we have to service the pools, there's just no time to do it. So the pools are lost just for this season. Of course, it tr straddles two fiscal time expired. years. expired. But I don't expect that to happen by next summer. And that is hard to answer your other question because most of our cuts were absorbed uh, in contracts and then some seasonals that weren't hired. So I don't expect that to be the same case next year. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairs. We'll go to the next council member, please. Council Member Holden, followed by Council Members Levine and Gibson. Thank you. Council Member Holden, your time start now. Hi, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know that special event permits and activities have been put on hold. Um, is Parks open to some ideas that we could hold events that have kind of built-in social distancing? Uh, for instance, I have had a lot of... Um, constituents come to me about possibly holding a drive-in movie inside a, a large parking lot within Forest Park, for instance. Um, would, uh, would, you, would you be open to that? Well, for right now, uh, we are looking at drive-ins uh, citywide. The recommendation has come up, so we are having those conversations right now uh, with the administration to see what we could do. In terms of smaller events, uh, those that can socially distance, as I had mentioned in the previous question, we're looking at that phase one, what could open with people can socially distance and how many people, uh, but that's separate from your question. We are looking at drive-ins. We do believe this is something that is possible. We just want to get some confirmation before we get those activities up and running. Right. And again, it's a number of parks they're asking. Great. The, um, the 30 million in street tree planting, um, the, I know there's, there are some trees that are easier to plant because the tree pits are there already. Some have to, the sidewalk has to be broken. Um, I mean, I, I get a lot of calls. Probably my second biggest call um, pre-pandemic was street trees. And since we were put on hold for such a long time, $3,000 for a street tree to be planted um, seems way out of line. That's almost double, I think you had mentioned. Um, are there any thoughts of possibly doing some tree plantings in-house and even hiring people to do that sort of a seasonal uh, idea because I, I think you could parks could could plant the tree even uh, if we hired uh, seasonal workers could could plant trees much cheaper 
than uh, three thousand well, dollars. I'll I'll take uh, the first part of the answer, then Commissioner Cavanaugh will answer the second part. As the commissioner stated earlier, we, we don't set the prices. We put it out there to bid, and this is what we're getting. We'd like to see it lower. We actually had to, we actually put out a bid and put another one because we were not satisfied with the high price. And so that's something that we're not happy seeing as well. Street trees are something staff does not do. There's certain requirements to water the tree. We have to guarantee the tree does not die. It has very different equipment than having in-house staff do it. We can plant trees in parks, but a street tree is very, very different. And so I hear your question. Uh, it, it's, that is some, you know, I'll see whether Commissioner Kavanaugh wants to add well, to that. I was that. thinking more like a, a WPA kind of a program to get people back to work and we could do it, the city can do it with uh, construction workers that are out of work and so forth and so on. But that's another conversation. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to, um, I just want to mention about getting- I'm inspired. I want to get, mention just getting more volunteers involved since you know, we've been through this before with parks. Parks never has enough money, and parks is always the first or the, the organization that takes the biggest hits. So I, I'd really like to step up the volunteer program if we can. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I certainly want to have some input in that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member, please. Please have Council Member Levine followed by Council Members Gibson and Cohen. Council Member Levine, your time starts now. Thank you very much, and thanks, Chair Drum and Chair Koo and Commissioner uh, and team. Great to see you. Parks have always been important to this city, important to the life of the city, important to the health of the city. At this moment, I think they are more critical than ever. There is no way we can maintain health in the midst of this pandemic without parks. There's no way we can recover safely in the months and years to come without parks. Uh, your department now, Commissioner, is in charge of critical public health infrastructure in the midst of this pandemic. We need parks more than ever. And I think decisions that we make related to parks, related to parks access, the parks maintenance, need to be made based solely on public health considerations. That's what's on the line right now. If we decide our decisions on whether to open everything from beaches to playgrounds to water features needs to be made based on public health considerations alone. That's the frame with which I'm, I'm viewing the entire budget process related to the parks department right now. Uh, it takes a lot of staff power to maintain 2000 city parks when they're being used as heavily as they are now. And I am extremely concerned that cuts to your staffing will make it impossible for you to provide adequate maintenance. Uh, I, I'm a strong advocate uh, for maintaining the staffing levels in the parks department for that reason. Um, but I, I, I do wanna use my, my short time left just to ask one or two questions on this. To what extent can you ensure us that questions about access to all of these features I've mentioned is going to be made based on public health uh, considerations, not uh, cost considerations? Uh, council member you're correct it is based on public health considerations uh, we have done our plan we're now working with both the mayor's office and the public health department to look at how those are going to be opened up they're all based on the ability of social distance uh, and there are certain things we may not be able to open up for those very reasons so we do have at least those phases uh, those phases have not been adopted they're proposed because we were doing this thinking back in uh, early april and so we knew if we're going to close we had to reopen so I'm giving you my assurance all these decisions are based on public health considerations. Yes, well, that, that's good to hear. You have, I think the mayor has acknowledged some planning underway now for the possibility of reopening the beaches. I believe we can do that in a safe way. We should do that. Is there planning, similar planning underway for uh, playgrounds, water features, uh, and, and some of the other components of parks uh, which are now closed? Uh, the answer is yes. We're also working with the National Recreation and Park Association. I'm on. I'm expired. Uh, I'm on weekly calls to see what our colleagues across the country is doing. But we're finding those, and the ones you mentioned, playgrounds, basketball courts, those were very difficult to social distance. Really, are one of the latter phases. But we are looking at all of those to see exactly what we can open up safely and be able to monitor those. So the answer to that question is yes. 
my time is up. Very, very quick final point, 10 seconds uh, on this. I'm all for people volunteering in our parks. It's critical. I'm all for people contributing money now to our parks uh, philanthropically. It's more important than ever. But that needs to be seen as an enhancement to what we can do through the parks department proper. There's just no substitute for the kind of resources that you have at your disposal. And there's no substitute for robust staffing, parks department staffing right now. Uh, all the volunteer work in the world is not a substitute for the gardeners and the maintenance workers and the PEP officers and park managers. We need them. We need them out now more than ever. And I, I stand by uh, the effort to restore a strong parks budget during this difficult health crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. We'll go to our next council member, please. Council member Gibson, followed by council members Cohen and Rivera. Thank you. Okay, Hi, Gibson, everyone. Time stop now. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, Commissioner Silver, and thank Good you, afternoon. Chair Drum and Chair Cool, and all of my colleagues. I uh, appreciate the chance to talk to you about our most prized treasures, our open space and parks in our city. Um, and certainly, I want to echo the sentiments of many of my colleagues because I know we've lost a number of New Yorkers to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I join you, Commissioner, and your team in thanking all of our urban park rangers and park staff and the PEP officers. Certainly, I have to shout out my Bronx Commissioner, Iris Rodriguez Rosa, uh, who's been very helpful on the ground. We've distributed thousands of face coverings at our local parks. And I know I have a rec center, the West Bronx Rec Center, that's an active site for distributing food. So I'm grateful that we're doing the very best we can under these circumstances. So I wanted to ask a couple of questions um, specifically related to capital because the governor's executive order suspended non-essential construction. And I wanted to understand from Park's perspective, uh, how many Park projects have been able to continue because they're defined as essential. Um, and uh, do we have a plan when the non-essential construction begins to move a lot of these projects um, and then moving forward, the mayor has talked um, about a lot of capital projects moving that have a real public safety and public health overall priority. And where does that leave our parks? Um, and then the second question I have is obviously, many of us are really heartbroken about not opening pools this summer, but I really understand and wanted to understand, are there any conversations that we're having about replacement programs? We can't replace a pool, but are there any alternative measures that we're looking at that could really provide some sort of a replacement option for many of our participants and their children? Thank you, Council Member, for both your questions. It's good to see you. Uh, in terms of capital projects, uh, we look very carefully at the uh, governor's order. Uh, we have 243 construction projects, uh, only 19 right now work is underway. In some cases, even if they were essential, the contractors decided not to continue work. And we're working with, uh, with OMB and the mayor's office on getting an assessment of some of the other projects we determined to be essential. So right now there are 19 out of our 243. The rest are on pause. Uh, wow. In terms of pools, um, we, uh, it is too late. I had mentioned earlier that our hiring started back in March and then we do a second wave. Uh, plus we're concerned about being able to social distance at our pools. But we're now, if you heard the mayor announce our extreme heat plan, we're looking at misting stations, looking at higher fire hydrants, working with FD and Y and DEP. And if playgrounds open, we have some more options. But we're looking whether we can adapt that program, that cooling program, to be in other places throughout the city. So at least people can cool off, it may not be extreme heat, but could have some fun. So we are working on some options, a water play program. But at this point in time, it all depends on playgrounds. It all depends on work with our other agencies of what we can activate. So we are thinking about those items. Time expired. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner. We'll follow Thank up you. offline. Thank you all so right. much. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you. And let's go to our next council member. Council member Cohen, followed by council members Rivera and Ulrich. Uh, Thank Cohen, you, Chair. Let's we'll start now. Thank you, Chairs. It's good to see you, Commissioner, and your team. Um, uh, one, I just want to follow up on the pools. You're saying that tomorrow, if Mayor de Blasio tells you to open the pools, you cannot do it this season? No, uh, we start our lifeguard training and hiring for our seasons. One is one wave in March, another one May 1st. Uh, those seasonal plans were rescinded, and so we could not continue. Uh, there's no way we can train our lifeguards uh, that quickly to get them on board for the, for the pool season. 
and that was just part of some of the cuts for FY20. Uh, so plus we have to service the pool, prep the pools, prepare the pools. So none of that was uh, once those seasonals were pulled and we knew we could not get the lifeguards, they could not socially distance at that time to train. So there were a lot of complications. Believe me, this was a hard decision. The mayor knows how important pools are to the city, but just a number of factors about not being able to social distance and train. I the have lifeguards. a second point I, I yeah. want to make, so I'm going to, I'm sorry. You know, Commissioner, I'm, you and I have a very good relationship. This should have been a, a budget where we were talking about, you know, you and I had a lot of ribbon cutting scheduled for, for this spring yeah. that are not happening. Uh, you know, but I'm concerned that, that, that you are going to be holding the bag for a very bad situation because while it's true that I think most New Yorkers are taking social distancing seriously, there are a lot who aren't and parks is going to be where they're not going to do it. And when there are videos of people on the beach, you know, cock cheek to jowl, playing volleyball, people are going to be looking at you. And I, I, I think that the, that the COVID response needs to be comprehensive as parks is a part of it. And you being left to just sort of, you know, out here, like I'm the parks commissioner, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I, I don't know, like without NYPD, like I just, you know, I go to the beach, you know, Commissioner Kavanaugh knows I love the beach. Uh, and I also know that New Yorkers do whatever they want at the beach by and large and, and on the best of days. So I, I'm really concerned that, that, that there's not, that, that this is sort of standalone parks and that parks is out on their own here. And you're, that we're going to see some pictures and, and scenes this summer that we're not going to like, we're not going to feel good about, and we need to be proactive about about planning to accommodate New Yorkers the way they uh, yeah. want to behave. Councilmember Cohen, uh, thank you for the question. If I wasn't clear, this is in cooperation with NYPD. They'll be playing a major role on the beaches, and the reason why we're putting up this semi-temporary fences, there'll be the Yodox with a chain link fence with gates. If New Yorkers aren't going to comply, we see volleyball, number one, that can't happen then we're gonna to have to start limiting access. Uh, we're now doing that at Domino Park, Sheets Meadow, Hudson River Park. It will be no different at the beaches. Parks will not be doing this alone. We, along with PD, will be roving on the beaches, making sure people are getting the water, that they're there to walk, but no sports will not be allowed and will not be tolerated. Otherwise, we'll just cut off access uh, because we don't believe it's safe. So I assure you that is the plan going forward and that's the plan the mayor had announced. All right, well, I'm not sure what the answer is, but uh, I, I, I think that uh, you're going to face an incredibly challenging season. Time expired. And, uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, council member. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go to our next council member, please. Council member Rivera, followed by council member Ulrich and council member Menchaca. Thank you. Council member Rivera, your time starts now. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I just uh, to follow up on on the pools question and I know we've asked you a lot about pools and beaches but we are so so worried about what people will do this summer specifically young people and I am lucky to have a, a, a few pools in my district and they are very very highly utilized so is it is the constraints that you're facing financial because you had the budget cuts to training you were unable to train the necessary individuals to, in order to open our pools, even if you were allowed to do so tomorrow. Is that correct? Right, the, the issue is not uh, financial. To be very clear, we looked at how this pandemic would be affected over the summer. Uh, while it may be safe to be in the pool, there's queuing on lines, there's locker rooms, there's close proximity on a pool deck. But more importantly, we could not figure a, out how to effectuate our lifeguard training and be in close proximity to one another. So that became a bit of a challenge. And when we realized we could not, we had to suspend our lifeguard training. They start back in January, condition themselves, certify, take a test. With the body contact, there was no way being in the water to have a mask and socially distance. So that became a huge challenge. We now are focusing differently on the beaches about how we can train our lifeguards by spreading them out in more rec center pools since they're closed. But that was the main issue. One, we're concerned about a social distancing at the pools and also how to train our lifeguards. So that's why we recognize that it's best to offer that as a cut. Okay. And in, in terms of the beaches, you know, I know you're working closely with the NYPD because I also have a very strong feeling that people will be taking the train, even if they're only running on the hour to get out to Coney Island and Far Rockaway. So I guess I guess the enforcement will start in the MTA. I'm not I'm not sure how you're really gonna uh, 
handle that, but I know you've given us a, a little bit of a preview. I just want to ask, I know you canceled the summer camp program. That's for safety because I guess the crowding and the young people. Have you explored, you know, any other alternative youth programs? I mean, it's just going to have such a, a huge impact and we haven't really heard anything from DYCD. So I just want to ask whether you're offering anything, I don't know, innovative. And then I, I, I just want to fast forward a little bit to the fall because we're going to start on the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, which is closing a portion of the East River Park, the largest park in my district. Parks has several mitigation initiatives to open up green space in the project catchment area, including planting a thousand street trees, keeping maintenance workers in the community and increasing staff or playground associates. What's the plan for ESCR uh, mitigation initiatives? What's the status of the parks improvement? We saw cuts to street tree planting. Is it going to affect the thousand trees that are, are, are planned for my community? And then of course, to keep maintenance workers in the district, if you are not- expired. If you are not renewing the maintenance workers in the Playfair campaign, will we be seeing a reduction in maintenance workers in my district? So I know the okay. first question was about whether there's any summer alternatives or, or maybe you're working with other agencies to provide something virtually or, or I, I'm not really sure. I, yes. just, I would just like to hear some idea from the admin and then about ESCR and thank you. Thank you chairs for the time. Uh, so it, just in terms of some alternate activities, the answer is yes, we are working on a number of efforts. Uh, they would just do our planning exercise to see what we can do. As I've mentioned, we're looking at drive-in movies. We're looking at water play but it does rely on certain assets being open where we can safely social distance. So that's to be determined based on public health guidance. On ESCR mitigation, unfortunately, everything right now is on pause in terms of the mitigation. Uh, so that is something we cannot continue at this time until the pause is lifted. So unfortunately, council member, that's something we cannot uh, continue. And in terms of just the impact to maintenance workers, as I said earlier, uh, as we look at those reductions, we're going to do some redeployment. Since playgrounds are closed, we have redeployed those uh, city park workers and those uh, park associates that worked in those parks. Uh, so we're watching those service levels very closely. There may be a drop in some service levels, but we'll continue to make sure all of our parks are serviced. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Chairs, for the time. Okay, thank you. We'll go to our next council member now. Councilmember Menchaca, followed by Councilmembers Jonai and Yeager. Hi, Commissioner. Your time starts there. now. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to follow up on the parks, uh, specific, uh, specifically sorry, the pools. Uh, we have two pools in District 38, Sunset Park and Red Hook, so I'm also very interested to figure out what we can begin to plan in anticipation of a restoration of some sort because it's part of this larger youth uh, initiative, which we plan to save in the budget. So is, are you open to starting a smaller group of task force like people to engage on how we can kind of ramp up this uh, and really attack the issues that you're bringing out in terms of uh, getting the lifeguards up and going, uh, et cetera? Like, can we, can we bring a group of people together to give you a plan to be ready to go once the budget gets finalized? Uh, yeah, in turn of the lifeguards, that, that window, that, that, that passed. Uh, it's, it's too late now uh, for this summer. There is a possibility for beach lifeguards, uh, but it, may, it will not be Memorial Day, and we don't know when it will be if it in fact occurs. But for the pool lifeguards, that window had already passed, and to hire the seasonals for the pools, for the step ups, to train the lifeguards, it's just not enough time because you have to hire them, train them, certify them, there's just no more time. So sadly for the pools, this is going to be a lost opportunity. We're now hoping for the beaches. Okay. Okay, I want to move on. It's difficult. I My I, birthday is June 27th. I usually jump in a pool every year. It's an occasion <laughs> for me. And this year is number 60. So I thought it'd be a very super cool. But uh, it's, it's heartbreaking knowing New York City would have to some of the pools. It's heartbreaking. It is. Uh, I... We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna come back to that. So so the, the next question is really about Red Hook and the incredible mitigation plans around the soccer fields, uh, the kind of ten year plan to mitigate the lead and other metals. That work has kind of slowed or potentially stopped, and I kind of wanted to get a sense from you about that as a potentially essential 
because it has exposed, it is exposed right now to people um, yeah. as a construction site. So I wanted to get a sense of, of update on that. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, that is one of the projects we're trying to move into the essential category. And so we're very optimistic that could happen. But you, you actually picked one that I have mentioned quite a few times. So thank you for the question. And we'd like them to, to have conversations uh, to see whether we can get that moved into essential. Well, let us know what you need from us and the Congress member, uh, because I think we're all looking at that and we'll support you in making that an essential project to finish up. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, I do want to make a clarification on the beaches. Uh, I, we're now going to wait to install the fencing if there's non-compliance. There won't be fencing put up right away. So we just want to be clear uh, about the fencing on the beach. I'm expired. Okay. okay, next council member, please. Council member Jonai, followed by council member. We respect the Kuptim. Yeah, with apologies, can we please have Council Member Jonai followed by Council Member Yeager? Thank you. Council Member, your time will start now. Uh, perhaps let's go on to Council Member Yeager at this time. Council Member Yeager, your time will start now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Good afternoon, Commissioner. I just have two quick questions. Uh, I'd appreciate uh, as quickly as I ask if you can answer them. Uh, question one is how many parks are currently locked or otherwise inaccessible to New Yorkers? Uh, there are roughly about a thousand playgrounds that are locked. I can get you specific numbers on the other elements, but it's basketball courts, handball courts. But in terms of playgrounds, there are a thousand. If we can get you the specific numbers. Uh, I, I can go down to detail, 1,000 playgrounds, 300, over 300 conference stations, 700 spurry features, 1,700 basketball courts, 1,900 handball courts, almost 700 tennis courts, 1,800, uh, over 100 volleyball courts. Let me, let me, let me do the following. Uh, do you have, since you're reading it off of something, do you have a list that you're able to make public of how many are locked versus how many exist so that New Yorkers could know, you know, is it 98% of them are locked, 92%, 12%. I think it's important for us to know where exactly the lockdown occurred since, uh, since Central Park isn't locked down, but those in our neighborhoods are. I think we, we could share that list, that. yes. Okay, thank you. The second question I have, and maybe this is a little broader, but um, when a park's maintained tree falls or is otherwise damages a city owned sidewalk, uh, for example, from overgrown roots or anything like that, et cetera. How soon does parks typically repair the broken sidewalk? All right, let me uh, refer to Commissioner Kavanaugh for that response. Thank you, Commissioner. So the Trees and Sidewalk Program is based on uh, a score that's developed on the, based on the severity of the defects and those with the highest uh, score rating receive priority. There are over 30,000 requests in our system uh, we thankfully have a significant amount of funding in our capital program uh, right now to do a, a, a large number of them. However, I could not give you an exact time. It depends on. All right, let me let me commissioner. I'm, the nature I, I, of, the, of the of the defect. Commissioner, I, I don't I don't mean to cut you off, but my time is limited and the bell is unforgiving. So let me uh, let me ask it another way. Is there ever a time that a, a, that a sidewalk is damaged uh, with 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 due respect to the scoring program that a sidewalk is damaged? And it say takes two years for parks to come out and fix it. Yes. How about three years? Yes. How about four years? Yes. Five years? Yes. Six years? It could take that long. Yes. Is it possible that there are there are damaged sidewalk sidewalks that were damaged by city owned trees that uh, that the that the damage occurred prior to Mayor De Blasio taking the oath of office and that are still damaged as we sit here today? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions right now. Thank you. We'll go to our next council member, please. Council member uh, Thank you. Thank you, chairs. Thank you, commissioners. I'm going to make it really quick. Uh, first of all, good to see you. I'm a little concerned about this um, back and forth on beaches. Beaches will be open, but no swimming permitted. I believe we're making a grave mistake in setting up for a terrible incident as uh, social distancing uh, regulations are going to be enforced. I'm not sure why we're going to go down this slippery slope 
If the beaches are open, people should be able to swim. Otherwise, close the beaches. Otherwise, you're going to have another unfortunate incident. I echo the same concerns about tree and sidewalk replacements. Uh, that we have tree, I know the sidewalks that are waiting more than 10 years in my own district uh, to be um, repaired, that are real trip hazards. We have capital funded projects, including a, a skate park that my community is excited for, fully funded last year. I need an update on that. Movie nights, Orchard Beach, thousand car parking lot that could be utilized easily for a drive-in movie uh, allowing for social distancing. And my last question is 4th of July celebrations. We've been celebrating for I don't know how many years now uh, our day of independence on Orchard Beach. Can I get a clear distinction and direction? Are we going to be able to continue this festivity, which should be held, I believe, on June 30th? This is the scheduled date. All right, let me get to your questions very quickly. Noted on the beaches, as I stated, uh, we are prepared if people do not comply uh, to uh, close off the beach with fencing if necessary. So we are expecting New Yorkers to enjoy this open space amenity. In terms of the drive-through, that is something we're exploring. Uh, we heard a recommendation from you as well as others. So that's something we're trying to get an answer as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, on construction, everything except, not, except essential is on pause. So the skate park and other projects throughout the city are on a pause until that pause is lifted when we can start to continue working on our construction projects. And in terms of July 4th, up until the end of June, the mayor said there should be no special events or large gatherings and, until that time. And my expectation is the mayor will then look at July and make a similar uh, recommendation. So we're waiting for his guidance on July, but right now we are not issuing or entertaining any other permits uh, until further notice. Commissioner, with 30 seconds left, we have an open streets program that was done on Rylander Avenue in the Bronx. One block away, I have a closed city park because it has a playground. It is four blocks wide, long. I have one section as a playground, that park is closed, but yet we did an open streets one block away. Please close my street, open it back up to vehicle traffic and open up the city park which our families have been accustomed to going to. Is there anything that you can share on this new I'm experience excited. that we're suing, pursuing? Uh, parks are not closed unless you, we're unable to secure the playgrounds or elements within the park. We'll certainly have Commissioner Rodriguez or our maintenance staff take a look at it. Uh, but for precaution safety, if there are handball courts, basketball playgrounds, those are closed. If we cannot close them for whatever reason, then we have to close the entire park. But we avoid closing parks and just close features within parks. We'll the whole certainly park take is closed. We'll but the entire look. park is closed. Thank you. Can we go to the next council member, please? Um, are there any more council members who have questions at this time? Any hands raised, um, Chair Drum, if Councilmember Ku doesn't have any further questions, we may be done. Uh, okay. Excuse me, Councilmember Rosenthal is back on. Uh, my apologies. Councilmember Rosenthal had a question and has rejoined us. Uh, Councilmember. Remember, your time starts now. Great. Thank you. My apologies uh, for the delay. Um, Commissioner, great to see you. Really appreciate your work, Chairs. Thank you for everything you're doing. A um, couple of quick questions. Uh, in my district anyway, I'm not seeing any signs in the entryways to the parks about wearing masks. Is that something you plan on putting up? Uh, and what's the at, timing? Thank no, you, Margaret. No, not at this time. What's That's general that? guidance. Uh, we're putting most of our signs, if you've noticed, uh, either in playgrounds close. We do have I signs. Saw. We do not have signs in terms of face Are you coverings. contemplating putting up signs to the entrances of it's, parks? It's something we could contemplate. Uh, so that's something I could certainly take back to see what we can do, yes. Okay, I would imagine it's, I think it would be really helpful. Um, secondly, are you thinking creatively about how to open up some sort of outdoor tennis and some of the fields in a safe way. Um, can we open up 
is there anything we can do there safely? And how about batting practice for baseball teams or singles tennis um, or basketball skills training, stuff like that? And lastly, uh, at one of my schools that I just drove by, the playground was closed, but the schoolyard was open and families, inter some were wearing masks and some weren't. So what's the policy on the school yards? Uh, if it is under DOE jurisdiction and as what we call a multi-purpose area, that is fine. Uh, if we had the same, we keep those open as well. Uh, but I hear what you're saying about what we can open up first. We are looking at our phase one elements, golf courses, tennis courts, Basketball court, unfortunately, is not in that first tranche. We attempted early on to allow it just for people to play one-on-one -on -one or at least father and son to play. We saw so much non-compliance. We took down 300 rims. Then we had to take down rims in 1,700 courts. So we'll see at what we can allow people to social okay. distance, but that's going to take some time. So I just want to express my concern if I wasn't clear about it. Parks is, as I understand it, if it's not a... DOE yard, it's a parks yard. And what I'm seeing is a parks yard that is open. Yes. So there's a playground that's closed and right next to it is a public school yard that is opened with no signage about masks and some people wearing masks and some not. Right, we do not currently have signs for masks. That's general guidance from public health, everything's running on television. So I do know word is getting out about wearing masks. We have not put, we ask people to social distance. And I have to see the current you sign. you just take the signage you have for parks and for playgrounds and just put it on the yeah, yard? Think, it's about 5,000 signs, but it's something, like I said, we could explore. We are telling people social distance and part of that does include wearing a face covering, but I hear you, I hear you. Uh, fields Thanks that are so open much. are available. My time is out, but this feels not responsible to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. That'll be all. Uh, Chair Drum, I have a question. Okay, yes. Commissioner. Yeah, uh, so I want to ask uh, how many parks with playgrounds are closed because the playgrounds cannot be closed. All of the playgrounds are closed. We have over a thousand playgrounds. They're all closed. Was that your question in terms of play? No, play but but, but you, there's some parks with a playground inside. Correct. So there are a few uh, parks that because, let's take Seward Park, uh, Lower Manhattan. Because there was a playground and a garden and the path, there's no way of closing off the playground. We had to close off the entire park because we could only put up maybe barricades or tape, and we felt that was not sufficient enough to close off that playground. So in very few cases, we had to close off a larger element of a park because basketball, handball, playground, and maybe another area that we had to close off the whole park. But those were a few cases. For the most so part- So how many? Are, uh, there are, I, I can get you the number. I do know there are a thousand okay. playgrounds. I can't say, like the case uh, Council Member Joan and I brought up, how many of like that are in our system? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair John. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming in and for answering our questions. This will conclude today's hearing. Before we close, as a reminder to the public, the committee and subcommittee will be holding a remote hearing for the public testimony uh, on the executive budget on May 21st at 12 p.m. If you'd like to testify at that hearing, please register at www council.nyc.gov uh, slash testify and information about how to access the Zoom meeting will be emailed to you. You may testify at that hearing via web or via telephone. You may also submit testimony through that registration website or by emailing finance testimony at council.nyc.gov. And with that, this meeting is adjourned at 4.36 in the afternoon. Thank you very much.